Hello, everybody. This is Afi Russia. My name is uh, Dmitry, and we are starting our strategic online session today, marketing tomorrow. I'm sorry for the technical delay, but we are going to speed up now, and uh, we should be able to finish on time. We are going to discuss what brands have learned over the previous several months and what their expectations are for the rest of the year. Drag Red Knesset and myself, Dmitry Muzichenko, are going to moderate the session. Our first speaker is going to join us shortly, and now I simply wanted to double check the chicken here and see us clearly. We're sitting in front of the main screen where we should be able to see the presentations and uh, some of the participants, I guess. And also, we are looking at the chat, which you can actually use to stay in touch with us. Can you please uh, drop us a line or two, maybe your name and the company you work for, so that we can double check that this communication channel does work. Hi, everybody. Name is Dragorat. In our online session today, is obviously a part of the bigger program we have until the end of the year. Well, as the slide suggests, uh, we are going to run several major events in fall. For example, we'll have an international online forum under the same name. In late November, we shall have an international forum called Purposeful Brands. And in February 2021, 18th of February to be precise, we are going to have our international FE Tech Forum, which I am going to elaborate upon a bit later. Thank you very much. Here at FE Russia, we're trying to provide free access to modern data, to, I'm sorry, uh, up to date information uh, to the participants of the industry, to the industry actors, uh, with uh, the gracious help of our sponsors, such as Linta, Beeline, Avita and others. Let's agree on some basic house rules. Now, if you have any technical issues, such as connection issues, please don't panic. And before you push the panic button, please push the refresh button. Also, we have scheduled a number of breaks so that you can have a tea, water, or maybe even check your children's home assignments or attend to any other urgent business you may have during the day. During those breaks, we will display the upcoming events in the program and we'll try to keep you aware of uh, you know, all the developments. So the format is very simple. 20 minutes for presentation, five minutes for Q&A. We offer our apologies to the first two speakers because uh, we have uh, taken the Q&A session away from them. However, we have promised to collect your questions to the first two speakers via online and make sure they get back to you. Now, if you're listening to the Russian broadcast, uh, which is uh, by default, obviously you should be given a chance to listen to the English webcast, uh, which obviously will contain the original broadcast of uh, the English speakers. And uh, naturally, we will also provide you with links to go back and forth between the two language versions. And naturally, all the presentations and all the slide decks that uh, can be shared with the audience will be shared. By the way, if you want to get those slide decks, uh, not just watch us, please use the registration link, which you can find in the description of our webcast. So all those who get registered will certainly get all the slides. I'm happy to introduce our first speaker, that's Alona Strigina, who is the commercial director of uh, PNG Eastern Europe for the product category uh, hair care and beauty. Hello, good morning. Great, Alona. A great pleasure to welcome you. We actually wanted you to be the first speaker from the very beginning because PNG has got a very long history, over 180 years, and there must have been so many crises over this time. So the company must have amassed a great experience in terms of overcoming crisis. So learning from your experience would be very valuable. Thank you very much for the introduction, Dmitri. Indeed, this is exactly what we're going to discuss today. There have been quite a number of crises in the lifetime of our company. And now is the time when we absolutely need to share experience, to share our knowledge. And obviously I would absolutely appreciate the opportunity to present the company and to share 
my and my team's experience in terms of maintaining consumer loyalty in those challenging times. So let me start by describing the company. B&G is a leading international corporation and you can easily find our products in millions of homes around the world. You can find them in kitchens, in bathrooms, in bedrooms and in kids' rooms. You know, for over 180 years, we've been challenging the status quo. We've been fighting for innovation. We've been changing consumer behaviors. We have been busy creating new lifestyles. Every day, we strive to make the lives of billions of our consumers better. I think this is indeed the mission of the corporation. If you click the next slide, please, you should be able to see the mission. Our mission is, in fact, the gift of care. We are taking care of 5 billion consumers by providing them with top quality products. In this pandemic times, we have decided to focus on several top priority principles, such as protection, and uh, let me put it differently, safety of our employees. Several days before the official announcement of the quarantine, uh, which is coyly called uh, self-isolation in Russia, we told all our employees to work from home and we provided them with the software, hardware and, shall I say, wetware. Uh, I mean, the trainings that should help them work from home. We've also taken care of the comfort of our employees in terms of working from home. So they've been given an opportunity to work flexibly. They've been given access to various master classes. We've tried to make sure they can find more opportunities to spend time with their families and stay inspired despite the current challenges. Since B&G produces household basics, things that people need on a daily basis, it was imperative that we assured seamless operations. And here I'd love to thank all our employees working in the plants because they really have uh, shown stellar performance. Uh, naturally, we have uh, provided them with sanitizers and masks and temperature sensors. And this has enabled us to provide the market and consumers with as many products as they need. Naturally, we could not sit on the fence and we really wanted to help the local communities and the people, particularly those who found themselves in very dire straits. Let me explain in particular what we did, but before that, let me stress, let me emphasize our strategy. Our strategy is to serve, not to sell. That is, we stay in service to our customers our consumers have been and will always be the focal point of our attention. This is indeed the core of our operations. Listening to our consumers, hearing them well, have always been important to us. I'd even say this is part of our DNA. This is part of how we work at B&G. But speed now is of particular importance. You know, we have been tracking changes in consumer behavior on a weekly basis. The spread of COVID in Russia started several weeks later compared to Western Europe, which enabled us to do better forecasting. Actually, in times like this, it's pretty easy to engage consumers in dialogue while staying home. And, well, they're staying home as well. And this, obviously, can give you with a wealth of information. 
Now let me stress again that listening and hearing is an important skill and it provides us with a very valuable resource. Well, this tech cloud shows what consumers currently are concerned about. Uh, naturally, safety is front and center in their minds. So they're looking for things like, how do I sanitize best? How should I wash my hands? What are the quarantine restrictions and so on? Like, how do I manage my stress? How do I find time for myself? And what do I do now with all this spare time? Well, there are obviously lots of different concerns. People are also concerned about financial stability, about whether their livelihoods can be maintained at all. So we decided to develop a whole campaign out of our analysis of this tag cloud. One of our bigger brands, H&S, certainly could not sit on the fence because we got things to say. We've got things to offer to our consumers. Well, it's pretty obvious that we actually had a totally different plan for this year, for this summer. You know, from where we were looking at, we were really expecting a fiery Euro 2020 soccer season. And so much had been prepared for that. However, the pandemic made us introduce lots of corrections. The things that have helped us, though, have been you know, the unification, not the, uh, you know, mingling together that happens in soccer stadia, but rather the coming together of the whole country that is happening in part due to our program called Apart But Together. And this is the campaign that I wanted to illustrate. So it turned out to be really a large scale campaign and it had a very positive social effect. Let me explain why it was waged by head and shoulders. It is in fact the leading shampoo brand in the world, trusted by millions of Russians every day. You know, millions of Russians start their day with head and shoulders and to them head, sh head and shoulders is not just a way to treat their dentraf, but more importantly, a way of feeling more confident and thus, being closer to people that matter to you. And this has helped us come up with the insight that's the cornerstone for this campaign. And the insight is in front of you. Although people are forced to stay indoors, locked at home, if you like, they still continue to communicate either with their family members or via video conferencing software in order to support those that matter to them they need confidence they need to be confident of themselves and they also need confidence in their future and the way you look actually matters for confidence like now all you can see of me is just my my face, my head, and my shoulders. And this is, you know, head and shoulders. This is the, this is where the rubber hits the road. Like I said, this has been a countrywide campaign leveraging so many channels, you know, television, digital, PR. And uh, it was also combined with a number of uh, charity campaigns. Vasily Vakulenka, better known as uh, Buster, a pretty well-known musician, also supported her. He's our ambassador after all. So we launched what we call Countrywide Home Concert of Buster. And this is how we try to bring the country together, spice up people's lives and show that you can actually stay close despite the distances. All right, the video is already playing. So this will be an acoustic 
home concert together with our friends from Head and Shoulders, we developed this format. You know, it's very simple. This is a special time when all you gotta do is just spend some time at home with uh, your close ones. With your permission, I'm not going to translate the song. Yeah, but here is people are writing stuff to me. Like somebody's got seven dogs. Hey, can you can you quickly name all of them? What are you doing? Are you just playing? Yeah, we're we're playing board games and uh, we're doing sauna every second day. So we are enjoying Dutch time like crazy. Stay home and stay healthy. That's the important thing. Oh, I love this guy. It, it was actually a nearly three hour long acoustic concert, which was broadcast live on YouTube. We're really happy that this concert, and by the way, the first home concert of this type in modern Russia brought together so many people. You know, to us, as an international brand, it was very important to support the people, to support consumers, but also to convey the idea that self-isolation is a very important and a very much needed measure. In another clip, we addressed the nation in order to explain why it's so important to stay at home. I'm sorry, we need the next clip. For the close ones, mum. For friendship. For the family. For the business. For future meetings in person. For those we love, I am staying home. So we aired this clip, I guess, on the first day of self-isolation. That was one of the first days of April, as far as I remember. Now, we could see what was happening in the country. Many people in Russia didn't take it seriously. You know, Some people really didn't appreciate the value of self-isolation or underestimated the danger involved. That's why we decided to communicate how important it was for us to help each other by staying home. You know, the more conscientious we are about it, the shorter the lockdown may be. Nobody enjoys the lockdown, so it's best for us to actually play by the rules. So that was stage one of our campaign. Well, we told our consumers why it was important to stay home, and we supported them with this uh, countrywide home concert. And we're happy that our great ambassador, Buster, supported us. And, you know, to our consumers, it was a great opportunity to interact with their idol. Several weeks later, as, you know, we continue to listen in to our consumers and their concerns, we decided to have another activation. So we changed the message. Stay home was no longer a relevant message to convey. That's why the next part of the campaign was slightly different. And this is about being together despite the distances. Apart, but together. The voiceover is the same here. Like for the future meetings, for the business, for the family, for the loved ones. I am staying home. I'm sorry, this has been the same clip, but maybe you've missed the first opportunity to enjoy it. So now we should be able to see the next stage. And this is the apart but together clip. 
it looks like the same clip again. Right. So like I said, we change the message. The important message for the second clip was that despite the distances, together we stood strong. So an important part of the second clip was the uh, pure thrill. Uh, cave is actually an Arabic word, so I may use it just as well. But in any case, this is uh, Vasili's or Basta's song about the pure joy of being together with those who matter to you. We should be able to enjoy this. Okay, maybe you can enjoy it on YouTube. The second stage of this campaign he involved real support. We've got a major social uh, CSR campaign. We've got a major CSR program at PNG. And part of this campaign involves supporting the most disadvantaged parts of the population, particularly those who are already sick with COVID. So we provided 30,000 bottles of uh, head and shoulders to the patients of COVID hospitals. These are the results of the campaign. We really loved and we consider it the biggest reward for us is, you know, the kind of good vibes we got from the consumers. Social media met us with a wave of positive emotions and positive feelings. Media reach was also very good. Well, the home concert itself scored 226,000 views and uh, we had 112 million total impressions in media. Again, I wanted to thank our ambassador, Vasily Vakulenka, who was more than just part of this initiative. He did share our values and our priorities in those challenging times. And by the way, his family supported us in all these clips. And this slide is designed to summarize this experience of PNG. And maybe our experience can trigger some inspiration for you if uh, say you're looking for a resourceful state for a state of law so it's very important indeed to continue listening to your consumers and to be able to hear them out it's equally important to stay in tune with the developments and change as fast as the situation changes because the more agile the more adaptive the more plastic you are as a company, the more successful you will be. And you need to set and uh, possibly redefine your priorities. Some things may need to be prioritized up and others may need to be prioritized down. This is something that has uh, come home very clearly for us lately. You know what? Indeed, we are apart, but we are together. Well, even this conference, in a sense, only proves this statement. So I wish you great health to you and your families. And, uh, you know, we'll persevere and succeed together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alona, for a great case and a very interesting presentation. Well, the tech team 
is telling us uh, that they can actually roll the second clip. It could be a very good ending to your presentation. Yeah, that's a great idea. Let's do that. Thank you. Apart, but together for the close ones, for friendship, for the business. Oh, to give the gift of love, to support each other, to help even those who are far away. Head and Shoulders is taking part in a charity campaign called Care to Every Home. Learn more in our website. Thank you very much, Alona. Like we agreed previously, we shall take questions for you offline and we shall be happy to see you in our further in our upcoming events. We are connecting now to Tony Evans, who will be our next speaker. He's a marketing science director of uh, Facebook for Eastern Europe, uh, Middle East and Africa. Tony is currently in Dubai and obviously he is going to present in English. So those who want to listen to the original, uh, you will need a different link uh, and uh, the link we're actually publishing now in the chat. And in the end of his speech, we will, all, we will publish another link. I'm sorry, they've asked me to switch back to Russian. So when we discussed the subject of presentation with Tony, Tony suggested that we talk about media measurement and measurement of uh, effectiveness of ad communications. And we found it a very interesting topic because, you know, to us as marketers, uh, nothing can be more important than, say, reliability of measurements particularly in such challenging times, you know, when top managers very often decide that they need to rehash their budgets or change the channels. And quite often, they don't really have hard data to base those decisions on. And Tony has got great experience to share. So Tony, the floor is yours. Uh, yeah, more or less. Thank you. Uh, Tony, apparently you are not in the English channel. I can hear you just fine, but in order for the others to be able to hear you, it may be useful for you to switch into switch to the English channel. Uh, Tony, can you actually hear me? I'm saying that you must be in. Um, no, I'm sorry. I I cannot. I I actually don't know which Dimitri you're asking.
Next slide, please. Thank you. This would be the nice linear relationship of how we understand advertising and how it progresses to go from marketeer to ads, the ads go to some people, and we understand the value. But that's actually very complex to understand. As individual humans, our behavior is complex. In order to understand each of those elements of how we act to individual ads has taken the industry a long time. Sleaduchi slide, please. Next slide, please. What I'll talk about on the next slide is how over a period of time, our understanding of advertising has got a little bit better. Now, some of the audience may have heard of a famous quote from a gentleman called John Wanamaker. And he came out with this quote that said, 50% of my advertising budget is wasted. The trouble is, I don't know which 50%. That quote was actually made at the turn of the 19th century to the 20th century. So, the, sorry, the turn of the 19th century. So it was over 100 years ago, not from the 1900s to the 2000s, but from the 1890s into the, into the 1900s. Now, fast forward 100 years of marketing and a group of people who were surveyed by eMarketer were asked the same question. How much money are you wasting on ineffective strategies? And this was the answer that was given. We're, we're wasting probably quarter of our budgets. And despite the fact that we've had 100 years of advertising progression, we've still got not much closer in understanding this. Businesses that are born today, that are successful today, are getting into this concept of incrementality. And I'll, I'll spend a bit of time explaining that a little bit later on. In essence, it is how do I make sure that every dollar that I'm spending is driving incremental value? Not that I'm spending on something that would have happened anyway. The next slide, please. And as I'll talk through in the next slide, this is about the progression of advertising over time. And so I want to talk first of all about the evolution of advertising, and then I'll talk about chocolate and airplanes. And we'll start on the next slide with the advertising evolution. Advertising in its essence, when it first began, was about print advertising. That was the first advertising opportunity. Next slide, please. And the way that this could be measured was how many people were buying a copy of a newspaper. This was the measure of effectiveness for the ad. There was no view of how many people turned to page 38 and saw the marketer's adverts on page 38 and what they did in response. There was no way of knowing that. As each media has come along over years, not much progression was made initially. The number of people who passed a billboard, a poster, the number of people who listened to the radio doesn't tell us more about the effectiveness of those adverts, but purely a proxy, a proxy for whether that advert has worked or not. When TV was born in the 1950s, they made some evolution for sure, and they started to bring about a metric that was used to look at the demographics so what numbers of men versus women, what are the age groups of people who are exposed to a TV program? And therefore, I can start to place my advertising break around this. This was known as the, the rating point, the Nielsen rating point that brought the industry together in the US. Over time, as we get into the 1970s, we started to see more evolution around techniques like marketing mixed modeling that started to use a propensity way of looking at what are the different channels that I'm using and what is the impact on sales overall? And that technique is still used and still used effectively today and used quite heavily within our local market. As we progress on to the latter part of last century and then started to get into 2000s, that's when we saw digital really starting to come into its own. For any of us who worked in the digital marketing industry in the late 1990s, you would know that there were so many metrics that were available to measure. There were metrics like how long something had been on screen for, where the mouse had been on screen. We were literally awash with data, but still these things were proxies for whether it was successful or not. And we couldn't actually tell whether an ad was working or not to the consumer work walking into a store for that impression that had been served. Now in the modern world, the cross everything devices, we're in a, a very different state. It's even more complex to measure this. Cookies, if they're relied on to make a panel of people, to see whether an ad is effective or not is an unreliable method. To give an example of that, in my online journey today, I've used four different connected devices. 
Now, a panel that wanted to look at how effective the advertising was wouldn't be able to see me across four different devices without a common identifier, without a way of knowing that it's me across different devices. Consequently, if you rely on that system of measurement, you would have an overstatement of how many people you've reached, an overstatement of frequency as well. So it's very difficult to rely on that. Getting away from proxies to truth is the most important thing. We could go on to the next slide, please. And so the thing that's driven the most change within this has been mobile. If you think about how long it's taken for us to make progress through the different channels over time, mobile has reached people far more quickly than other media before. Next slide, please. And where mobile has made a difference is that TV, when you think about TV and radio, radio took 38 years to reach its first 50 million people. TV did the same in just 13, so 13 years to get to 50 million people. When mobile came along, the device that we all know, and I'm sure some of us are using right now, that took just 10 years to reach 2 billion people. So all of the measurement techniques that we had before had to find a way of progressing into the modern age. And the argument of myself and many other practitioners of advertising measurement is that it's still not at the standard it needs to be to help us truly understand every single consumer and all the impressions they see. Next slide, please. So many of you would have heard on the next slide about correlation and causation within marketing. We often as humans will look at what correlation is as an effect when two things are related together versus whether something has actually caused the impact. These two things are not the same. Quite often, we can presume they're the same because one seems to relate to the other. And if you could progress to the next slide, please. This will be an example of how correlation and causation are different. So what the next slide will show is that you've got a number of people who are consuming chocolate along the bottom axis. And then you've got a number of people who are receiving Nobel Prizes in the same countries. And so if you plot those two axes and you look at the volume of Nobel Prize winners and you look at the amount of chocolate consumed in kilos per head per year, a correlation line that goes from bottom left to top right would show there's a relationship between these two factors. And so it looks like there is indeed a relationship between how much chocolate we eat and how many Nobel Prize winners there remain. And so these are the three possible scenarios that, of course, eating chocolate does make it more likely you'll win a Nobel Prize. The second, of course, is that there is a spurious correlation between these two factors. The third is that possibly there is an, an outside and there is a compounding factor that relates those two different dimensions. In this instance, it could be, for instance, educational spend in the countries that are there and proximity to Northern Europe, where I can say as a Northern European, I would argue that the quality of chocolate is certainly far higher quality than my southern European counterpart. But if we wanted to know, is this actually true or not, we'd have to withhold chocolate from a random 50% of the population for their entire life and then work out, is there a difference between the two? Next slide, please. This next slide is going to show us about the relationship between clicks. The digital industry has come together around clicks as being a metric of success. And on the next slide, you will see that, again, the correlation between have there been people who've clicked on campaigns actually resulting in an uplift in a particular brand metric. Next slide, please. These three different variables that Nielsen look at were on campaigns on Facebook and nearly 500 different campaigns. They looked at people who'd actually clicked on an advert and they then polled these people and asked them questions about ad recall, about brand awareness and purchase intent. And if you remember, the correlation line from bottom left to top right shows that there's a relationship. You'll notice these lines are flat. There are many people who have clicked on an ad, they've got a high click through rate, which is along the bottom axis, and they haven't got a high uplift, which is on the vertical axis. And there's no relationship between these two things. Some people who don't click on ads have a very high awareness, and some people who click on ads have a very low awareness. And so this demonstrated to us that there's a low relationship between these two things. If you could progress on to the next slide, please. I've got another couple of 
quick examples on the next slide about a gentleman called Tyler Weigen. Um, just to check you're awake during this, this presentation, he plots these things over time. And so he's got a wonderful website, tylerweigen.com, and you can look at these spurious correlations. Uh, good luck with that one, translator, spurious. Uh, the, this is a chart that shows the number of people who've drowned by falling into swimming pools, and in the same year, the number of films that the actor Nicolas Cage has appeared in. It appears that there is a relationship between these two numbers. With the next slide, please. It seems unlikely, of course, that one thing is causing the other, that a Nicolas Cage acting more is going to relate to more people drowning by falling in swimming pools. Next slide, please. And on the next slide, you'll see an example of the relationship between the amount of cheese consumed per head per year and the number of people who died by becoming entangled in their bedsheets. Is it likely that one thing is related to the other? It seems pretty unlikely that these two factors could be related. But if you look at the apparent relationship from a correlation point of view, it seems to be apparent that one thing is related to the other. We could go on to the next slide, please. In the next section, I just want to talk quickly about bias within measurement systems. The bias that exists for all of us is to look at the good rather than the bad overall. And so this example is from a Hungarian mathematician, Abraham Wald. Abraham Wald was around during the advent of the, the Second World War, and he fled to the United States in the view of persecution. He was asked the question, first and foremost, about how to protect planes in the war. And the general of the army had given this case and said, we see these planes are being shot in the wings and in the tail, and we need to put the armor in these places in order to protect them. And Abraham Ward successfully argued, if you could progress to the next slide, please, that this would be a mistake. On the next slide, you'll see that there is a large number on the left-hand side of planes that have got bullet holes around the wings and around the tail of the plane. On the right-hand side, on the next slide, please, you'll see that there is a different view and the different view was from the full sample. So the planes on the left are the ones that had actually made it back from the battlefield. They made it back and landed at the airbase. The ones on the right have been shot down and not successfully made it back. This is an example of what is now known as survivorship bias, taking just the planes on the left as the example of what to do, ignoring the planes on the right. And with this successful argument that Abraham Wall made, they changed the positioning of the armor on the planes and countless lives were saved. The next slide, please. As we think about this at Facebook and how do we make sure that things are pure, we have a lot of information that people share with us about themselves. And so we have a good view of who people are, their ages and their interests and their likes. And what this allows us to do is to study what we refer to as lift and incremental lift. This is taken from medicine and very relevant, of course, at the time of COVID that the number of people who are exposed to a treatment in one group versus the people who have a placebo in the other group, two different groups. If those groups are statistically identical, scientifically identical, and one group is given a treatment and the other a placebo, and one group has an uplift, you know that there is truth in the uplift and it actually has a healing rate and is successful. In our world, the treatment is an advertisement. The difference between people who see the advert and the ones who don't is the incremental lift. So please, if we could progress to the next slide. This allows us to look at the ages of people. We could look at whether people are male or female, and we can get purity in the study to show that advertising is being incrementally done. Next slide, please. This incremental concept, there's lots of things within the advertising that you do that may cause uplift regardless of whether you have another advert. This section in the middle of the Venn diagram are people who would have converted anyway. You want to understand people who couldn't have converted because they didn't see the ad in the first place. The concept of incrementality in getting to this is the cutting edge thing that so many companies are looking to progress towards now. By testing and getting through this understanding, they minimize that 25% down as close to zero as possible so that all this money goes in the right place where it should do, having impact selling your products. The next slide, please. 
There's a couple of examples I'll give just very briefly on the next slide. And the first one is how Philips in Russia used video ads and stories on Instagram to reach parents. And you could see the numbers are, are not so important. They have to be put within the context of other advertising to be understood. But of course, naturally, they're good numbers. Philips could trust this information, knowing that there was an incremental impact every time they have advertised on Instagram. And on the next slide, please, you'll see on this another example, again from Philips for an Instagram ad. They wanted to look at men um, and their reaction to a new vacuum cleaner. And so the uplift there, again, you can see in ad recall and in brand awareness, but particularly around men. They wanted to see what's the impact we have specifically on men. Is this advert cutting through? And this technique allowed them to have total confidence because of the scientific approach that it was giving them incremental uplift. The next slide, please. The techniques that we use are to help advertisers to understand audience, to understand brand impact, and to understand sales outcomes, both on Facebook and off Facebook as well. And this is where we work closely with advertisers to help use these techniques to enhance their understanding of how Facebook is working and Instagram is working for them. So I'm just gonna go into the next section, please. The, the next slide. I'd like to talk very quickly just about how things should be viewed within the time that we find ourselves in now. How should advertising be within the, the current pandemic? Uh, please onto the, the next slide. We, we have a, a few examples of how things are changing. So we all know how much impact this has had. Um, everyone has been impacted. We've seen on our own platforms the sheer volume of increase in WhatsApp usage and in, in messenger usage, apart from, the, apart from the other ways that people use the platform. And all businesses have had to adapt quickly. Next slide, please. If you bear in mind that measurement does two things for us, it allows us to assess our advertising effectiveness and it allows us to optimize between strategies even in the current moment. We have to be cautious to know that we're actually doing the right thing by optimizing to the data that we get now because the moment in time that we're using it could be very different to a later period. The next slide, please. The difference you'll see on the next slide between optimization and effectiveness can be taken into the different solutions that you use. So the lift that I spoke about before in brand or in conversions, these are both things that help advertisers understand both effectiveness and also they could use them to optimize. The attribution that you could use within Facebook's digital platform allows you both to look at effectiveness and optimization. A-B tests, a split test, will allow you to optimize within the current time only as would a third party sales lift in some of the countries throughout Eastern Europe where that technique is available. The marketing mix modeling that I mentioned earlier on, if you include a variable within that, that allows you to look at uplift through this period and then discount it at another period when you're comparing afterwards, we'll be in a much better position, but it's used to understand both effectiveness and optimization. And the next slide is just a final thought on four things that I would like us to, I'd like all marketers to be able to do. On the next slide, you'll see that of these four tools, they help us to understand exactly where we're at in terms of the different approaches we could take. Right now, it's about simplifying strategy. Don't stop measuring. Measuring is still as important as ever. Bear in mind when decisions are short term, exercise caution. You can test to optimize during this current period so your activity is optimized for the here and now but use your context of your industry and what's happening with the industry because different industries face different realities right now. Next slide, please. And this is where I will wrap up. Um, I will just ask you to go through the next two slides to the URL that is on the end. So one more slide, please. The message that I, I would love to leave everyone with, and thank you for listening to me as I talk in English and, and we translate, is measure the metrics that matter to you at this time and every day as we go about our job. And on the final slide, the next slide please, these two resources are useful. The case studies that we have for facebook.com backslash success, they will show you how different advertisers are using it and using the platform 
for understanding their marketing effectiveness. And the final one for any business, small business or large business that is looking for help, advice, assistance around what to do during this particular time, facebook.com backslash business backslash resource will help with various bits of advice and a lot of information we have there. And with that, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Tony. Thank you very much for addressing such a challenging subject in such simple terms. People are already asking if you're going to share your presentation. For sure, absolutely. However, it will only be available to those who have registered for the event. Please note, we have a short break now. And by the way, if you simply follow the link and you haven't registered yet, you can actually spend this time registering. And thank you very much, Tony, and bye-bye. In approximately two or three minutes, we will be happy to see you back. The next hour will focus on retail and it will be moderated by Dragorat. Thank you very much and stay tuned.
Right, hello everyone. We are getting back. So, just as you can see on this slide, now we are going to talk to those who are, apart from doctors uh, and municipality services and other people. So, the people whom we are going to talk to, they are in the front line. And they've been there for, for the last several months and uh, they, they are the retail people. They are those who give us the consumer consumers in big cities and little villages uh, with everything we need. And of course, uh, of course, uh, a very huge transformation is happening to them, and uh, it is partly forced in transformation because uh, everything speeds up. And so today, Yulia Zaribova, the brand director of Lenta Supermarkets, as well as Tatiana Stepanova, uh, who is uh, operational um, director and brand marketing director. So let's start with Julia. And uh, let's be quick. I'm not going uh, to talk anymore. So let's uh, hear um, about their experience. Dargarat, hello. And everyone, uh, hello. I'm very happy to be here and I'm happy to share what happened to the company over the last two months. Actually, retail actually had was hit by the by the circumstances and became the major hope for the people everything that was happening to people for the last two months actually we took we took the strike and we were on the front line of all the show social events and we became um and uh, we took our position and of course the speed of reaction, reaction and uh, the number of projects uh, that we did, uh, what we did for the team. I think that our effectiveness uh, increased, uh, I don't know, 10 or 100 times. And today I'm going to be quite practical and I would like to get practical with our audience today because I today brought uh, both the results and the tools that we gathered throughout the last two months and I'm also going to share the plans, our plans for the future. And let me repeat, I believe that food retail is a mirror for what's happening in the world and uh, in our country and what's happening to our clients as well. So looking at our experience for the past uh, two months, I can actually um, divide it into five blocks uh, uh, about the team, about communication and leadership. So let's talk about it. But at the beginning, let's see how can we use uh, this crisis experience in the future. So in my first slide, you can see what happened to people in the previous periods when people found themselves in very challenging circumstances. So what we know for sure is that um, if people used to feel quite relaxed in the past, now they stockpiling because their income drops, they don't feel sure in their income. And of course, they start stockpiling and uh, uh, the second thing which is important, people uh, become more conscientious in their spending and more careful and people reevaluate uh, what uh, they believe is interesting. Sometimes they say no to particular brands and of course uh, they, um, they become very price sensitive. And uh, what we are talking about today is not just um, rational it might be emotional as well so all their thoughts about who i am what is important to me th these questions also are of concern to people and uh, we see that people uh, people become more um conscious than their consumption people 
of course, uh, want to keep the level of their consumption, but they switch from brands to brands and they actually search for the right products. And of course, uh, health concerns become paramount. And it means that we need to talk about health to our consumers, even if we are not a health product. Let me tell you that uh, we talk to our consumers uh, about health all the time. And uh, we share information about how to cook healthy food and uh, how to make exercises, how important the morning exercises are. And so we support people by showing them how to care about their health. And of course, um, every crisis is not just going down economically and uh, financially, but it's also a great head start for technologies. And we know that in 2008, people started using internet more. And in 2014, online sales went up. And of course, people started looking in online platforms and uh, getting their experience with that. And I believe that now we all experience uh, online life because, you know, for example, um, me, I spent, uh, I would say, 90% of my time online in the screens. And of course, uh, all these uh, experiences and all these lessons will be used by marketing people in the future because all the things build habits that will stay with us after the pandemic is over. And so on the next slide, I show four major habits that will stay with us after the COVID times and self-isolation time. Of course, the first thing, people get used to online life and they see all the benefits of optimizing their time and space by living online. And of course, uh, digitalization will become increasingly strong. I don't have a feeling that uh, when we get outside and when we get back to offline uh, joys, uh, actually it will be very long. Uh, we find online life very comfortable and I think that will stay this way. And uh, next thing, of course, everything moves online into this channel. And so people have a greater choice of whom they listen to and what they listen to. And of course, selectivity grows. And people will stay with those who provide high quality content. Let me give you an example. Everyone is giving cooking masterclasses. All of our competitors do. I'm not going to give names, but I think that food retail is the territory of cooking. And uh, not every project in this territory is successful. And so the second lesson as marketing people good is to create a channel that is used to talk to people about their interests and what's relevant to them. So the second thing, people spend time with themselves. They isolate themselves from their habitual communication channels. And so people have a chance to learn more about themselves, to learn more about their opportunities. Well, for example, I don't have as much work now, but I always dreamt about writing a book or, I don't know, running a program. So I think that it's not only about consumption, it's more about um, social issues and the role of personality in communication grows and will grow, will continue to grow. And, and we believe that consumption uh, uh, will be more careful and people will be more price sensitive. Uh, and as a marketing person, I can say that uh, the message we started to use in our communications, we'll see it on the next slide. So, how, how do we build our communications right now? 
which platforms do we use to develop them? Let's get back to the beginning of April. We talked about two major things, the lessons that we got from the crisis, but let's get back to the very beginning, what it all started with. Let's get back to the end of March and the beginning of April. Let's recall our feelings and emotions. What did we, fir we face first? Uncertainty, fear, something very unexpected, and the fear that everything will stop, everything will, be dis everything will disappear, whom can I count on? And so how Lenta Brandt answers all these concerns. And on top of that, I'd like to say that there are so many negativity and ad clutter, and not only there, if we look at the media in general, we see so much of negativity, uh, seek level is rising up, uh, everything's happening in other countries. And so when you look at all this environment, it's very, very hard to find something positive that you can count on and rely on. And at this moment, Lente comes up with a message, whatever happens, you can count on us. And we made um, a number of clips and uh, actually we didn't film them, we drew them. And uh, of course, um, um, our waves, the ads are made, uh, are now limited. And uh, our resources in this uh, respect are limited. And so we created a, a number of cartoons about Lenta helping people survive in this challenging time. And we did it in a very positive manner. Let's have a look. At the, at the videos, and we have two of them, one on the next slide, and uh, another one will be in one slide. Right, next one, please. Whatever happens, the sun is always shining, the earth is spinning, and Lenta keeps prices for the necessary products. Lenta stay the same, whatever the variables are. And we can have a look at the next. Flowers are blooming and uh, garden is always gardening and Lenta always has uh, everything for the perfect weekend in the country house. Lenta stay the same with any variables. And now talking about these communications, I would like to make another point. Apart from staying positive, and let's say confident that uh, Lenta stayed the same, whatever the variables are, we also made a point of saying that um, the rep benefits uh, that stay relevant right now, both for the marketing and business. So the first thing we did we froze uh, the prices for the uh, first necessity products and we started talking about it and uh, people had a chance to buy sugar for 20 rubbers uh, vegetable oil for 22 rubbers and the quality was good and so it helped them survive um, these challenging times and decrease in their purchasing power and um, I can actually give you a link to another cartoon and which says that despite uh, uh, the limited mobility, Lenta stays open. And actually, Lenta is a place where you can get everything from foodstuffs uh, to uh, clothes, clothes and gardening products. So first rule we base our communications on very positive uh, emotional contribution which helps people well at least stay positive and confident and have hope for the future and of course we gather insights which we believe are main for our target audience right now and of course we stay the same uh, and um, we keep stability 
when everything is changing so fast. And actually, this point has already been mentioned today, that people do need the sources of positive me need and also they need a dialogue of what is concern is concerned for them and right now our brand um, has a chance to build a media its media channel which will be used to talk about uh, people's needs and interests and also to talk about its opportunities and uh, resources to provide for these needs and what we did we created a channel which is called stay in and uh, what's happening in this channel every week we talk to people about one thing that is relevant for them. Well, for example, how to care for their health, how to stay beautiful for the girls while they stay at home, and so on and, for, and so forth. And every week an influencer comes to us and the content is very native and very good and um, actually talk uh, about the topic that we announced. So please come and visit us in this channel and you as consumers uh, will find something interesting there, I'm sure of it. And let me continue um, what other actions businesses and marketers can take during these pandemic times. You see, right now we are switching to the recovery stage. And it's evident right now that uh, the chance to get sick is going down and we also have another opportunity to go outside and look around to start with and here the main expectation from brands will be that they will provide stability and they will continue to be useful because people right now have a need a lot of help so it's not about who is more relevant for me right now, who is more interesting. No, it's not about that. Now, support is paramount. And a brand should stay with people for a long time in this crisis situation. And so it makes brand valuable. On top of that, of course, we share our values with our audience or with our insights and we talk about things that are of interest to them. And because of that, of course, we become friends with our audience and it creates a potential for us to become a love brand in the future. And uh, we believe that from recovery, we will proceed to... Next slide, please. Uh, to the next stage and uh, and of course we all know that uh, the world will not stay the same and the insight that can be used by a brand in the future now we are gathering here at this very moment now we are getting information what we can use in the new reality and we, it's happening on the go and of course, uh, we believe uh, that um, at the next stage, we will have to use it. And to, speaking about the speed uh, with which we are going through all these stages, we need to think about our teams as well. Let's uh, switch to the next slide. We need to think about our people and boosting the sites that probably were not really prepared for the changes and we need to boost them very very quickly right now and let's get back to the word that uh, we probably forgot agile and let me remind you of what it's all about and it's an approach that we use with our teams well we've got two ways uh, to work with it one long term and it's about global development and the other part of it is uh, the short-term projects and uh, we collect insight we uh, analyze it we make conclusions and we use them so we need to turn ourselves into heroes um, 
into these characters from uh, the Ice Age cartoon, uh, where people uh, or, and animals were going to the place where they, they could survive. And on the way, lots of uh, great things happened to them, lots of adventures. And so it's all happening at the same time, both short term and long term. And I hope that we will eventually come to this happy future. Let's move on to the next slide, please. Now about uh, employees motivation, just a few life hacks very briefly. I see that I do not have a lot of time left. The first thing, just like with consumers, the team needs certainty. They need to understand what's happening right now, what's happening to the company and it's the best time of, well, for example, to engage the person who works uh, with the numbers to track the efficiency of the team. So everyone should be valued and understand their value. And they need to know that our results are better than that of the competitors. We, for example, need to know that our every check is growing, not dropping. And uh, it's all thanks to their efforts. And of course, quarantine set us apart. But it doesn't mean that we need to focus on our thing primarily and forget about others. I think it's the best times to build the team spirit and to adapt a new reality together with our employees. Well, for example, what we intend to do for that matter. Uh, we've got uh, so-called parties every Friday and we've got meetings on Monday and uh, we discuss what happened during the weekend. So emotional connection with our employees becomes very important and uh, comes forward. We used to have daily meetings and we use them not only to talk about uh, what's happening uh, in the, with the projects, but we also use them to discuss our concerns, what's happening to us as people. And we grew closer. And it's a fact. And it's a great fact. Now, let's move on. I think we covered this next slide as well. Yeah, this one. Now, speaking about leadership, crisis, of course, is an opportunity to become a leader and stay a leader. If we continue our movement and prove ourselves as leaders again and again. I'm not going to talk a lot about Lenta's experience. Let me tell you this, though. Um, in media environment, historically, first of all, we learn to recover very fast. And we need and uh, we learn to keep our position as leaders as well. Next slide, please. I'm not going to go into great details here and repeat what has already been said by previous speakers, but the important points here is to identify factors that might make you a leader in your category. Second, proceed from uh, saving resources to redistribution of resources and, and investments. And the third important factor, and it's uh, internal and external communication wise, uh, so to stay stable and uh, maintain the positive background and mood. How to make plans for the future? When we talked about recovery stage, we mentioned it already. Honestly, right now, we do not have a solution. But I do know right now that we are tracking the insights uh, that our clients have. And uh, we are ready to take them and go forward. But one of the freshest insights, uh, actually, they say that we caught tonight and last night, and actually we need to help each other and we need to give help to those who particularly need it. And it's a, about social responsibility of a brand, not only to take care, but also to give care. And it's also true for people, for each of one of us. 
organize the channel for volunteers uh, to register and uh, give people an opportunity to deliver food to those who cannot go to the stores. And you know, among those who help other people, there is a woman. And this woman made 300 trips to those who cannot leave their houses in one week. And I would like to share her story. Could you please um, switch on the video that I sent you today? And actually, I urge all of you to help, not necessarily with Lenta. You can do it yourselves. You can do it with your brand, any brand that gives you such a chance. Because it increases your own value. And speaking about marketing, it helps to create extra value for the consumers. Um, the video is not part of the presentation. I gave you the link. Ah, we will send the video to everyone registered because right now we cannot broadcast it. But I believe this story is very important and very good. And of course, we will send the materials to everyone who registered for the broadcast with the rest of the materials. Thank you very much. And please stay tuned. And right now, uh, let's proceed to the next speaker, Tatiana Stepanova. And let's talk about uh, Pityorochka and care for everyone. We would like to listen to you, Tatiana, and uh, afterwards, uh, I would like to share the question that I see right now. Да, коллеги, добрый день. Диана, the floor is yours. Colleagues, uh, good day. Can you hear me? Коллеги, меня слышно? Colleagues, can you hear me? Tatiana, you need to choose the channel because now people are telling me that you haven't chosen the channel yet. Can you hear me now? Yeah, great, excellent. My name is Tatiana Stepanova and uh, uh, I'm uh, the I'm from Pitorichka and let me continue uh, the story of uh, started by uh, Julia. First of all, thank you so much for this wonderful event and opportunity to share in my uh, experience. And I would like to thank Avi for this great opportunity. Pandemic created a new reality for all of us. And uh, my presentation is called Pityorochka with care for everyone. And I would like to share what Pityorochka is doing right now. So the first thing that we are facing, turbulence, uncertainty, a labor crisis, and of course, fear of the infection. Next slide, please. Pitorechka is one of the biggest retailers in the country, and uh, we've got over 15,000 stores uh, all around Russia. We've got more than 200,000 employees, and we've got more than 13 million people every day and every second person in Russia visited Pitorechka and we realize how much responsibility we have uh, before our consumers and our employees and all together we can overcome all the difficulties. There are four elements uh, that we use to base uh, uh, our positioning, good prices, uh, good locations, high quality and support of local communities. And uh, we believe that it's not just words for us. We need to focus on all these elements and stay with them. And of course, we need to care for each other. Let me tell you what means uh, what it, mean, what it means for us to stay focused on the local community. The first concern is uh, safety, and it's the first thing for client experiences. So while coming to our stores or uh, communicating with uh, our couriers, uh, people need to stay safe. That's the key thing for our consumers, and it will stay the same when the pandemic is over. And of course, the second thing is support. We offer support to everyone who is struggling right now. And of course, uh, these are elder people and people who suffer from exposure to virus. Now let's talk 
about what Pityorechka did for all these focuses for safety and support. Let's start with safety. Safety for consumers and employees is the key priority for us because we want to be the safest store for our consumers. And so we did quite a lot of prevention measures. Uh, so um, we use a lot of antiseptics uh, in our stores. All our supplies were checked. Um, and of course, they have ex extended measures uh, for prevention in their storehouses. All our employees have PPEs. So we've got masks and gloves. Uh, and all our stores are equipped with sanitizers. And now our stores uh, are opened later and close opened earlier and closes later. And of course, we introduced rules for consumers uh, so that they stay in the store. All this valuable information is shared across all the channels, inside uh, the stores, uh, through the store radios, we talked about in the social media. When crisis just began and people were stockpiling, we would take uh, bloggers and uh, people from the authorities uh, to show them that we've got enough uh, of stock. And uh, if we have uh, uh, empty shelves in the in the supermarkets, we would put special notifications that the food is on the way so that people do not get nervous. And uh, also we created four rules, um, both for the employees and consumers. Uh, the first one is social distance distancing, keeping the distance of two meters. And the second rule of PPEs, antiseptics, masks, masks and gloves. The third rule, we asked our consumers uh, to touch only those products that they are going to buy that will decrease the, the risk of contamination. And of course, we uh, encouraged the usage of plastic cards. And during the epidemics, uh, people didn't work and lots of people lost their jobs. Uh, and we were one of the first companies uh, that decided to help people. And uh, we said that we were hiring and actually we hired um, about 12,000 people in April alone and all these people came from the companies that were closed due to the crisis. Next slide please. So the second focus is um, support. We had quite a lot of initiatives in this respect. The first one is a long-standing projects uh, and it was uh, the basket of kindness we made it together with Roost Foundation and the, this project is designed to help um, elderly people, lonely people, people with lots of children and uh, our consumers would uh, leave uh, and buy the products for this kindness basket so that we gave it other people to a chance to care for other people. And also we created uh, in rostov on -Don, a kindness basket for animals. In our stores, uh, we created special hours uh, designed for only reserves for elderly people. And we said to all the rest of the consumers that these are the times reserved for elderly people so that they stay safe while going to the store. And we also supported the initiative uh, where and neighbors can help elderly people in their houses and compartment builders. And we also created a, a designated hotline in our call centers uh, where we would uh, get orders uh, from elderly people and our volunteers would deliver these uh, food sets and we also created a sp special bonus cards uh, for volunteers and people who work in the front line and they would buy food uh, with discount and also we created a uh, um, free of charge express delivery for elderly people and we also help doctors and the nurses and right now we are helping more than 100 hospitals and labs all across Russia and we are sending food there. 
And we also um, work with retirement homes, 33 of them, we support them. And we especially help to veterans who stay in the retirement homes. We also hope we work with our partners and with our suppliers uh, to help population. For example, together with Halls, we launched a, an observation and uh, around, uh, one, around 10 million rubles uh, will be used to buy equipment for the hospitals. Next slide, please. As has already been said, uh, self-isolation is a totally new experience for everyone. And of course, now we consume more digital services and people change uh, their habits and they start using more online services. It was a challenge for us and we introduced express delivery in Moscow, St. Petersburg and Kazan. And we did it very quickly and uh, we launched that very quickly. And right now we serve 11,000 orders every day and it's not the limit for us. And of course, we realize that people need extra content right now that they're staying at home. And we did together with our partner, we called it Bonus Pityorechka. And we would um, give access to all kinds of educational and entertainment programs, Litras, uh, EV, book, and all kinds of uh, entertainment content. And uh, for us, we realized uh, that it's a part of the new lifestyle. And so we would help our consumers to have uh, better time at home. Next slide, please. Probably that's the most important campaign for us. It's a cherry, you know, on our cake. It was uh, very important to become closer with our consumers. And so we launched this special campaign, Pityorechka with Care for Everyone. And we wanted to communicate uh, the most important steps that we make. We wanted to communicate how we deal with the pandemics, uh, what we do in our stores, what we do for our employees, and what we do for our consumers. And we urged our consumers to um, stay true to safety rules because only together we can fight the crisis if we respect each other and if we stay within the rules. And we created a special video and uh, we did it in several locations in Moscow and Krasnodar. And we uh, um, featured our employees and our general director, and we wanted to create bigger trust to our brand. In a couple of minutes, I will show you the video with great pleasure. And uh, every third person in the country saw this video and we reached more than 50 million people. And we wanted to say that we care about our consumers, we care about our employees, and the care was the key message for us that we wanted to communicate in these times, and we focused on it. Next slide, please. In order to support the idea of the campaign of our social responsibility, we also la launched a flash mob on social media, and we uh, urged uh, people to thank everyone who goes to work, uh, people like volunteers and doctors and couriers. We saw this experience in Europe. We wanted to introduce it in Russia. So many people risk their lives uh, going outside and helping others, and we wanted to thank them. And this initiative was uh, supported by celebrities, uh, Askar Kuchiela, Tuta Larsen, um, Black Star, and other people supported us in that. And this project was very important for us. And it was initiated by the, our general director in his Instagram. And uh, actually, this was quite a complicated project. And uh, lots of users supported us. And uh, uh, people applauded to this uh, project. Uh, and uh, more than 15 million people saw it, this flash mob. All the initiatives, uh, our social initiatives and others, uh, they were quite effective. In, and in April, our NPS grew six points 
and for us it's unprecedented occasion and we believe uh, that uh, this caring for the community initiative will be growing and will continue and now let's watch the video Um, Tatiana, uh, our technical team uh, is trying to launch the video and once we are ready, I'll tell you. Well, actually that was the, the cherry of my presentation and now I'm uh, ready to answer the questions. What else I would like to point out? Retail is in the front line right now and we work 8 by 25 everything is changing very quickly and as Yulia said it's a big challenge for us but Pityorechka focuses on social support and social responsibility of our brand and we also did lots of projects inside the stores and with our consumer consumers and we particularly focused on social care and we support our consumers and of course uh, it affects NPS as I said. Tatiana, Yulia, thank you very much. Uh, we have a lot of positive comments on your presentations and I think it's evident uh, because uh, the changes that are happening to retail right now, both for you and your colleagues, uh, we can see them with our own eyes uh, in the stores. Uh, we see how quickly retail is changing. Retail that we used to know for decades how it transformed just in a couple of months. And so we do have a couple of questions and I hope that you will be able to answer them. I saw a lot of questions about online retail, both for Yulia and Tatiana. So probably there are several points of interest here. Do you expect it to continue to grow or it's just a temporary thing? And once uh, the self-isolation is over, people will get back to the, their old uh, shopping format. And it's uh, also a question about uh, how stores work. Because right now uh, there are more people who assemble orders more than uh, consumers in the stores. So do you believe that this situation will stay with us or the stores will get back to their usual form and, uh, once the self-isolation is over? I, I don't think that it will be uh, just like in the old times or it will be just like, like now. I think that will people people will use online, but they will still have the pleasure of going to a store and seeing with their own eyes. So it will be a mix. People will combine express derivatively and going to the stores. But I believe that digital will grow anyway. Julia Zaripova, I believe that it depends on the category and uh, it might differ category wise, but we need to influence the situation. We need to build the val value of our channel and our categories uh, for the future periods where people start coming out. Nevertheless, we need to understand that what kind of changes are going to happen in the behavioral consumers. And we need to be ready to provide the solution that will be relevant for the new reality. And then it all depends on the category and what marketing people do in each category. And I agree that uh, the online shift, drastic online shift will not happen. Because, you know, um, the value of tactile contact uh, 
stays and it's uh, true for luxury goods and uh, it's true for example for furniture and uh, there are technologies uh, that uh, can be uh, described online but but they but people need to interact with them in real life offline so what's important here is how we can predict the demand and how we can answer this demand timely. So how do you, what do you think about the future of uh, consultants, in-store consultants in offline stores? Do you think that all these people will be fired? Will they be unemployed? And what should people do, people who are like that? Well, I believe that they will be uh, in high demand and they will still help people. Client experience is very important right now and it will create extra value. But I believe that they, social, they, they will specialize on particular things. Dima, we don't think that uh, it will become obsolete. I believe that it will be a new hero and uh, they solve the conflicts and uh, they react very quickly. So the way uh, the salespeople feel and act right now, and I include couriers into this category, I think that uh, together with doctors, these are the key people that show whether we survive or not. So they're the key people right now. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Julia, the last question, Tatiana. Everything we see in retail uh, is happening not only here, but uh, all over the world. The situation is more or less the same all over the world. But can you describe certain things that are specific for Russia, some know-how that was invented here, something that differentiates Russia from the retail in other countries. I believe that Russian know-how is uh, the way of thinking. What people do in the times of crisis, it would make us strong. And I think it's happening in our country right now. So I believe our know-how is how we handle the situation, how we live in this situation and how we recover from the situation. And despite that the fact that people are struggling, and I'm really sorry that we couldn't share the story of volunteers, but you can visit our social network account and see it there. So this ability and willingness to provide care for other people in the times when you need to care yourself. That's our know-how. And I believe it's one of the insights that we can use in the future. Yes, I totally agree with you, Julia. Care is very important because um, Russian people, they're very warm in their hearts and we see how people support each other. And we are not so, you know, law abiding uh, as in Europe. And uh, in retail, uh, we need to educate people how to buy properly and how to make themselves safe. And so I believe that these things are particularly important in Russia. Thank you very much. I think it's a great conclusion for the session. Thank you for your presentations and um, thank you to Lenta and Yulia for the partnership. And me in the meanwhile, the video that Tatiana wanted to show is ready. And I, I suggest that we see it right now as a final stroke. And then we are going to have a very short break and afterwards we'll have two presentations about, delivered by Mediacom. There will be uh, two speakers from two countries with an overview, with a broad overview, what we need to expect in the future. And the second presentation will be delivered by Beeline. Yeah, thank you very much and stay healthy. That's very important.
Today we come to work to keep working and put all our hearts into it to make everybody's health and safety our top priority to support everyone is making a huge effort every day to stand side by side with the members of the team to stay closer to each other even at a distance because this is what matters to everybody to extend a helping hand to everybody who needs it to show our respect to the older generation to provide you with everything you're used to so let's stick to this very simple rules let's safeguard seniors let's wash our hands keep a distance and if you can stay at home we come to work every day now in order to overcome any problems today and tomorrow. You have 200,000 employees of Pitorishka taking care of everyone.
hello everybody and uh, we're back in action uh, mediacom will start this panel and uh, mediacom experts are going to describe the happy uh, i'm sorry the brave new world uh, we're seeing and we are going to talk to yaron farizon who is the general manager of uh, mediacom uh, russia and chief strategy officer of mediacom uk jeff de oh also we are going to publish a link now for the English language webcast. Since we have such a solid international team connected, it would be great to hear from you guys about the experience of countries that started their COVID transition earlier. Hi, everybody, and thank you very much for this great opportunity. I'm really grateful to the FE team for everything, including this water bottle. So, name is Yaron Farizon. I'm head of MediaCom Russia. And together with my colleague Jeff, I'm going to tell you not about what we're experiencing now but rather about what we can do about it the battle plan is that i'm going to focus on the general trends and how some of these trends you know can be relevant to russia while jeff's contribution is to tell us about the experience of other countries that were ahead of russia on the same curve so the structure of our presentation is as follows we will talk a little bit about the current state and a lot about what to expect. Actually, this slide contains a snapshot of what has already transpired in Russia. Oh, great. Now I have your attention, which is perfect. I understand you must already be suffering from an information overload. So very briefly, what has already happened? Now, if we study the changes in consumer behavior and in uh, terms of media consumption in particular, there have been four major changes. One is the growth of video, video content, whatever shape and form it takes. It could be TV, online, video on demand, uh, watching movies from your dacha or from your country house. Everything has grown. Like we're talking about double digit growth. Also, there has been a boom in news do it yourself and other entertainment shows now the amount of stuff and the amount of content people consume in this category has grown almost exponentially also there has been an increase in terms of interperson connectivity since we are not able to meet each other in person we have been using zoom teams and other uh, vcs solutions like crazy and finally ecom e-commerce has changed as well Note, however, a major change in fast uh, in uh, FMCG changes. However, I have a separate slide on that. So we are obviously at the epicenter of change, and now I'd like to tell you how we are planning future uh, with our uh, clients. Now, Nassim Taleb is very well known like the author of the black swan and anti-fragility famously said it's the acceptance of lack of certainty in our knowledge that matters so much it's our method for dealing um you know with our ignorance effectively that's actually how we act you know here at mediacom we analyze lots of insights lots of articles lots of news bites and we try to look for the weak signals for the early signs that something is changing next slide It's very important to realize, you know, how quickly we can recover. And uh, these are the two potential recovery curves. So this chart shows that Europe can be expected to recover very gradually and very slowly. And actually, that's what we're already seeing in Russia. A big, besides COVID, there is also the economic crisis and for a number of reasons, we shouldn't really expect it to be a V-shaped recovery. Now, what does a slow recovery mean? In the following slide, we wanted to discuss it in more detail. A slow recovery, my picture is not sharp enough for some reason, says Yaron. So, a slow recovery effectively means that people will be more pessimistic, which means, you know, they will be gloomy and they will postpone major purchases. On the media side, a 
some of the new habits that we have noticed are here to stay. Next thing we did was to analyze lots of different sources and summarize the key trends we're seeing in yeah, both midterm and long term trends. So the next slide illustrates long term effects. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to discuss everything that I have in my slides, but you will have the deck, so it shouldn't be a problem. So technology has drastically changed the way we live and act today. Obviously, companies like Mail.ru, Sparebank, and Yandex have become the pillars of our lives in COVID times. Please note, however, the role of technologists going forwards. There are industries, for example, that are bound to change, and they will change drastically, and they will be propelled to this change by technologists. Some industries will actually, I'm sorry, some technologies will become even more relevant to certain industries. Take fashion, for example. Obviously, offline sales of fashion, well, they don't exist in modern day Russia at all. There are some online sales, but obviously don't really compensate for the jump off the cliff that offline sales of clothes took. At the same time, in digital fashion, consumers are getting treated to some radically new experiences. Some very well-known companies are finally turning towards these uh, technologies. You know, using online fitting rooms has never been big in Russia, although the technology has been around for quite some time. It is changing now. You know, the fashion world is getting gamified. And given that, Offline sales of clothes are not going to be part of our reality anytime soon. This gamification is expected to help the retailers a lot. Uh, leading designers such as Tommy Hilfiger have actually stated that they are postponing manufacturing. Like Tommy said, I will only produce once you've ordered. You've placed an order, we start seeing. And I can treat it as an early warning, as an early sign. The following slide should show a technology that has been around for quite some time. However, technologies like voice will play a new role. I'm referring, referring to voice assistants like Siri, Alexa, or Yandex's Alisa. You know, even in 2019, voice assistants were a fancy innovation. However, enabling vice technology will be a matter of social responsibility in 2020. You know, when you actually don't need the touch or you should avoid the touch, using voice-enabled technologies becomes a must for most marketers and for most campaigns. You know, the sooner you start employing it, the sooner you will win a good rep with the consumers. Next slide. Naturally, the current stress will have an impact on the society. Usually, crisis, at least in Russia, produce two radically different reactions. You know, Russia has a pretty paternalistic government, and people often, in times of crisis, often expect the government to be kind of uh, strong-handed and to introduce fines and strict rules. And at the same time, we expect bigger things to change. For example, the relationship between cities and suburbs. And people are now looking for new sources of information, sources they can trust. You know, all those who are doing marketing in Russia obviously know that uh, the big cities really matter. Like Moscow and St. Pete together account for 50%, 5-0, of our business in Russia. And many people now are out of jobs, and this also needs to be taken into account. On the other hand, some people are loving working from home, and this is something that may actually stay even after the lockdown is lifted. So what are the early signs that this may happen? 
Next slide. Something we can see both from our ethnographic studies and our quantitative research. You know, people are now treating the information flows differently. Many people are tired. You know, they are swamped and snowed under the information. So they change their information sources. And many people now prefer Telegram because it gives them better control. And I'm showing with the quotes on the screen that people are really sick and tired of it. So we are claiming that beyond this crisis, people will continue to be smarter about their information consumption and they will exercise better control over their information sources. Now, if you are in this industry, you have to be aware of that. I mentioned suburbs before. What we already see now is that TV viewing from country houses has reached all time heights. Obviously, it's out of season, like the outflow of people from the big cities to their dodges is unprecedented. In fact, all those uh, veggie and green thumb hobbies are at an all time high. Yeah, gardening in the gardening category, for example, we see a 30% increase both in sales and in searches. Like people can work from home. Many people are now working from their duchess or from their country houses. And uh, those who aren't doing that yet are now busily equipping their country houses so that they can actually work safely from there. And I guess this is to stay. So from the viewpoint of marketing, we need to ask ourselves, how are we going to change our communication routines? Because a significant chunk of our communications has been targeting city dwellers as the main source of our business. The last area here is media. So TV and online video watching have grown. And uh, this is not that surprising, really. The interesting new development, though, is that investment in digital has dropped. I'm referring to vanilla digital. And this is very easy to explain because uh, SMEs are tanking and they have cut uh, their digital expenses sharply. So this is potentially a sign of the new normal. So what do we do? So e-com has already been mentioned a couple of times. So you will see two charts here in the same slide. And I want to tell you an interesting story about them. What you see on the left is the evolution of offline sales. Shown in the right hand slide in the right hand chart is the evolution of online sales of the same broader categories, pasta, toilet paper, and milk. What we see here is the obvious surge in online sales. Note, however, that it was a short lived uplift, and some categories even tanked after this uplift. I'm sorry, we must be talking, uh, we must have been talking about offline. You know, FMCG companies have been trying to increase their online sales for years, and uh, the results have been mediocre at best. But look at the right hand at the right hand chart. You know, CPG categories are crazy. Note the green curve. Milk is something that people buy on a regular basis. You don't really stockpile milk, unlike toilet paper or pasta. 
So interestingly, even this category has been propelled in online sales. I do agree with the previous speakers that we are not going to go back to the old normal. But I'm claiming that CPG categories will sustain this change even beyond the crisis. So we believe that uh, vanilla digital will decline. And at the same time, there will be higher demand for immersive experience ecosystems. What I mean here is as follows. I'm talking about chatbots, voice technologies, e-com, uh, media solutions. And very often, if you need to create an ecosystem like this, you need to contract like five different companies. Interestingly, VK, for example, and Facebook have already got what it takes to launch full-blown ecosystems like one-stop shop solutions. And this is what we expect to continue rising. And marketers will be happy, I guess, to adapt to it. And so we'll be ready to reallocate their funds. Because you know, if you work with five different providers, it will be much more difficult to create a holistic ecosystem for the consumers. So my penultimate slide deals with the question of what, what do we do now? Now, my invitation to us all, the industry and consumers, is to plan with flexibility. Recovery will be gradual. And moreover, it will differ from region to region. And in case of a new outbreak, a new regions uh, may be shut down. No, the market has been quite diverse in terms of reacting to these changes. You know, I'm talking both about uh, uh, marketers and vendors, but generally all of us will have to learn how to rapidly change our media mixes and our messaging. We absolutely need to learn how to mitigate risks with media owners. And we also need to master new ways of working with our clients. Unfortunately, the market hasn't really grasped it yet. The sooner we do, the better off we'll be, even in post-crisis times. Let me finish with a quote by JFK, who famously, next slide please, who famously said that the word crisis when written in Chinese composed of two characters, that is danger and opportunity. They say it's apocryphal and still, I believe that the current situation offers us lots of opportunities for effective and efficient marketing. Thank you very much, Yaron. We're about to uh, switch to Jeff. Yaron, will you stay with us? Yes, I will. Uh, you will need to say next slide, Jeff. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you and uh, hello everyone. Um, uh, hello from the UK and thank you for inviting me along. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I think, I believe we're, uh, we are uh, sort of a couple of weeks ahead of the trend uh, in the UK to where you are in Russia in terms of the stages of the crisis. And I think the, the good news from the UK uh, is that happiness is beginning to return. So this is from the weekly mood, mood tracker um, conducted by YouGov in the UK, and the pink line is happiness, which was the predominant um, mood in the UK ahead of lockdown. It slumped early on to be replaced by scared, um, which is the gold line, and happiness has now returned to the number one uh, emotion in the UK, which is, which is good news to see. Uh, I think the worry, though, is that boredom and stress, which are the grey and green lines, boredom and stress um, remain high as well. So next slide, please. Um, we're starting to think in the UK about what the next stage of the recovery looks like. We're starting to see lockdown being relaxed and we're seeing that from other countries as well. So what, what I've looked at here is some learnings from the UK, from other countries in Western Europe, from Australia and the US as well, as to what things might look like. Um, so if we go on to the next slide, please. Uh, we've seen that, uh, sorry, on the next slide, please. Uh, we see that uh, in China, 
uh, that media consumption is beginning to rebalance. So as people return to work, some of the initial uh, sort of trends of the elevated media are changing. But we're seeing that TV viewing is remaining high at peak time because while people have returned to work, people are still not socialising outdoors uh, or doing out of home events like they used to. So TV, elevated TV viewing remains high. We're also seeing that digital and social media channels are maintaining the gains that they made early in the crisis, particularly as older consumers who are less comfortable with digital media uh, carry on their, their elevated usage. I know that my, my mother has been spending far more time on Facebook and on uh, getting comfortable with digital media since the outbreak, and I think that's uh, quite a, a common trend uh, in the UK. Uh, we'll see on the next slide um, that we really think that uh, working from home is going to become the new normal. Uh, so already Twitter in the UK has announced that it will allow its employees to work from home permanently. Cambridge University, um, the UK's oldest and most prestigious university, has announced that its courses will remain uh, online only uh, until July next year. So the entire academic year next year will be virtual. Uh, and I think uh, the expectations of many UK office workers in particular is that we'll be working from home, not just through the summer, but potentially through the autumn and into 2021 as well. So that has real implications for, 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 for everything, for, for e-commerce, for media. Uh, so kind of thinking about how uh, the, 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 what's happening now becomes permanent. So we think that, will, that does mean that channels like radio, which have boomed, uh, in the UK during lockdown as people listen to radio while they're working from home, but that will continue. Um, that e-commerce, when you're at home all the time to receive deliveries, it makes e-commerce easier for everyone. And already we've seen some, some really surprising shifts, as Yaron already said, uh, in e-commerce. If we go on to the next slide, uh, we're seeing that many physical retailers uh, have more than replaced their sales um, since lockdown. So this is Argos which is one of the UK's biggest general retailers. Um, they sell just about everything. They have um, over 500 stores in the UK and they've closed them all. Uh, uh, and they have more than replaced those sales. Half of the, the, the sales from their physical stores has moved to online e-commerce for home delivery. And half of those sales have moved to click and collect. Uh, click and collect being Argos is owned by Sainsbury's, one of the UK's biggest uh, grocery retailers, uh, and they're allowing people to collect their Argos deliveries from Sainsbury's stores, which are still open. Uh, and so they've managed to completely pivot their business model away from physical retail into these two other channels. Um, the next thing we are seeing um, from every market is as, uh, as the economy is badly hit, um, in the UK alone, 9 million people quarter of the workforce are furloughed, um, so being paid not to work at 80% of their pay, and unemployment rises, that we are seeing a, a surge in uh, value expectations. People are looking more and more to how they can save money. Uh, and if we look on the next slide, uh, that uh, in both Norway and in Australia, for example, uh, there is a big rise in buy now, pay later apps. So the example from Australia is Afterpay. In Norway, it's Klarna. And these are apps that allow you to purchase goods online, but only pay later on. So people looking to postpone um, and spread out their payments over time. Uh, we're seeing people seek searching for, for value in more and more categories. So it's important that everyone has a clear value proposition as the economic recession begins to kick in. The next trend we are seeing from uh, many markets around the world uh, as they emerge from lockdown, uh, on the next slide, is the surge in health and fitness. People realizing how unfit they've become during lockdown. People are fearful of um, uh, being more likely to catch the virus if they're unfit. Uh, so we're seeing in the UK, sales of bicycles uh, have, um, Surge bicycles are now sold out. It's very difficult to buy bicycles anywhere. Um, we're creating pop-up bicycle lanes everywhere in the UK. In China, there has been a boom in um, uh, uh, online workouts, uh, in sales for Nike as well. Um, so people really looking to see how they can exercise in a social distance manner to maintain their fitness post the outbreak. So I think we'll see a decline in 
physical gym usage because of fears of contact, uh, but increases uh, maintained in out of home exercising uh, in the streets and in the parks uh, and on in home exercising like Peloton or other Zoom workouts. One thing which we do expect, um, as uh, Yuan mentioned earlier, is that the recovery will be slow. So if we look on the next slide, uh, we've looked at two of the countries that are further ahead, uh, the furthest ahead in Europe, uh, which are Norway and Germany, that have relaxed uh, their outbreaks earlier, rel relaxed their lockdowns earlier, because they had fewer deaths, fewer cases. And what you can see is despite relaxing the lockdown, uh, that um, general retail and recreation still remain way below the baseline. People are still afraid of catching the virus. People are still afraid of social contact. Uh, so it is, it's a slow recovery that we're looking at. And I think that's going to be potentially even slower in the markets which have had more severe outbreaks, uh, like the UK, Spain, Italy, France, for example. Uh, and I think more worrying, uh, and this is the next slide, uh, is that recovery may not just be one way. Uh, so the red line here is the proportion of British people who think that the worst is still to come. And that was steadily declining, which was good news, steadily declining into early May. And that's jumped back up in the last, uh, in the last week as reports come from some other countries about uh, maybe lockdown ending prematurely, about the fact there have been new infections in Wuhan, uh, or that in France, some of the schools that we opened have had to close again. So I think this idea that people are anticipating um, lockdown to ease and then go back up again as um, it's hard to control the, the outbreak. Uh, on to the next one. And that, uh, that those continued fears um, show that across many markets, this graph shows how comfortable people, people would be about allowing their children to return to school. So the gray bar is definitely not, a light blue bar is not comfortable, and the dark blue bar is comfortable. So only in Australia and South Korea, uh, which are much further ahead in their control of the virus, are even the majority of people comfortable allowing their children to return to school. In most countries, um, people are not comfortable allowing children to return to school, even if they reopen because fears of social contact um, remain high. Uh, what we are seeing, going on to the next slide, is that this fear, because it remains so high, that advertisers who are making clear steps to make shopping, to make interaction as safe as possible, are really well appreciated. So Tesco are a Mediacom client. They're the UK's biggest supermarket. And in uh, two days, they shot a social distancing ad that very clearly demonstrated and explained uh, what they were doing in their stores to reduce um, social contact, to keep people two meters apart, to protect their staff with plastic screens, to install one-way systems in the aisles. Uh, and this advert um, uh, was tracked by Kantar and is in the 1% of best performing adverts that the UK has ever seen. Um, people really, really responded well to this advert. Um, it won't win any creative award. It's not particularly glamorous advert, um, not particularly creative, but what it is is really helpful and um, consumers really appreciate that. So um, I think that's one tip is that if you're thinking about reopening, anything you can do to reassure will help. On to the next slide. We're also seeing a real gap in expectation. So this was a survey from China before the lockdown ended that said people were looking forward to out of home dining and gathering, out of home shopping, out of home entertainment, travel. Uh, and what we've seen is actually the reality is once lockdowns ease, that because of the, uh, some of the fears, that the growth uh, in these is slower than anticipated. And onto the next slide, we're seeing a very differential response. Um, so this slide shows uh, the percentage of people who have been uh, the top two bars are the people who've been unaffected, and the bottom two are the people who've been impacted hard. And we're seeing that um, older people in the UK, so those 65 and older with no children, 64% of them have been unaffected by the crisis economically, whereas only 29% of families have been unaffected. At the bottom end, 
only 18% of older people have been impacted badly, but 50% of families. So we think there's going to be coming out of this that grandparents are going to have far more spending power. And we're talking to our clients about how we re-pivot some of our spend to support grandparents, older people who've got more money to spend coming out of lockdown. Uh, on to the next slide. And because of this variability in how people have been affected, we're seeing uh, counter, counter trends everywhere. So for example, eating. Um, uh, on, on one side, we see people immunity eating, so people trying to eat really healthily, eating more green food, more vegetables to try and stay healthy. On the other side, as McDonald's have reopened in the UK, we've seen enormous queues, queues of over a kilometre to get into uh, McDonald's. Um, when it comes to drinking alcohol, uh, we're seeing many people drinking and having Zoom parties where they drink beers together after work. And at the other hand, there's a trend towards lockdown detoxing with people uh, using excuses to cut down their drinking. On exercise, we're seeing some people fully embrace Zoom workouts. At the other time, there are people who are just accepting they're exhausted, it's too tiring, too stressful, and not worrying about being unhealthy. On mental health, we are seeing record levels of anxiety, people really worried. At the same time, other people are using Zoom for mindfulness uh, to try and treat themselves. And on clothing, um, we're seeing some people react against PPE, personal protective equipment. And at the other end, I've, we've seen a boom on Facebook of advertising of fashion masks. Will the fashion mask be the new trend of the summer uh, going through? So I think for every trend, there's a counter trend as different people react differently. And on to my final slide. Uh, we're kind of summing this trend up as the tension between FOGO versus YOLO. So FOGO is the fear of going out. It's uh, people concerned about social contact, about wanting to stay at home, improve their garden, exercise at home, versus the you only live once trend, YOLO. Actually, we've been locked down for, for eight weeks. I want to go out and meet my friends. I want to exercise. I want to see the sun. I want to go back out. And that, that trend, that tension between FOGO and YOLO exists between different types of people, but even within the same person. I, I recognize that in myself that I want to protect myself, but I miss my friends as well. And I think that desire to support security, safety, hygiene on one side, but also to help people um, maximize their desire for indulgence, for reconnection at the other, is going to be an interesting trend um, as we come out of this. So um, that's my last slide. Thank you um, very much for your time. And I think we're moving on to uh, questions now. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Jeff and Yiran. Indeed, we do have a little bit of time maybe to entertain one question per speaker. Yiran, a question for you. In your presentation, you mentioned that uh, marketers need to develop a new ecosystem as opposed to simply juggling several channels. What do you think agencies have got to offer and how do you think they uh, may change or they need to change in order to propose such an ecosystem or a turnkey solution. Great question. I love all those system thinking questions. I believe that agencies already have uh, diverse expertise. However, it hasn't been happening much really. In most cases, these have been fancy, schmancy, special projects only done once. So I believe that such turnkey solutions can become the new core for many agencies. And then they should be able to offer totally different solutions in terms of their quality, in terms of their holisticity to their clients. How fast is it going to change? That's a moot point because much really depends on the clients. You know, very few of our clients want an ecosystem solution. They usually want a media plan or a media activation. That's it. So if our clients really want to be effective, they need to consider it. Because I guess that's the way to develop a seamless 
and in very effective ecosystem. Thank you, Iran. Jeff, the question for you. What's this uh, expectation versus uh, reality data for China? Oh, no, I'm sorry. Is your presentation shareable? Question one. And question two, what's your expectation with regard to China's recovery? Because I, you did say that China may, I'm um, sorry, Yaron said that China may recover quickly. Do you think, and one more question, there will be higher demand for products with, uh, with some extra environmental qualities? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, three questions. So firstly, um, uh, is my presentation shareable? Yeah, yes, it is. Um, I'll, uh, that I, the organizers have it so they can um, distribute. On the second um, uh, question about China, I do think they will have a faster recovery because uh, their, the outbreak in China was um, far more concentrated in one area than, than it has been in the European market. It was very much concentrated in Wuhan. Uh, we have offices in Shanghai and Beijing, and Shanghai and Beijing were less impacted with less cases uh, uh, than even in London or Rome or Paris. Uh, so um, in those, in, 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 in the sort of the, the, the coastal areas of China that are the powerhouse of the economy, they're much more quickly returning to normal. Um, they're already a very uh, advanced e-commerce market. Um, so I think they're much better set up to recover quickly. Um, they also do have a government that is an, and a population uh, that are far more, um, probably far more easier to com command and control the economy than it might be in some Western markets. Uh, and people are more accepting uh, of, uh, of some of the, the methods they're using to control the outbreak. So definitely think that China will recover more quickly. Uh, and then the uh, third question, sorry, what was the third question again? It was about uh, potential extra demand for immunity products that you mentioned. Ah, uh, yes. Will it stay? Uh, I think that will stay for some time. I think that the um, we are seeing that uh, there are, uh, according to a, survey, a study from Ipsos, 45% uh, of the UK population are very anxious and fearful. There's about a similar group of about 45% who are accepting and tolerant, who are just waiting for this to be over and are generally happy. But 44% are fearful, stressed, anxious. And I think for these people, um, the importance of hygiene, of um, social distancing, of using masks, uh, hand sanitizer, of thinking about ways in which they can replicate out of home activities in the home, uh, I think is going to continue for some time until until there is uh, a vaccination or until there is a, a definite end to the outbreak, I think people will a, a certain proportion of people will continue to be very much needing of that, um, uh, that messaging. There's some very useful research and recommendations from Kantar that was released last week uh, about, about this, about the, the need to signal hygiene being one of the key factors in getting towards the, the end of uh, uh, the outbreak. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you, Yaron. I know that Yaron has to start his client pitch in approximately 60 seconds. <laughs> so thank you very much for accepting our offer to speak right before it. We wish you all sorts of success. Thank you very much, Jeff, for the great contribution. And we are continuing this session. Next, we shall have uh, Irina Lebedeva, who is the VP of Beeline. Oh, Vion. Hi, good to see you. Well, before your presentation, we had this discussion about this uh, widespread impression in the CPG industry that digital companies must have benefited handsomely from the crisis. You know, they didn't have to do much. You know, just that many of their clients are now much more happily using their digital services and the only problem they have is a great problem to have like servicing extra demands maybe beefing up their infrastructure so i understand this must be an illusion would you like to dispel this myth and if there are any insights you'd like to share please shoot yeah i'll try to answer all these questions in my speech 
you know, as I was uh, listening to uh, the previous speakers, I really enjoy the presentations. Uh, you've got a green line of speakers and great subjects to cover. You know, many people said uh, that consumers are moving online. And since we are one of the companies actually enabling online, uh, let's discuss how we do that. The title of the slide is Nerves as Thick Ropes. You know, many, many consumers now are looking for a new point of uh, a mental equilibrium, let's call it like this. So they have to settle in their apartments in big cities or in their country houses. Mobility has uh, certainly gone down. Next slide. What people care about now is different. Like many other telecom companies, uh, Beeline serves dozens of millions of subscribers. And naturally, we pay a lot of attention to listening to our clients. Well, NPS, a very well-known methodology, enables us to regularly poll millions of clients, millions of subscribers. And then we use text analytics simply to identify the key terms. So the pre-COVID to after COVID or COVID times comparison shows that connectivity is topmost, topmost concern for the subscribers. Even changing their rate plan is not as important as connectivity and speed. Next slide. Am I the only person who is experiencing some lags in terms of how fast you click the slides? So, people need to be online because obviously you cannot study or work if you're online. You know, I guess your children, just like my children, are studying from home and like in my company 90% of people work from home so it's just the techies who have to you know go into the fields or to the office to keep everything running and this means that oh, without the digital technologies you cannot stay connected to people who matter to you and you cannot order things that you need and so on Unfortunately, banks and telecoms have traditionally been the laggards in terms of NPS. Well, people often complain about uh, the services of both banks and telecom operators, and they may have a reason to do that. So, we realized we had to reinvent what we did. It's a sort of a dilemma, a business dilemma, a technical dilemma, when you know everybody needs your services. And at the same time, they don't think highly of you. We noticed that uh, some of our subscribers have moved out of uh, cities to their country houses, and now they're consuming much more traffic than before. And their old rate plans weren't really designed for that at all. So this meant risks of bill shocks. Well, because they did consume much more, but they weren't really prepared to pay extra for this extra consumption. And we certainly wanted to avoid such bill shocks. Some customer journeys changed, you know, say customer journeys in terms of uh, being informed about how certain service works. So I realized, and this is how I phrase it, this is how I articulate it for my team, was to avoid creaming it in the short term and instead use this opportunity to reload our relationship with the subscribers. That is, consider 
how we can support our subscribers and how we can support the society with the telecom services it needs. Well, because uh, they are effectively forced to use our services or other telecom provider services now in times of lockdown, but they will churn if we underserve them. So we decided to introduce a system we called forgiveness by design. You know, one of our country leaders uh, famously said that the fact that you don't know the law doesn't mean you're not responsible or you're not expected to follow the law. So we, we realize that although we do have our own rules and we love those rules, our subscribers don't have to know them and they do have other and more important things to address. So in case of doubt, do what benefits the subscriber. This is the idea of forgiveness by design. This is how we've been trying to avoid bill shocks for the subscribers. And we also made a number of business solutions which hopefully will create substantial lifetime value not just for us as a business, but a lifetime value for the client. And this has been the paradigm out of which, so to speak, we acted. Next slide, please. So we realized how important it was for us to start collecting more feedback you know, you cannot really find a way to make somebody else happy, but you need to listen to those people and to learn how they want to be happy. So we've stepped up our feedback collection activities. We're using social media. We're doing text analytics. We're doing uh, STT and uh, uh, voice recognition and bots. You know, there are hundreds of thousands of uh, calls per month made by bots and only two percent of our uh, subscribers actually twig it that is they understand they are talking to a bot not a real person this has become a day-to-day -day technology and it helps us collect better data and therefore make more reliable decisions going forward for marketing purposes among others these are very sensitive times uh, the times uh, when we are all prone to stress so we need to step up our marketing activities and at the same time we need to minimize the distraction for the subscribers and we are trying to minimize time to market you know now that we've uh, implemented sprint methodology we're looking at two day long projects next slide there is this dilemma dilemma of optimal proximity you know some clients are concerned of uh, the big brother big data violation of privacy and so on well technologists in a situation like this are certainly a great boon because they do help you save time and so uh, we have implemented some technologies that have uh, gone a long way towards helping our subscribers You know, actually, uh, Dimitri thought that we benefited from this situation. Well, I can assure you that most of our employees are now working longer hours than before. Like yesterday, I had a meeting, a work meeting that ended at 12.30 a.m. However, we are not really complaining because we feel and we are we are assured that we're doing the right thing we're working towards a larger purpose we're doing the right thing so uh, we are inspired you know the current situation has enabled us to make the real transition 
from talking about new technologies to actually implementing them. For example, we've got robots now that imitate the voice of your favorite call center employee. You know, we've launched new services such as contactless delivery, self-registration. We now have really personalized proposals. When eSIMs finally become a reality in Russia, we will see even higher penetration of telecom services. Uh, now we have uh, deployed a so-called magical sales triangle using machine learning tools. Well, for example, we've started using uh, older employees' voices to place outbound calls to senior subscribers, and so on. Previously, we would see peak times at the end of the working day. You know, that was the traffic peak, you know, when people exited their offices where they were using Wi-Fi, we would see peak times. Now, the highest peaks we see around 10 and 11 a.m., you know, when school kids are attending classes, same for students, when their mothers and fathers are working from home. And this effectively means that marketers need to uh, respond to that. They need to change their flighting schedules, quote unquote. You know, their banner ads will work differently if they do that. Like, like I mentioned already, uh, we're using lots of bots now, and we have deployed this fancy technology that makes sure that every time you talk to a robot, you will have the impression that you're always talking to the same person. At least the voice will be the same. We've got our own corporate accelerator and we're actually pulling into our landscape some great solutions from startups in this accelerator. Next slides. As we're thinking about the things we can do, on the more important front, so to speak, we certainly want to support people emotionally. Beeline is such a brand that is very much associated with the vivaciousness and emotional vibrancy. That's why we decided to review even our marketing products and we adapted them to the current context. So the regulator also asked us to do something, for example, to support the tourists who could not, uh, Russian tourists who could not return to Russia because of lockdowns in other countries and in Russia. So for example, we quintupled uh, the uh, number of minutes and megabytes available to those who are still in roaming. And uh, those who are using our um, broadband and uh, TV services, we've also made some fancy uh, gifts even. Russia celebrates V-Day on the 9th of May, and we ran a campaign uh, that actually broke our record in terms of emotional engagement. It was called Mirne Nebo, or Peaceful Skies. And it was a, a very uh, peace-loving campaign because we said, would you like to send in your photo of the peaceful skies? We also have this very popular campaign called Gigs for Steps, where you are effectively getting extra megabytes added to your plan for making a certain number of steps per day, registered by your phone, obviously. So we decided that uh, we had, uh, and we actually did, we, we did drop the 
the threshold from 10,000 steps, which it was previously, to 1,000 steps only. Now, 1,000 steps is obviously not enough, but uh, not everybody lives in giant houses. So people still have to move. And we wanted to support the healthy habits. Uh, because actually moving more helps you deal with your stress, both physically and mentally. Irina Gorbachev, uh, she's one of our celebrity ambassadors. In an interview taken by Yuri Dut, said she was a big fan of uh, Japanese uh, movies. And we asked her to shoot a Japanese style uh, movie of herself staying home. And we should be able to see it now. Two hundred forty five, two hundred forty six. Two hundred fifty. Keep sitting, stay at home. S stay home. I tell you, stay home. Stay home, I said. What about me? What about me? Nine hundred ninety-nine, one thousand. Earn gigs for walking at home. So I just wanted to say that our marketing plan has been completely revamped. None of the things that we plan to do before the start of COVID we did implement, you know, we completely scrapped it instead. We started communicating to our subscribers how they can better work remotely. I think we're quite lucky that uh, when we were looking for opportunities to develop communications for this product, we learned that uh, one of the actors, you know, who was uh, involved in uh, this clip, hold up in a in a country house together with uh, several other technicians. So we were able to produce more content with their help, even remotely. So I do believe that this is great time for change both for corporations and for individuals. This is time to review the kind of values your brand stands for. And I believe that uh, people who weren't too much online, and referring to say 45 plus people, you know, they, until recently in Russia, they were not really active users, say of uh, delivery services. Well, their life has changed considerably. We decided at Beeline that we are a long-term brand and it's much more important for us to invest in uh, our relationship with our subscribers to support them in those times of change, as opposed to maximizing a profit. Well, thank you very much, Irina. This has been a very interesting and a very honest presentation. I really love this idea that supporting your subscribers is much more important than maximizing your profit. Well, if financial KPIs don't matter to you, what are the key KPIs for you? Well, financial KPIs have not been totally abolished. I'm sorry, we are still a business. 
However, the time horizon for these KPIs is longer now. And NPS has become even more important than before. We now have the approval of the board and the CEO that NPS will be one of the key indicators for the whole company. So this has been uh, implemented already and uh, we can always check current NPS. Every employee can do that. We actually see pretty significant correlation between NPS and churn. Like, you know, we see that whenever we do the right things, churn goes down. So this is what makes sense and it makes business sense as well. I think we've uh, pretty well translated to the language of KPIs. Thank you very much. You know, the clip that you showed, but gigs for steps, does it really mean that everything you're going to do will be done like this? That uh, you are going to shoot your communications in a single country house of, uh, of an ambassador of yours? Or is it just uh, a rare occurrence? Well, some clips for sure will be shot like this as long as the lockdown persists. Well, we recently introduced our new hero, our robot. And actually shooting a robot is pretty easy. So by summer, there will be more air time for the robot and he will strengthen our agenda as a digital company. I see that people uh, are still registering on TimePad, which is great. By the way, if you joined uh, the uh, the webcast, but you haven't registered for the event yet, please don't forget to register, particularly if you want to get access to those great slide decks we've already seen, including Irina's presentation. Before we let Irina go, I've got one important announcement to make. That's why we have Yekaterina Son connected. And Yekaterina Son obviously is the CEO of FU Russia. Yekaterina's mic is off. Yekaterina's mic is off. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me now? Perfect. Hello, dear friends. Thank you very much for being with us today. I just wanted to share a brief but a very nice bit of news. I'm really happy that I get this opportunity right after Irina's presentation. Uh, you probably know that EFI is so much more than a competition. We actually do a lot in terms of education and research. And with this research, you know, we're looking at the advertising market, we are analyzing its evolution, we are trying to identify the key drivers of marketing and communication campaigns effectiveness. And technology has obviously played a very important role in it. That's why we and AFI decided it was time for us, perfect time, I'd say, to launch a new project called FE Tech. And FE Tech is designed to help Russian companies, or rather companies working in Russia, to wrap their minds around the challenges of marketing tech, of MarTech. Next slide, please. This project consists of four parts. Well, first, we'll conduct research into Russian operations. Next, we'll compare Russia to the rest of the world in order to see where we stand, really. Like, in what respects is uh, Russia in line with the rest of the world and what makes it special? 
also would love to showcase the best cases from Russia and other countries. There will be different platforms for that. The most important one being the forum, which will be held on the 18th of February, 2021. We'll also study in detail the projects that you may submit to our competition to identify the key technologies. We are happy that Beeline, the tech company, is supporting us so much in this project. I will really appreciate if Irina says a little bit about the project and how she sees it. Yeah, that's absolutely right. We are launching this project. I actually have the sign here. Yeah, I'm uh, here quoting a very well-known Soviet poem. We never doubted who should be our partner for a project like this. I think it's a marriage in, you know, made in heaven. It's a great combination of uh, the two leading companies in their industries. I think uh, Effie has already created a best-in-class community and platform for marketers in this country, as well as other countries. We would certainly want to broaden our knowledge and our expertise in this field. Uh, that's why we decided to support it. We're going to be engaged in research as well. And uh, this is a great opportunity for us to ask questions and learn answers, maybe even come up with answers and identify the right trends, uh, the right indicators, and uh, possibly blaze the trail for marketing tomorrow. Well, in fact, what will be marketing tomorrow is already being discussed today in more meanings than one, I guess. Well, many companies are now reviewing their DNAs, their distribution, their marketing strategies. I believe that the launch of FE Tech is a great initiative, particularly in those times. And I believe that uh, thanks to this joint effort and uh, thanks to so many brands and experts we're going to invite to this platform, we will help the whole industry move forward and become even more effective. So we shall be extremely happy to see all of you there. Thank you very much, Kata. Thank you very much, Irina. Obviously, we are going to invite all those who register for the event to FE Tech, and we have a short break now, about five minutes long. In five minutes, we shall have uh, Dragarad moderating the next session with Lisa Hogg, who is going to tell us about a responsible marketing, uh, social responsible marketing. And the speaker from Google will tell us about what this corporation did in Russia and elsewhere over the last three months. See you in several minutes.
Hello, Lisa. I just wanted to warn you about two things. One is that slide control is verbal. That you need to say next slide in order for the operators to flick him. And the second one is um, simply an invitation to check that you are tuned into the English channel. Yes, I am. Great. Thank you very much. No problem. Hello, everybody. Hello again. We are continuing the session, and the next speaker is uh, Elisa Hoke, who is a, a strategy consultant with a brave sustainability strategy and storytelling. And she's going to broach the subject of uh, sustainable marketing in our turbulent VUCA times. So, hello, Lisa. Hi, thank you very much for inviting me to this conference. It's the first time I'm presenting something like this as a keynote point of view online. So bear with me. I hope it still comes across well. Um, so, as you said, I am the founder of Brave Amsterdam, which is a company that focuses on helping brands embed sustainability into their businesses. Until very recently, I was the senior director for marketing and giving for Tom's EMEA. And Tom's Shoes is the original one-for-one -one company that started in 2006 and um, was based on the principle of using business for good. Um, and it's my experience there has made me incredibly passionate about how we can responsibly act um, as brands, but then um, also um, how do we market it? So in the next slide, um, I think it just um, is about we all need to be more responsible. So in these times, um, and especially now um, in these months of pandemic lockdown, um, both people and brands have had to act more responsibly than ever before. Um, and this comes through in obviously your, your business culture, um, in how you deliver your products, but then also how you communicate with consumers. Um, next slide, please. So, um, as was mentioned in the summary of what I'm going to talk about, um, for quite a few years now, we have lived in a VUCA world. So, a world that is volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous. And these last few months has only magnified um, this experience in the terms of it, it's really uncertain. Um, brands who have focused on being more responsible in the last years have gained more consumers based on the fact that governments um, and bigger organizations have created a lot of insecurity in consumers. So a lot of consumers have started to look to brands to actually fill that gap. Um, but obviously, um, as marketing professionals, we know that um, at times of revenue crunch, um, our budgets also um, become quite a lot more challenging. Um, and so we are in this volatile world, we are expected to be more creative um, with less, which is entirely possible. Um, I can say my, my budget at Tom's, um, because of the business model was quite challenging from a marketing point of view, but we still managed to get a lot done because of the authenticity um, of the story. Next slide, please. So um, I, I ask myself this on a lot of days, what is normal usually, um, but then also what is new normal? So we, um, as you'll see on the next slide, we are being bombarded by um, so many messages um, from all sorts of news sources on 
um, we can't go back to normal. Um, what is the new normal? Um, brands that don't adapt to the new normal won't survive. And I think even though there feels like there's a lot of pressure on how we respond to this, I think what we need to see is this is a perfect time to pivot and actually make changes that normally brands would be a bit more nervous um, to take, especially when you look at um, terms of becoming more sustainable. Um, I can attest to the fact that um, when you do become a more sustainable brand, whether it's on social impact or environmental impact, um, the criticism is, um, is there for sure. Um, do nothing and you don't get a lot of criticism, do good and you get a whole lot. Um, but I think this is a time where we can all really take advantage um, of this crisis um, that actually creates really positive opportunity for us to make um, some very important changes. Next slide, please. So as, if, I mean, from what I understand, most people in this conference are marketing professionals. Um, we've all seen the research coming out over the last years of the, rely, the rise of the belief-driven buyer. So these consumers who feel their wallet is their vote, that they like to connect with brands that represent their principles, their values, and the things that they care about. And the biggest report, which was published um, so far based on 2018 numbers, showed that um, although in previous years and decades even, products were usually the main reason consumers would connect with brands. Um, in 2018, it actually showed that it was leveling off, that who the brand was um, definitely mattered. Um, and it was almost at an equilibrium. Now, um, I would be very curious to see if we had to look at those numbers at this point in time in 2020, I'd imagine that what the brand stands for, um, and you've heard some really ex interesting examples already today, um, brands deliver a service, but then they're also delivering incredible amounts of personal value during a time of crisis. Um, and I think that's very important. Um, and as marketeers, we have to realize this is not a rising consumer group. This is the consumer group. I think um, everybody is more concerned about what's happening in the world um, in a sliding scale. But we know that the age groups of this consumer have dramatically expanded. The income levels of this group um, have massively expanded because um, in the early days of the belief driven buyer, um, there was um, more a younger affluent consumer and we definitely seen that it's very different. So we have to think about how we want to communicate um, to them. Next slide, please. So two big themes um, that have come up um, over the years and these can be both really big um, topics or you can actually boil them down to, to smaller. So I'll start off with local um, and I'll actually use an example from my experience at Tom's on how um, when we were making decisions on how to invest against social impact and social, social sustainability projects that the old way um, for Tom's of working would be to bring the money together and then um, invest in nonprofits that were predominantly in South America, India, and then some in the US. But as Business for Purpose became um, more well known, um, it wasn't as unique anymore. Um, there was definitely a, a drop in relevance on, on how this was connecting to, um, say, consumers in um, my region, which is Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Um, so we did some research. And we realize that people do care, but what they're caring about more at this point is what is happening locally. Um, what is happening in my own backyard that I'm really concerned about. And I would like my purchases to actually be influencing positive impact um, in, in my home country. So um, as Tom's, we took um, budgets and put it to four of the, the main markets um, in Europe, which was the UK, France, the Netherlands, and Germany. And we did extensive consumer research on 
what does a better tomorrow look like for those consumers? And um, to make sure that as a brand, we weren't making decisions for them, that we were making decisions based on um, real consumer insights from a qualitative point of view. And um, it, it varied. Um, there are some themes that can, can go across, but what's great about that is then it um, allowed us to find ways of investing, but then the wonderful thing is also finding ways to tell really impactful stories that were local. Um, what we did find is that um, the UK story did resonate in France and Germany as an example. So even though it wasn't hyper-local to those other countries, it was still closer to home um, than say something in, in South America would felt a little bit um, harder to connect with because I think these are the things that are important around this kind of um, communication um, and having sustainability in your business is that it, it needs to connect with the heartstrings and, and be understandable. The other topic of local, which I find quite interesting at this point is as we've all been limited to our local neighborhoods, I think there's um, an even higher appreciation of what benefits local can bring. So I think it's gonna be interesting to see how we as brands are able to adapt global brands to be very local. We've been working with hyper-local constructs for quite some time, um, but it'll be interesting to see how we take that forward. And then from a better point of view, this is not only better from an environmental point of view, um, it's just how business cultures um, can adapt to be better both internally and externally. So it definitely means on how you produce your product, products and get out there, but then um, it should really touch on all aspects of your business. Next slide, please. And the most important thing to consider, um, there's, um, I'm originally South African, even though I live in the Netherlands, um, there's an African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And collective impact is a theme that has come up within the last year or two um, increasingly because we need to come together. So as brands, and if we look at social media, it's so important to create community. Um, how can we connect with each other um, as big organizations to create more um, collective impact on bigger um, issues that are out there. An example, albeit from the UK, um, but it's the strongest one I know from a, a nonprofit point of view, homelessness is a huge issue in the UK. There are many homeless organizations that do amazing work, but they're not seeing the impact. So they've actually created a coalition, which is quite different. Um, nonprofits can be quite competitive, um, especially because of funding, uh, but now they're all coming together. So definitely focusing on we versus me mentality is going to be very important going forward. Next slide, please. So often when I speak at conferences, especially when I was a representative for Tom's, um, many people would come up to me and say, but it's very easy for Tom's to talk about social sustainability and being a responsible brand when it's how you actually started. It's been the genesis of your company. Um, I would really say that it is feasible um, and every meaningful journey takes one step um, just to get started. Um, so what I can advise is when you're looking, especially when we look at responsible marketing, um, I'm quite passionate about the point that it can't be superficial. Um, it has to have impacts behind it. There are many examples out there where um, it talks about um, sustainability, but then if you actually look um, under the hood of the car, as you'd say in English, um, that there actually isn't real authenticity to being sustainable. Um, but there are many steps if you want to take a big step or even smaller steps um, to get there. The first one would be to know who you are as a brand. So what, what do you deliver? What is your most unique quality? Um, and, and what are the things that you care about? Um, and then trying to align that to purpose. So what is a cause that you care about, whether it be in a social or an environmental space? Um, and then once you've done that, the sweet spot is obviously in the middle where you bring all of that together 
Um, and this is where I would encourage you to connect with nonprofits who work in the space that you're interested in, because as um, business professionals or marketing professionals, we sometimes think we know what's helpful um, and it's truly not helpful. So I would encourage you to um, connect with people that work in that space um, and get their advice on, on how to focus. Next slide. Oh, may I have the next slide, please? So there are three things. There's one, um, how you communicate, how you behave and walk the walk, and then how you spend your money. Um, so on the next slide, um, a few examples on how you um, communicate. Um, could you go to the next slide, please? Thanks. Um, so I've been in the footwear business for quite some time now. Um, so I'm using those kind of examples. Communicating, and I've used examples from um, now within the crisis, I think it's important. Um, use Tom's because I know them very well. So they, for every two euros um, or dollars they make, they give one away. And since April, they have started um, focusing that on COVID-19 um, investments, um, which are to nonprofits that they have relationships with and focused on, on creating positive impact. Um, Crocs, as an example, they know that a lot of nurses and health professionals actually do use their shoes. So they've actually made shoes available um, and um, that's something that brings value, but then also goes to um, actually a key consumer group that they have already. And then Nike have gotten involved um, in various ways. Um, and I think it's very important when you do these things to make sure that the tone is correct um, and that you're not trying to gain too much support um, at a crisis time. Um, but it's really good, great examples of how to communicate. And then if we go to the next slide, this is less about um, marketing and actually more about um, HR. But I actually think it's really important um, when you do want to be responsible, it cannot only be to um, consumers, it has to be or should start with your employees. Um, and the example of Airbnb at this unfortunate time of having to lay off a significant amount of their global workforce have been benchmarked in how they've openly communicated um, about it and then how they've even created an online talent portal um, so you can find um, the great people that have worked for them um, and w which regions they're in, et cetera. Um, and I just thought it was a great example to look at because this does matter, even from a marketing point of view, it absolutely matters. This is, it could, if you're looking at it from a, a very straightforward way, it's corporate comms, um, but showing how that kind of care goes through to the heart of the brand and into the DNA um, is very important. And then the last slide is um, more practical. Um, and but I think this for me is one of the more exciting spaces because not all the companies we can work for um, will jump into being a sustainable brand straight away. Um, and it is definitely a journey, um, a very possible uh, and not as complex journey as people think, but um, there are some great options out there um, that you can actually use based on the fact that they exist and they do good. So they are businesses for good. And the first example I have um, is Goodloop. It's a UK based um, media buying company. Um, they are whitelisted media buying and I had phenomenal results with them, um, with media buys that I did at my time at Tom's. They give you the option of actually creating impact with your media spend um, by way of identifying nonprofits with you and then allowing your consumer to choose um, once they've looked at your content. Um, and the view through rates um, were really incredible in um, how people connected with it. Um, so even if your business isn't um, in a sustainable place, um, your media spend could actually start creating positive impact. And then um, another example is Ticket Pass, which is an ethical um, ticketing company. So there are a lot of ticketing companies online. Um, I'm sure you know that it's probably not the 
it's not the most transparent industry out there. So Ticket Pass is actually aiming at creating a very transparent ticketing um, option um, for either free or paid events. Um, but it's also a one for one. They give 50% of their profits to nonprofits. So even if you're um, concerned about it being quite difficult to put sustainability into your brand and how you talk about it from a marketing point of view, um, these are two great options that are pretty much plug and play and still do exactly what all of the, the other um, competitors do. And then the next slide. Next slide, please. <laughs> um, so I think in my experience, especially from from a brand and marketing point of view, when you have responsible stories um, and they go deep, um, they are a great way to talk about your brand um, and to create consumer love. And we know consumer love, um, the consideration cycle is significantly shorter. So thank you for listening to me today. Um, and the last word would be, let's just all be brave. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Lisa. You're welcome. <laughs> well, thank you very much for uh, such uh, a straightforward, open talk. I have one question for you. Okay. And I, I hope that it could be of interest to other people as well. So when we talk about corporations, that are closely held by a small bunch of shareholders. And if the shareholders are aligned in their views of the markets and the society, usually it works like almost like a charm, right? And in order to avoid those empty or a fake responsible quote-unquote campaigns that have nothing under the hood well let me put it differently usually these things happen to the large corporations which are not closely held right mm -hmm. and many cases they're explained not because not by the evil doing of a particular person but rather by lack of clear principles mm -hmm. that would crystallize the company it's just because there is not a single decision maker or decision making body that would drive the company. This is so prevalent among the public companies. Do you have any piece of advice for the mid-level managers of such corporations who may be running a particular brand? So how should they go about it? Thank you. Yeah, I think this, I mean, these are the exact people that I'm, you know, often talking to um, when I've had the, the privilege of, of talking at conferences like this, because there is an appetite to do it, but then there is the, the fear of how the hell do I sell this in? <laughs> so I think the, um, you do actually have to, even this, it's such a hot space, to be honest. Um, it needs to be broken down in a real business case. And I think often um, what has happened is that um, it does come across, uh, if you look at the C-suites, um, often in some companies, especially big companies, they'll, they'll see these ideas as quite um, fluffy. Um, I wish I knew the Russian word for that, but um, the translator will take care of that. Um, so I think you have to build a really solid business case. And there is enough data out there um, now to really support the fact that the brands that don't have a really authentic um, place um, in this, especially if they come to life with a campaign, um, they will lose um, a lot of people. And when I say lose, it's not necessarily the fans they already have, it's the fans that they'll, they'll never get. Um, but you need to bring it down into what the core business aspect is of the company. Um, and you do need to connect it to revenue. And I think that's where Tom's did it differently. They're still for-profit business. Um, being conf confident that you're a for-profit business, but you are aiming to do good with your business is not a bad thing. Where I think that before there's been a lot of nervousness around, well, we're a for-profit business. We, we can't also create um, positive impact. 
Um, but I think you do need to have really great qualitative insights into identifying who's the consumer group. Um, and unfortunately, um, money does still talk. So identifying what is the opportunity, what is the growth points. And I think one of the biggest challenges we have on this point is short termism. Um, the, some of this planning, there are short term benefits, but actually it's future proofing your business. Um, and I think you need to be able to find the language that you know will tap into um, what these stakeholders um, have to align on. And then what is really imperative um, is making sure that you have really strong agreement on these points um, because and, and commitment to what the milestones are um, and what the KPIs, KPIs we've spoken about before. KPIs are also really important, even from an impact point of view. Um, with the projects I worked on at Tom's, um, we didn't just give nonprofit money and you know nonprofit organisations money and walk away. We had very specific um, projects we worked um, on with them that had specific impacts. You can also then bring that back to the C-suite level and show the impact the company's made, um, and it has benefits to communicate both externally and internally. So, um, hope that answers your question. <laughs> Us. Thank you very much, ma'am. You're very welcome. Have a nice day. With uh, your permission, I'd like to transition now to the next subject. Yekaterina Son will now remind us about the 17 SDGs and uh, the event to be held later this year. Hello again. Thank you very much, Dragorod, again. I hope you can both see me and hear me. See, I'm barging in again. And uh, I'm here to remind you about other projects Effie has. In fact, we've got a number of longstanding strong initiatives in a number of areas. One of them is FE Russia supporting SDGs. Obviously, I'm speaking right now right after Lisa for the same reason. It is very much connected to what Lisa said. Well, I do hope you remember what sustainable development goals are and why many businesses have already declared their support. But we have been tracking the effectiveness of this activity since, well, at least for quite some time, because even in 2014, we're able to show that the companies that engaged in purposeful marketing were more likely to be more successful and to win the much coveted FE figurines or statutes. So back in 2018, we launched this global initiative in Russia and our first partner was MTS and MTS remains our strategic partner. However, just like Lisa said, if you wanna go far, walk together. And we are happy that we're not alone. And we are joined by great companies and great brands and PepsiCo, McDonald's, Pitorichka, and KPMG are all supporting us in this respect. And actually, KPMG is helping us with research into the manifestation of sustainable development values, if you like, in Russia. What works, what doesn't, how it can be made better. Next slide, please. So what you see here is the structure of the project. You will notice that together with KPMG, we're collecting data, analyzing it in order to share it with the market. So please join us in November 2020 to, uh, please join us in our third international forum called Purposeful Brands who will be chosen by the consumer tomorrow. And we'll try to answer this question from a totally new position. Oh, well, I guess November will be different from May, but still it will be very different from what we had last year. 
So we also have FE Russia positive change competition, where pretty much any company can apply as long as they have a project designed to change consumer behavior or address some social ill or illness. Actually, the number of such projects has been growing. And I guess we are looking at a veritable boom this time. Well, actually, uh, this particular competition includes uh, quite a lot of contestants from 2019. I guess 2020 will see even more. I'm very grateful to Lisa for her great and very interesting presentation. We shall be happy to see you all in our forum in November. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. So let's go back now to our panel. And I think that the next speaker is very well positioned to continue the discussion. So Maria Mraz, the head of large customer sales at Google. Hello, Maria. Well, let's just jump straight into your presentation uh, without further ado. It's interesting to learn what one of the largest tech giants is doing. Well, after all, this session is about helping businesses be more effective and more socially responsible. So the floor is yours. Hello, dear colleagues. Hello, dear friends. Hello, Dmitri. Hello, Dragorot. Name is Maria Morozova. I'm head of sales at Google. And like many people here today, I'm going to address a subject that was non-existent three months ago. I will be talking about Google's response to COVID-19. Well, I was put on the technology section, but actually I think this is a CSR presentation. You know, the technology, the resources, the scale of Google enable us to run initiatives both globally and locally. Since the outbreak of COVID-19, uh, we've launched over 200 new products and allocated over $1 billion in uh, resources to help our users, clients, and partners. The next slide should show how all our efforts can be clustered into the following three areas. First, we are trying to inform people, that is, uh, provide them with access to trusted and credible information which is quite difficult in times of force majeure. Next area is support, and last one is recover. I don't even say rejuvenation of the economy. So all these activities were developed in this environment of force majeure. On the 15th of March, all our employees start working from home. However, the most important principle for the assessment of uh, uh, these activities was the, their mission fit. We are also considering all our activities through, uh, through the lens of helpfulness. And this actually is uh, the, well, the key lens we're using. Provision of information something that is, I guess, closest to our uh, daily business. Well, the next slide will show how we changed our search results. Well, back in January, it was clear that coronavirus would be important. So since January, we have been working very closely with the WHO locally, and globally to make sure that reliable up-to-date information was easily available to the searchers. So whenever you start searching information on the coronavirus, you will see lots of data, verified data from WHO. On the 31st of January, we launched the so-called SOS alerts. In Google search, 
and on YouTube in order to provide reliable information and recommendations. And this, the core of our communication is uh, shown in the screen now, stay home, save lives. It actually lists five simple steps you can take. I'm sorry, it contains uh, like five uh, information elements, like bytes of information that's, that are of importance and of interest to people wherever they are, about how to stay safe, for example, how to wash hands and so on. In order to help in propagation of uh, reliable information, Google uh, has extended 250 million in advertising grants to help the World Health Organization and other related bodies promote reliable information. Next slide, please. We've also created a mini site called uh, Google Come COVID-19 in order to systematize and amalgamate all information sources in the same or on the same platform. So here you can find the local information about authorized organizations and also key information about the virus, its symptoms and so on. So it's effectively an info hub on COVID-19. It also contains a selection of uh, useful resources from Google. There is, for example, a link to a YouTube channel uh, called uh, Stay Home Together and so on. But 20 different teams of uh, Google are working on this project. And by the way, we've slightly changed it. It is uh, using larger phones for seniors. Can you actually see my slide properly? Because it's not properly displayed where I am. Oh, great. So we can move on to the next slide. Let's uh, discuss how we are supporting people in times of crisis. Naturally, the pandemic has changed our lives very quickly personal and professional lives. And Google has done a lot in order to help businesses parents, teachers, pretty much everybody in order to, in order for them to adapt to those challenging times. The next slide should show how we are supporting businesses of all sizes. I think that the pandemic made it crystal clear that uh, digital transformation is of critical importance. Here we are showing the most relevant trends and articles from leading marketers and even recommendations on how to run digital events. Now, I think that Dmitry and Dragorod read this particular article as they prepared for this video, oh, for sure, for sure. The next slide. That should detail things we're doing for SMEs. Well, besides advertising grants, which I'm going to detail later, we also have a portal with recommendations on remote work, how you can better communicate with your employees and your clients. So this is a link you can follow. As regards our products, there is a Google Meet. Well, actually our G Suite uh, users uh, have uh, recently been given expanded access to functionality of Google Meet, and we've also adapted our products so that heads of SMEs could quickly update, uh, you know, their tools or even the descriptions of their companies about the working hours. Well, we we have a long-standing project called Business Class we're running together with Bearbank. As part of this project. We launched, um, in seven days, we launched our first uh, kind of season about uh, maintaining and uh, protecting your business in those challenging times. And we launched new academy with Bearbank. Bank. 
Online education is uh, naturally important to us. Starting from March, 90% of all schools, colleges, and universities around the world had to close. So we created a portal called Teach From Home. It's a hub where teachers can find advice, trainings, products they may need in order to uh, better you know, uh, streamline their processes. And you know, many schools have already connected 100 million students and teachers around the world are already using Google Classroom. But half of them joined the service since end of March. We also launched a portal called Learn From Home. It's uh, primarily designed for parents who need to, you know, help their children learn languages, mathematics, coding, and so on. Naturally, People are turning to YouTube for entertainment, particularly in times of uh, lockdown. So we ran this campaign called Stay Home Together, and it was a global campaign. We produced over, uh, okay, dozens, uh, like over 100 uh, videos, 700 local creators involved, and uh, the Russian video is very popular. The channel itself already has over 1 million subscribers, you know, music, series, what have you. I also want to stress some of our special local flavored projects in Russia, including live casts from the Bolshoi Theater, which I hope you heard about and even better watched. Well, uh, these broadcasts scored over 8 million views in Russia and abroad, and uh, over 160 publications mentioned them. Also, we had a special project dedicated to the 12th of April, the Space Exploration Day. This is the last section, which deals with uh, the most important subject, that of recovery. Well, we do realize that millions of people are doing the impossible around the world in order to help the world recover faster from the pandemic. Google and other Alphabet companies are contributing their efforts and their money to help this effort. I think you may have read that uh, Google and Apple on the 10th of April announced they were co-developing, in fact, a contact tracing application that should help contain the spread of the virus. Safety and confidentiality are obviously the cornerstones of the system, so anonymity, security, and privacy are all guaranteed. Now, if you're interested, you can read more about uh, this uh, the project in our blog, it uh, details how people will be informed and what kind of information will be collected and shared and so on. It's uh, an easy to read, a very interesting article. Let me say a few more words about our global initiatives and what other Alphabet companies did. Take uh, Verily, for example. You know, they are now doing free of charge testing for COVID. It's a major initiative in the United States. Over uh, several hundred thousand people have already been tested. DeepMind, which specializes in uh, AI and machine learning, is uh, doing research into the structure of the virus, which is a very important step towards finding the vaccine. That's not the slide we need it. One more, please. Like many other organizations that are trying to help, Google is lending its expertise even to such areas as production of PPEs. Uh, we must be experiencing some, experiencing some technical difficulties. 
Well, the pictures don't matter that much in any case, so let me just give you the story. Like many organizations in the world, Google offered its expertise in terms of manufacturing of PPE and medical equipment. Verily, Google and X have got lots of employees who have uh, expertise in medical engineering. So they're now working hand in hand with the manufacturers and developers of medical equipment. Well, for some reason, the slides don't click. You know what? I can just deliver the rest of my presentation without the slides, no problem. I want to conclude by telling you about our global initiative designed at supporting SMEs. Like we all know that SMEs are a major contributor to the GDP of many countries. Unfortunately, this was not recognized in some countries. Now, when small businesses are struggling, uh, Google has allocated $200 million and $340 million grants to SMEs. Well, the grant for Russia is $10.5 million available, and uh, uh, this money uh, will be available as ad money, effectively. Now we can actually go straight to the end of my presentation. I'm nearly done. There is one important slide there that sums up all Google's investments in terms of the pandemic. That's slide 20. The problem is I don't have the clicker. Okay, but here it is. So. These are total investments by Google, and I haven't had the time to detail all of them. I only mentioned the key ones. I The key ones, at least for Russia. And we really believe at Google that our objective is to inspire, inform, and empower. The last slide should show that this is not the end. A lot has been done, and there are still more things to do. You know, new products, new initiatives, new programs. Wow, that's great. It's quite exhaustive. Thank you very much. You, you know, whenever we talk about uh, large corporations that we associate with the internet, you know, like Google, there are usually two questions. One, is uh, whether you whether you enjoy working remotely or not. Well, because uh, there is this uh, widespread assumption that people in tech companies have long been working remotely. And yes, we do understand the internet is growing. So the second uh, question, is uh, about the actual growth you're seeing in your business. As regards remote work, it's been quite unusual to us. I guess uh, some of our viewers today know that, uh, I'm sorry, some of our viewers have been to Google offices. And you probably know that Google has actually made substantial effort to turn Google offices into ideal workplaces. So I can assure you that most offices Google has are much more comfortable than homes in terms of work. And people often say that their biggest challenge when working from home is how do they stop working? Now, it could be comfortable for some people to work from home. It could be otherwise for other people. We had several internal initiatives. Uh, we had trainings. 
on how to efficiently work from home, on how to conduct uh, meetings. Google has always been a big supporter of face-to-face -face meetings. We had trainings on how to uh, maintain high performance, how to manage your calendar so that you actually have time to work, not just talk. So we're trying to find some equilibrium here. You probably know that Google has uh, this so-called system of uh, OKRs, objectives and key results. And this is our reference uh, point of, uh, this is our point of reference, that's right. It helps people structure what they do from home or from the office. I can assure you it has been quite stressful for us. So we don't really have a habit of working from home. I think we have been able to overcome some of the difficulties. And as regards to your second question, dealing with advertising, what can I tell you? Google is making money through advertising. And naturally, Google doesn't have any immunity or antidote to whatever is happening in the world. So obviously, those things are impacting our advertising revenue. And the impact is substantial. Naturally, different industries have been hit to different degrees. You know, some industries have uh, ground to a halt, like air travel and tourism. They're almost dead, and they will take longer to recover. But other businesses, such as the gaming industry, for example, have obviously benefited from the crisis. And pharma companies uh, may also be lifted by the crisis. So structural changes are afoot. We've uh, long been working on digital transformation and digital maturity of our uh, clientele. You know, the pandemic has actually shown, you know, who was and who wasn't serious about it. And I think that uh, COVID has clearly shown that uh, those who've uh, made bigger strides towards digital transformation are better prepared. I think COVID has shown clearly that digital transformation is the way to go. Yes, uh, a manager I know from a retail company recently told me our innovation pipeline for three years, we had to deploy in three weeks. And he says, you know, the funniest thing is that we actually managed to do it. Wow, lucky them. I think that what we're seeing now is that, you know, just like in Alice in Wonderland, we have to run real fast to stay where we are. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for the information you have provided. Now we shall have a short pause now. And uh, in about, I don't know, three, five minutes, I guess, we shall start the next session that will be moderated by Dmitri. Hugs. Take care.
very small break. And um, I hope that you had time to have a snack or you're doing it in parallel with our brain food. Our next block is about consumers, is about global trends in consumers' behavior and uh, how they manifest themselves in the last months and uh, what we see around the world and Russia. Ipsos um, had a very thorough analysis of previous crises and today we have two charming speakers and you can ask your questions in the chat uh, while we hear the presentation. And uh, we have Yekaterina Riseva from Ipsos Russia uh, and uh, Marina, sorry, I missed the name. Marina Bizoglu and Yekaterina Riseva. Hello, Dmitry. Hello, dear friends. I'm really glad that I have this opportunity to join the F event. To me, F events have always been about this vibes of a, a festive event and a great networking opportunity. That's why I decided to dress up despite it being an online event. You know, it was actually a paradigm shift for me. You know, I don't get an opportunity to dress up too much these days. And then I realized that it's actually a great opportunity to restore my life back to normal. Actually, this will be the subject of our discussion today. We will talk about the changes in consumer behavior. Together with Yekaterina Riseva, I will talk about the transition from pandemic to contactless economy, I think you already understand what we are going to talk about. Naturally, we all live in this uh, new reality where social distancing, hygienic anxiety, constraint mobility and closures of public spaces have already created quite a lot of issues in our daily lives and this has resulted in a dramatic change in how we live so many people are wondering if these changes are here to stay or not again we realize that many of these limitations may only be lifted after the epidemiologic situation improves and it's still pretty difficult to predict when and where the next outbreaks will happen and um, how long will it take the world to battle the pandemic down? In any case, we'll realize that this combat will be protracted. Many people say that it will only be over through herd immunity, through vaccination, or through natural processes. And herd immunity starts at over 60%, which means that, you know, in all probability, we will. Uh, have to learn to live with those limitations for at least a year, maybe two. So this is how we should address the situation. In the first part of the presentation, I will talk primarily about the link between the crisis and the values and the way they are manifested in present day behavior. And Yekaterina in the second part of the presentation will dwell on uh, what makes you know this particular crisis so special and peculiar according to ipsos theory of change we believe that uh, global trends are not really impacted by uh, you know even global but time limited shocks covid 19 is a global shock however we don't think it's going to revert any of the major trends. You know, we have been seeing like new behavior models and certain trends have been very much amplified recently. And we're also gathering information. We're already sensing weak signals of new trends. That's why we decided to review our last year's research called 12 Global Trends. Shown in the screen are the 12 global trends we identified last year. You will be surprised to hear that all of them persist. You know, they may have uh, slightly changed, but they're still relevant. And in my presentation today, I will detail six out of 12. 
Well, the first trend is about environmentally conscious uh, behavior. It has been growing all over the world. It has been growing in Russia over the recent years. In April 2020, Ipsos Earth Day shows Ipsos Earth Day research showed that 71% people polled in the world and 67% of our respondents in Russia claimed that climate change was as important a crisis as COVID-19. So the COVID crisis has not really obscured the severity of the other crisis. This realization that destruction of the ecosystem, the environmental imbalances created by humans may have easily brought this pandemic about. That's what people believe. Moreover, people have noticed that the quarantine can actually be environmentally friendly. You know, people are saying that nature is cleansing itself finally in times of the lockdown. There have been lots of memes about it. Some of them very funny. But hopefully, the takeaway for many people will be that they don't really have to pollute the environment so much, they can reduce their carbon footprint. Naturally, it's very important to communicate this link between uh, the environment and uh, the pandemic, the idea that this is a very fragile planet. The next trend is health and wellness. Well, it has been pretty strong and it became even stronger. Well, many people, according to our previous year research, claim that health is the most important value and the most important asset. Nobody now says they just want to have a successful career, fuck their health. No. Forgive my French. Many people now claim that uh, Proper, you know, healthy lifestyle is a way of adding another layer of protection against the COVID-19. So they say in order to boost immunity, we need to change our lifestyles. Just taking vitamin C won't be enough. According to our local research, and actually we've been running this uh, ADAC I'm sorry, adapt a research weekly starting from April. 71% wash their hands more often. 70% wear masks. 56% avoid handshakes. 56% use uh, plastic cards. And 63% even avoid social contacts. Biological safety has become an important trend. And it's a springboard for the contactless economy. Well, Yandex is now getting serious about uh, self-driving cars. And Amazon with a, and like Amazon, like Amazon Go, Moscow has uh, already opened its first uh, salesperson-less store and drone deliveries on the rise. And I guess we're going to see new hygienic standards and an increase in online activities because they are, by definition, safer. So we believe that biological safety in the near future will remain a very important principle, guiding so many decisions taken by individuals and authorities. Well, lots of governments, not just the Russian government, you know, are imposing limitations in the name of biological safety. We do hope this will also trigger ideation and development of new technologies by businesses. What we also see is that mental health is under threat. Well, mental health has been threatened for quite some time. Actually, last year, WHO officially recognized emotional burnout as a disease. And the epidemic obviously became an important trigger of phobias, fears, anxieties. According to American data, the number of people uh, suffering from some mental issues more than doubled. 
So according to our data, uh, nearly half uh, respondents experience frustration. Almost a half are worried about their health or the health of others. And financial concerns are really prevalent. This means that people in the helping profession, such as psychologists, coaches, crisis consultants, and others, are becoming even more important than before. It's great that the number of platforms where you can get advice, including psychological advice, on the phone or online is growing. Because it's obviously helping people address this serious challenge. Another important trend which was also showcased in our previous research is digital health. Telemedicine is also growing in importance. From what I know, people with light forms of COVID stay home but are consulted by doctors online. And there is this uh, Chinese company called JD Health recently reported the then number of monthly uh, medical sessions, online medical sessions, grew by a factor of 10 and reached 2 million per month. And their CEO said that in normal conditions, such a growth would require five years. And also the pandemic is going to trigger growth in the wearables industry. So I guess that wearables will measure so much more than just blood sugar levels. I guess they should be able to measure the amount of antibodies to a particular virus such as COVID-19. Next trend is authenticity. Well, when we say authenticity, we usually refer to authentic customer experience, a particular experience with a brand. However, the new understanding of authenticity is that a true friend is a, is a friend in need, or a friend in need is a friend indeed. And this is what many customers expect from the brands they used to trust. So there are platforms now like Did They Help, where you can actually enter the name of a company or a celebrity to learn if they actually did anything to support people during the coronavirus pandemic and how they rank against the others. So in times of growing digital surveillance, it's pretty difficult to stay unseen. And if you are serious about support, this should translate into your brand identity and your brand value. The cult of technology. Well, it has been around for decades. Many people pin their hopes on technologies when it comes to extension of average lifespans and general improvement of the quality of life. However, there is a new twist in it. We are seeing an evolution in home-based technologies because many people now realize that their homes are their castles. And they want their homes to be better equipped and they say, well, we need better equipment for our home offices because this home office has become the main office and online entertainment is obviously on the rise. Uh, various uh, gadgets, uh, various home care devices as well. Well, because there are so many things we need to buy off the couch. So I guess AR and VR should also experience rapid growth. Next slide, please. Another important trend is uh, the globalization peak. Well, we have been raving about the importance of globalization for quite some time. And the pandemic has uh, become a very clear signal that we're all on the same boat, that nobody will be able to sit out uh, this crisis even if they have a bunker. You know, we see that both rank and file people and celebrities and members of the royal family, they all can fall prey. No, they well, can at least contract the, the coronavirus. It's interesting that in those times, we are feeling... Uh, more like 
togetherness with the people from other countries, but at the same time, governments are shutting the borders down. That's an interesting dichotomy. I think it will be an interesting challenge for the brands. Like, how can you connect a person to your vivid and rich brand world if uh, you know they are locked down and they don't really know what this uh, vibes of an Istanbul or uh, Roman coffee house are? Last trend I wanted to share deals with this belief in medicine. Our research shows that people around the world trust doctors and scientists above any other category. And whenever people think about eternal life, naturally they think about doctors. And now when they're thinking about uh, great inventions in medicine, they are mostly expecting a COVID-19 vaccine. It is crystal clear now that we depend to such a large extent on the existing healthcare systems. And in fact, many of the limitations will only be lifted when a given region finally gets some spare capacity in the hospitals. So our lives to a large, to a large extent depend on medicine. Obviously in times of pandemic, doctors become real heroes. They inspire artists, Look at this uh, recent work by Banksy. Something he published on Instagram. It's called Game Changer. So, so this boy is uh, playing with a nurse, which is his main doll, and uh, Spider-Man is tossed away into a waste bin. I will not be able to tell you about all the 12 trends, but we do have foresight sessions at Ipsos where we go into more detail. So here I would love to finish by talking about some early signals of the future, which in my opinion can be predictors of new major trends. So my life is me plus the planet. One cannot really build sustainable future for herself without making the whole humankind, the whole planet sustainable. Second signal is around collaboration. It's only together that we can address some global challenges. So collaboration is imperative. I hope everybody recognizes it now. Change in authorities. Well, we've mentioned already that the reputation of doctors and scientists has been lifted even higher. Another important signal is about control over our own limits. Well, under the current conditions, there is so little we can actually control. For many people, the only thing they can control is their psychological state, the way they respond to whatever comes their way. And even that is quite important. You know, if you control your internal state, you get the opportunity to move ahead. It's actually linked to the next signal about flexible expectations. Well, Nassim Taleb has written so many books, Black Swan, Anti-Fragility, and finally, we've been given the shot of uh, adaptation to uncertainty. We have finally learned how to live with flexible expectations. Another one is predictive society. It's an interesting uh, uh, name because what we mean here is a better controlled society because in the name of protecting our safety and health, lots of potentially subversive technologies are being implemented. So it's a worrisome trend. Augmented intelligence is obviously this uh, intersection of human intelligence and AI. And I guess it can play a role in helping us address some of our major challenges. And finally, new socialization. This is uh, the kind of interaction we're all mastering now as we are learning to read emotions off the screen. I think we're getting better at that. 
this is where I would like to hand it over to Yekaterina Riseva, who is going to tell you about what makes this situation special. Yeah. Yekaterina, if we can't hear you, could you please choose Russian channel? in zoom hello can you hear me yeah wonderful thank you very much marina yes indeed all the global trends that exist right now um they slightly changed the way um we see them and they manifest themselves in a slightly different way and i would like to dwell a little bit on the peculiarities of the current crisis could you show the next slide please Throughout many years, starting from 2008, uh, we've been monitoring the economic situation in the country, how consumers see it, and we ask consumers, um, how do you perceive the situation, whether it has changed or not? And we've been in this project for many years, and we've accepted many crises, and we measured reaction to different crises. And it's been a quite a long-lasting project. And we had many different uh, names for it, uh, crisis, anti-crisis, new reality. But actually, um, it all boils down to measuring the reaction to the situation. And so this current crisis started with the safety and medical conditions, but uh, due to all kinds of circumstances, it transformed into economical and financial situation as well. And in April, 2020, we saw the highest level of um, respondents who said that the situation deteriorated and it was even higher than the crisis of 2008 and it was higher than the end of uh, 2014. And uh, that crisis was a uh, short storm and very strong when people were affected and uh, affected by the crisis. In this project and uh, another project as well, the project was mentioned by um, Marina. At, um, we divide people into four seg segments uh, because people differ in their reaction to situations. They differ in their reaction to changes and uh, how they're going to cope and um, recover from this situation is dependent on the segment they belong to. And uh, uh, we actually looked at how worried they were by the crisis and how much they say they try to save. Well, for example, the, there are people who do not uh, uh, save money right now and uh, who keep their expenses at the same level. So we identified six segments. I'm not going to dwell on them, but you see the difference there. Uh, you, you see the different attitude to the situation, the different perception, as well as different reaction. And it is all translated into different patterns of behavior. And of course, it's also important to look how it's going to transform over time in the future for each of these segments. As I already said, uh, the situation uh, was very dynamic and changed very quickly. And we say that uh, the issue of these segments uh, compared to previous crises were more or less the same. And in acute phases, the people hit by the crisis, uh, the number of people hit by the crisis would go up. But in this coronavirus, in this COVID crisis, the situation was changing so quickly that from uh, March to April, we saw so many people hit by the crisis. And uh, the number went up 11% in one month. And people who are in denial, people who believe that the situation is optimi optimistic, uh, this number went down drastically. We're still monitoring the situation and we'll continue to do that. Next slide, please. Apart from um, 
serious economic situation, serious financial situation, and how it affected their spending, people's spending. There are other factors that we need to keep in mind, something that didn't exist in previous crises. First, cri first uh, factor is uh, health factor. People are worried about their health, about their safety, and we understand that uh, uh, the measures taken in other countries and in Russia, uh, they come in stages, and dates are not always exact. Uh, and we understand that the measures and restrictions will be lifted in stages and totally depend on the epidemiological situation in the country. So people leave in anxiety, people leave expecting something to happen. And of course, it uh, not always have very good impact on their psychological health, as was pointed out by Marina. Mental health is an issue right now, and uh, it it is increasingly so because emotional state of, the, of people is not always the best. People are not always stable psychologically. Everyone uh, has hope uh, to get back to previous lifestyles, uh, but uh, uh, people get uh, used to the current situation, so they create their own routines, uh, and we see that the patterns that manifested themselves during the crisis were considered by people quite useful for the future life and uh, they stayed in the life of people when the crisis is over. So we expect patterns and habits developed during this crisis to stay further because the situation will be the same for quite a long time. It won't be over today or tomorrow. So we are not going to get back into the previous life. We are going to enter a new life with new habits, new rituals. And it will be the next stage for all of us. We ask people how they see their behavior in the future when all the restrictions are lifted. And of course, all the factors mentioned earlier, like uh, being worried about their health safety and people now don't, uh, do not use handshakes, they do not embrace each other and we expect it to stay because uh, this uh, health concern will stay for some time. And uh, China experience shows that, that even the, when uh, cafes and restaurants and shopping malls are open, people do not get back there um, straight away. People need time to adapt. And uh, it still is going to be different. It won't be the same as in the past. And there are part of consumers who intend to reduce their visits to public places. It is connected to their concerns about the safety and health. And even if the measures are lifted, the restriction measures are lifted, they are not going to go to public places more often. Moreover, because uh, they already found a substitute for such activities online. Yet, quite a lot of people would like to go to parks more often, to go outside for a stroll, for a walk, and it's a part of a healthy lifestyle pattern. People believe that fresh air and walking is good for them, and uh, so it will be a public space which will be visited more frequently. And so these trends, they are not very long lasting, but the habits formed during self-isolation they will stay in the future as well. We're quite sure that new patterns will become the part of behavior, um, such as um, online education, uh, using plastic cards for payments. These are the patterns uh, that existed before, but actually were pushed and boosted by this crisis. And of course, they will stay in the future as well.
we adapted and we found new things to do. Um, for example, exercise at home, do sports at home. And now there are lots of online courses and platforms that um, provide for this need. And we expect that part of the consumers who use the offline facilities for such purposes, they'll stay home and exercise from home. And it's also true for all kinds of online resources and platforms, because all of them were boosted during this period of time. And we also witness it in our own life. Uh, we're a research company, and we know that uh, um, in each crisis, uh, online interviews grow in uh, in their share, and we actually expect to have more online interviews than ever this year. Uh, now, as to business uh, spaces and uh, offices, people feel that uh, working from home remotely is quite a good thing. It is very relevant for Moscow because people save a lot of time for commuting and they save money on commuting. And flexible hours is a great benefit of uh, walking remote men. And it's also become more relevant. And more offices uh, now work remotely. And right now, uh, people can organize their schedule the best way possible for them. And uh, for example, how I personally can organize my day so that it's perfect for me. And some people who work remotely right now expect to stay at home and uh, they do not want to go back to the office once uh, the mobility restrictions are lifted. But on the other hand, uh, it's not, uh, you know, that optimistic uh, entirely. There are drawbacks. Of course, uh, some people do not uh, really like it because uh, working in the office um, is uh, better in some respects. And new times uh, create new expectations from people who work and how these working spaces can be organized and how to make them more functional, how to make schedules more flexible and safe at the same time. And we believe that this trend will stay for some time as well. As I already said, um, we measured several crises in Russia, and I mentioned three crises. But in, on average, um, um, an average Russian person witnesses five crises. And uh, we witness a crisis once a decade. And uh, many of us remember 1998 and 2008, and 2014 and there will be other crises and we draw lessons from each crisis and we learn a lot from that we analyze them and of course each crisis is different but conclusions that we draw for them they are very valuable next slide please So, what is to come? Yes, so we did have a phase, so what's going to happen next? What shall we do? What shall we do tomorrow? And I think that this period is over for the majority of the company. And uh, all the hopes are placed in future, at the recovery stage. But as we already said, the situation won't be just over we won't go back to our normal lives. Of course, we will enter a new life with uh, some parts of the old life, but with the signs of new life as well, with the habits that we acquired during the crisis, during the pandemic. So we need to look into the future. We need to analyze the situation, taking into account our previous experiences, and we need to get ready for the next cycle so that the brand and company stays very strong. This is why here is what we believe is necessary and right for companies. We need to change actively. We need to stay tuned to our consumers, stay connected 
and uh, we need to support all kinds of new business models and collaborations. And we hope that we use these times as uh, great as possible and uh, we transform our companies and enter the nearest future very strong and advanced. Thank you very much. Thank you. We do have quite a lot of emotional comments. Thank you so much for your presentation. It's very emotional. Thank you so much. And you got uh, very many likes. Well, actually, yeah, I do feel emotional as well, because you said that things that's considered normal in the past uh, now is perceived like extraordinary. Well, for example, like wearing a dress, like wearing a dress today is a special event. And when I watch movies, uh, when uh, a person comes home without running to the bathroom to wash their hands, I think that there is something wrong with him. So uh, probably a question to Marina. You said um, about biological safety, and it's not just a trend, it's something that we witness every day and something that uh, is paramount for us. So, does it mean that we'll get back to owing things, to having your own territory, owing your own car? So, all these services like car sharing, for example, will fade away or probably they will survive and probably even develop. Well, I would like to get back to the fact that these big trends, they existed and they will in the future. I realize that right now, in the moment, we believe that your own car is better, your own country house is better, because there you feel good. But it doesn't mean that we'll all rush to buy your own car. And the segment, for example, young people who vote for car sharing, who vote for taxis, it doesn't mean that they want to own a car. So I believe that sharing economy will stay, but it will adjust to the new situation slightly. Of course, we need to make sure that the person is safe. And uh, for example, car sharing should be safe uh, in terms of air safety, uh, surfaces safety. For example, people cannot drive without gloves. So we need to adjust. We need to adapt to new situations. So, and probably it won't be car sharing that uh, changes drivers uh, several times a day, but probably it will be just like a subscription for, for a car and you rent a car for a week or for a month. So I think that the new ways, new factors, new formats will emerge. So I don't think we're going to get back in this respect. Thank you very much. Another question. So you talked about uh, biological safety and environmental safety. Do you see a contradiction here? Because right now, planes are not flying and bears are coming back to our streets. But at the same time, we are using so much of plastic, so much of disposable gloves uh, and disposable containers. We pollute environment. And uh, are we prepared to probably uh, say no to it in the future. So brands who uh, talk about environmental safety and how does it correspond to what people do right now? I think that the current situation is all about diversity. So when we talk about environmental safety, everything is connected. Well, for example, you cannot focus on biological safety while polluting the planet at the same time. We need to make our priority to uh, probably utilize all this rubbish and trash that we generate. So it's all connected. Some of our activities have uh, beneficial impact here but detrimental impact there. So we need to learn and even people, as our 
measurement shows uh, that, of course, health is very important, but in environmental concerns, they also stay. So it, sh it should all exist at the same time. Thank you very much, Marina. Ekaterina, we also have a question for you. Uh, you introduced the word um, uh, COVID crisis in your presentation, and it's very hard to get rid of it. So in this COVID crisis, all the traditional ways to measure um, consumer behavior is like focus groups uh, and others. They are not relevant right now. So can you please tell us uh, what changed for you as a research company? And uh, so that us, people who work with you, uh, and have an understanding, what are the prospects? Is it more difficult for you? Is it easier for you? And what about the precision of the measurement and uh, whether we can use the data um, gathered by the new methods and can they be compared to the old data? Yeah, of course, we work remotely. The office is closed. Everyone works remotely. And uh, all the activities uh, that uh, involve uh, presence of people, they've been cancelled. And of course, focus groups, um, we stopped having focus groups at the end of March. Um, but what we do? As I already said, we moved online. And uh, in the past, something was uh, seemed to be impossible online, but now it is online. Now we build online communities and online tests. Everything is moving online wherever it is possible. And it's also about quantitative uh, research. If we can move online, we move online. Online works just fine. And uh, of course, uh, uh, we measure response rates, uh, and uh, but actually respondents and participants uh, answer in their usual mode and uh, we didn't see any major shifts in their responses we haven't witnessed them well of course if it wasn't connected to the change in the situation uh, it's not about the format we do have focus groups online uh, we do have such things in an online community well as to the test it's more complicated story but uh, part of the projects uh, are moved uh, for at home tests uh, and of course we use couriers for deliveries contact last and now uh, we are testing new opportunities uh, and our interviewers are learning to work through zoom and uh, yes, we do have new projects with face-to-face -face through Zoom. So it's contactless, but we see your face. We ask questions uh, according to the question list. Uh, and uh, it's just like we did it before, person-to-person, face-to-face. And uh, in Russia, we do have quite a lot of face-to-face -face activities. Uh, and I believe that 2020 will become a pivotal point um in um, um surveying technologies and using online activities in such, such industry so all face-to-face -face activities moved online and of, and of course it entails the tracking of data but we understand uh, that uh, not this year but next year we, were, we would have been forced to do it anyway the whole world is moving online. So for us, it was just the issue of time. And probably this situation just gave us a very light push. Anyway, we would have uh, done it next time. Yeah, right. Uh, trend break in tests. I think that we'll be quite uh, comfortable with doing it in the future after all we went through. Thank you very much, Marina and Ekaterina. And we move on. Next speaker is Anna Dribaja, who is a marketing director of Avita. And she is going to talk about using insights in uh, modern online marketing communications on the behavior of consumers in COVID times. Hello, Anna, we can hear you. 
Hello, a pleasure to be with you. And uh, just like Dmitry said, we are indeed going to discuss marketing in COVID times. And I'm going to start by by referring, I'm sorry, to the needs and interests of consumers. So there is this interest insight that people in general don't believe that uh, businesses should suspend advertising. Only 8% believe that businesses should stop advertising. Like they say that uh, advertising should provide you know, a positive perspective, it should be full of humor and so on. So people are actually expecting advertisers to suggest some good ideas to them, something that would help them in their daily lives. And here I'm referring to, uh, oh, that's a global barometer, 30 countries poll. So 77% of consumers polled state that brands should explain how are they useful in this new reality. And 75% of consumers believe that brands should inform them about the things they do in order to help everybody overcome the current challenges. So talk to me and act for we. These are the key ideas. Now let's talk about things that brands can do. Let me remind you of the uh, so-called Maslow hierarchy of needs. You will remember that the basic level of needs are physiological ones, uh, such as uh, food and water and shelter and sleep. Well, obviously, you know, the brands that uh, work in this part of, uh, of the hierarchy have a very easy time. You know, the time is more difficult for the brands that are addressing higher order needs. So I think they should focus on supporting people uh, rather than, you know, shying away like a wallflower. My plan was to discuss with you three components of what we do in marketing. You know, designed to protect the brand and communicate with users in times of COVID. One is about discovering new needs. Second one is about communications. So let's talk new needs first. First four steps. Actually, ladies from Ipsos have uh, already covered it. There's something that we try to analyze on our own, but sometimes we do call uh, the researchers for help. And uh, this is actually about uh, discovering the needs. You know, once the lockdown was imposed, you know, we started wondering what would benefit, like communications, uh, home productivity, learning and development, fitness, cooking, entertainment. These are obviously the key areas where new solutions would be very much wanted. Second step, you know, the products and services that can actually address those needs, so, such as smartphones and tablets in order to support telecoms, monitors and uh, headsets and online courses, sports equipment and online training sessions, TV, online video, VR, video streams, gaming, kitchen goods and home goods and home devices. So the third step is when we try to actually see how a particular brand such as Avita can fit. Like Avita, for example, can come up with the rates, ratings and lists of smartphones and tablets or, you know, lists of uh, great jobs that, uh, you know, you can branch out into if you've been laid off or online learning in Avita services. Similarly, ratings for gamers and for those looking for fitness opportunities. Actually, gaming has grown considerably. Like we're talking about, I think, fourfold growth. Also, 
rated list for home cooking and uh, grocery delivery services. Also, ideas and suggestions for home decoration. And step four is about finding a way to talk about it, selecting specific tools such as content, advertising, media, specific actions we can take. So we see here how specific needs as we identified at the start of the corona crisis have impacted the current trends. So for example, you see here the growth in specific categories uh, such as animals for home, repairs, refurbishment, uh, DIY 80%, hobbies 51, electronics 47, personal items 41. Uh, Notes, for example, yeah, uh, I'm sorry, what you see in the right are the subcategories that seem to be in huge demand in certain areas. Like we see this explosive growth in bikes, for example. People are already buying greenhouses and BBQ says for their dachas, gaming is still very hot. And in some areas, you know, the growth rates are low now, but uh, overall growth, you know, cumulative growth is still impressive. Know your role. Like I said, the brands that serve basic needs find it very easy to be useful and relevant, but even they need to communicate properly and they need to remember what their role is. It's not just about being heard, right? It's about showing how you're useful and relevant. I'm quoting here from some global media, you know, global social networks. See, people are saying, I never signed up for updates from brands about COVID. Will somebody please tell them to fucking stop? So Avita has been notifying its users, but uh, trying to notify them about useful things like how to collect the orders from pickup points, you know, rather than simply be routers that uh, relay information, or even worse, be fear mongers. Next one, please. I'm going to show several examples here. You know, the time of the lockdown was a serious challenge to us. We were wondering how our existing product was going to perform because we previously delivered from one pickup point to another pickup point. Like uh, if a person from St. Pete orders something from, uh, I'm sorry, from Moscow, it has to be delivered between the two cities to a different pickup point. So we uh, we had to change uh, some of our creative briefs and we had to change the service so that goods would be delivered not to a pickup point, but to homes. And this is how it works now. So for example, if a product is delivered to Moscow pickup point, then our couriers will deliver them from the pickup point free of charge to your home. And this means that you don't really need to leave your home. We have door to door delivery provided as well within the same city, I assume. Which means that you can easily sell stuff from home or buy stuff from home, no hassle. So when we did launch pure contactless delivery, we started en masse communications in all the platforms where Avita is present. We made it the centerpiece of our communications to ensure that we have 360 degrees communications about it. And we also had a grocery delivery service which uh, did support this communication. It has become incredibly popular now. Also online services. On Avita, for example, you can find an online coach 
or an online nanny or an online teacher. And this is the new trend. Something that previously uh, was considered kind of uh, impossible or very rare has become the mainstream. It's a day uh, radically new opportunity for business development. Another insight, you know, when people spend so much time at home, they finally decided to bring some order to their flats. You know, this has its mental benefits as well, but it's also a great opportunity for them to decide what they need and what they don't. What they don't need can actually be sold on Avita, and this is what bloggers often do. You know, we had some stream parties with them where in real time they would show their auction lots. So it's like a you know a tele a tele sales. So it's very easy. All you gotta do when watching the show is just press the button, it takes you to, to you know to a linked page where you place your order. Another challenge is to help people find jobs. You know, many people have been laid off. And they want to find jobs, maybe short-term jobs, maybe nighttime jobs or whatever. And our team has performed a mission impossible. You know, they launched an, a bot in two weeks, which uh, based on your needs, can select job postings for you. It takes just a couple of clicks for you to find the list of vacancies open in your neighborhood. And this is an example of useful and relevant communications that I talked about previously. Now, shooting clips in times of isolation proved to be a challenge, but uh, we were able to overcome it. You know, we used uh, very bootstrapped video teams no no makeup artists no fancy apparel selection and they were good and realistic we also emphasized the existing vacancies and we supported the employers who kept on hiring in times of crisis A crisis is a period of opportunity for some. Well, it does pack lots of challenges as well. But the companies in e-commerce or doing online delivery, it's obviously an opportunity. And it became quite a challenge for many companies to hire delivery people order pickers, sorters, and so on. So we are supporting such employers. Avita Realty. This is actually one of the most challenging markets. Showing your flat online to a potential buyer was something inconceivable previously. But now, this is the only way you can do that. You know, photos obviously don't cut to the chase. And also, we've introduced a very simple and uh, nearly free of charge, because one ruble, which is peanuts really, uh, like one cent, service for checking the validity of uh, data supplied by the homeowner. Now, people who have been in lockdown and are really bored, you know, we've given them an interesting opportunity to stay entertained. You know, I'm referring here to video streaming opportunities that we've given them. 
you know, some of the streams collected thousands of, I'm uh, sorry, hundreds of thousands of users. Now let's talk about specific actions, actions that can be taken in a period like this. Here I'm talking about the brands that meet needs of higher order. We try to maintain certain balance uh, between useful and relevant communications for users on the one hand, with supporting some badly hit businesses on the other. You know, some business simply had to shut her down because that was the position of the regulator. So I'd like to illustrate some specific actions we took to support those businesses. You know, in times like this, actions speak louder than words. I'll start here with an international example. Louis Vuitton refurbished their production lines in order to produce sanitizers and antiseptic lotions instead of perfume. Uh, and they will be distributed in France for free. This is the kind of action speaking louder than words that I meant. This is a list of things that we did to support SMEs. You know, SMEs in Russia have been steamrolled by the crisis and the state is not really supporting them. So chances are they won't be getting better anytime soon. So uh, we are emphasizing for them the existing offers like we're proposing tools we propose i will tell them how to start we're offering discounts well when i say discounts i mean cashbacks so for different industry verticals we had different offers and if it was the first time you took your business online avita was a great way of exposing yourself to millions and millions of potential consumers. So obviously to them, we offered some onboarding help. We helped them establish presence on the Vita. And I also have a good story about how we helped them attract their first customers there. Delivery for small businesses. This uh, proved to be a tectonic shift for Avita. For the first time, we launched deliveries for small business service because Avita was designed as a P2P service. But small businesses, which used to be offline, many of them are going online now, and Avita can be a good family for them. So they can use Avita delivery if they don't want to establish their own delivery service. So this was a particularly challenging task that we were able to complete in a matter of two weeks. So this service is now available only to really small businesses like sole proprietors and uh, really small companies. And it has been very well received by the entrepreneurs. So we are planning to make it available to bigger businesses as well. Well, this one uh, uh, lists uh, our ways of supporting small businesses, including customer acquisition. Yeah, each of us has a favorite uh, coffee place where we love buying coffee, or you know, many of us have uh, favorite stores where we shop for, say, ceramics or where we buy home plants. Importantly, each of these stores is a small business by definition. We love them. You know, our heart goes out for them. And we certainly don't want to return to empty streets after the lockdown is eased. So we decided to support them on Avita. So the offer was that uh, people can shop with them on Avita and we will help them with delivery. 
So this is what it was like. Uh, next slide will show what it can be like if the small places go out of business. And one more. We certainly want to avoid that. So we have this campaign called Don't Leave the Streets Empty, Support Small Businesses on Avita. This one is about our attempt to save SMEs. Well, we do care about SMEs. They're dear to our hearts. It's a matter of social responsibility among commercial, uh, besides commercial success. So with this clip, we were able to bring traffic, to bring leads to the stores that operate now on Avita. Let's enjoy the movie together. Support small businesses on Avita. In the cities, we could become taller than houses. You could have failed to note, but in this video, small businesses are no more. They can disappear from real life equally easily unless we help them. Buy goods with delivery. The box says Avita delivery. Avita where people make decisions. This is where I wanted to finish my presentation. And I'm very grateful to all those uh, who supported us, including our agency. You know, those who helped us, for example, produce those uh, great bombastic clips. I think we've done a good, uh, the good thing by supporting SMEs. Thank you very much. I can take your questions if you have any. Thank you very much. Yes, I do have this idea that uh, you can actually submit your questions while the presentation is still running. Unfortunately, I couldn't ask some questions to the previous speaker because I only noticed some of them too late. Okay, we have heard about uh, things that Google, PNG, Beeline are doing. They said that they completely revamped the marketing plan since March. And I understand the same has happened to you. The activities they are implementing now are very different from what they planned at the beginning of the year. So can you please tell us what your budgeting and planning exercise was? I understand he had to do it real quick, right? So what was the process like for you? How did you make your decision on what to focus? Sure. Thank you for the question. We did prioritize the areas that we thought could be useful and relevant in this particular moment. And things that, uh, you know, could be postponed were indeed postponed. So we split all our activities into three buckets. One is critically important, things that absolutely need to be done. Things that absolutely need to be communicated, presented, deployed. Things to avoid for the time being, second bucket. So these are the activities where we kind of, which we kind of mothball until the business environment changes. And I think we're mothballing them since the, I'm sorry, until the second half of the year. And the third bucket contains things we can avoid doing if we need to bootstrap, if, uh, if we need extra funds. So these were the three buckets for our scenario planning exercise. And most of the scenario planning has been done in the if then sort of logic. Thank you very much, Anna. Since I don't see other questions yet, we should thank Anna and wish her all sorts of success in your very important social 
socially resonant projects. Indeed, so, uh, small businesses are very important. We have a micro break now, after which we'll have uh, a session with Alena Razbirina, who is going to talk about communication rules in the post-COVID times. And then we shall have a crowning session with our international stars. So in about seven or eight minutes, we will resume. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. So done now.
Welcome back, everyone. This is the fifth hour. I hope you're doing fine. So let's continue talking about the trends uh, and what's happening in the battlefield of uh, brands. Um, and now we're going to listen to Alion Razbirina, who's the Managing Director for Strategy and Communication. And uh, she will uh, tell us about the natural selection of brands. Lyon, hello, the floor is yours. Hi, hello. Shall we start, colleagues? Hello, everyone. It's a very interesting day today. So many great topics. Uh, and I wanted to have, uh, you know, a uh, long-term approach and uh, look at the situation in the past uh, and uh, look at the prehistoric uh, times uh, when, uh, you know, the big, big creatures ruled the world. And when we talk about natural selections, we mean that these are uh, the species uh, who have the best uh, best characteristics uh, for uh, the environment and so we today are going to look at uh, the factors that will help brands survive this crisis and period of self-isolation we do not have a clear understanding of when it happens when all the restrictions are lifted but anyway it will sometimes happen so we need to understand uh, then uh, you know we in the past uh, during such events we used to talk about consumers and right now when we talk about crisis when, when we talk about crisis and crisis consumer we all are crisis consumers and uh, so these crisis consumers uh, have a very unstable position because all of us had to change our lifestyles very drastically change our has and you know all these little cafes and uh, shops uh, they all suffer because we they all feel very uncomfortable right now we do not know what's going to happen to our finances especially taking into account the uh, exchange rates and uh, oil prices so of course we are all worried about our own health about health of our loved ones and the most difficult part is we do not have the time frame for all the things we do not have a clear deadline we do not have any uh, uh, event horizon of the new reality. We're all dwelling in this as position of un uncertainty, but uh, human psyche can adapt to very unusual situations and very unpleasant situations. And so now we're all approaching the phase of acceptance of new reality. And now um, something that we believed uncomfortable became the new reality. So, understanding that the situation is serious is already present uh, we track the moods of people because in the last crisis uh, we saw the necessity how different people assess the situation and right now we see that people believe that the crisis is going to be really serious so this crisis is going to take longer and uh, the last measurement um, from the 12th of may shows that uh, self-isolation will be over by midsummer or probably even by the end of summer it's also very important that we need to understand that right now we are not talking about life post covid 19 but we are rather talking about life together with covid 19 because uh, yeah, people are working on a vaccine and of course uh, it will take a lot of time for us to get vaccinated and so it will actually not a, qu a question of several months even. And uh, when we come to the airport right now uh, and going through a security check when we unbutton our shoes and put all the items into the train, we do not think that all the things were provoked by the September 11 event probably the same will happen with um, COVID-19 something will transform we will work out new routines and we'll consider them norm normal we see that we see it right now because right now we're planning to go to a supermarket 
um, sorry, we've got uh, a different slide, but marketing people need to think about the future and uh, need to learn from today's experiences. And we see that people, while evaluating the plane brands, uh, uh, they, they they believe that brands are much more effective than even the government during these pandemic times. Sometimes uh, the state is not very logical in its actions. Uh, and uh, people also track uh, whether there is an re emotional response. And if they see that the brand is interested in money, they probably will reject this brand in the future. They'll stop using the products. We can continue. So all of us are crisis consumers, both consumers and the industry and the brands. We all exist in this field of uncertainty. But if we talk about uh, evolution, we need to ask a question, who's going to succeed in this field of uncertainty? Next slide, please. And if we look at the classical definition of strategy, we need to remember that it's a plan to achieve uh, one or more goals. And there is a very important point, and I really would like to point it out, that reaching this goal happens in the field of uncertainty, and it's, an or, it's a norm. For example, when we think about long-term marketing plans for two or three years, when we think about our budgets, and uh, well, for example, there is a news that there will be a meteorite approaching Earth uh, in, in two months. So we never know for sure what's going to happen. So we shouldn't be afraid of uncertainty. We need to take it into account and we need to make adjustment for it in our plans. Sooner or later, consumers will adapt to the situation and they will build new habits and new patterns. And it's already happening. And it's very important for brands to use this factor to reevaluate their strategy and uh, whether it is relevant to the current situation and whether it leads to the brand's goals or not. And now let's move on to the five key factors that we need to come up with as a brand, as a company, to succeed in this brave new world. The first thing to dwell on is a very, very small creature, ants. And they're famous for the fact that when they get back to their, to their nest, uh, they sometimes stop on the way home, they lift their head and they check where the sun is, where all the objects are, to make sure that they are on the right track. And so I actually urge all of us to be like ants, to be as brands prepared for what's, com what's, what's coming next. We need to work out different scenarios, and these scenarios are to be flexible. We need to understand that, yes, of course, uh, us as a brand, uh, we need stability and certain things stay the same, but some things need to be flexible and we can adjust them according to the situation. And uh, when we feel, when we move along the path of uncertainty, we need to track and we need to watch out for pivotal points. We need to track the points when we need to adjust our course. It's also important to understand that even if you exist within one category, you can have all kinds of different scenarios. China experiences shows that within one category, there were very, very different scenarios. Well, for example, uh, in the food products, uh, chocolate, uh, chocolate it was different from other things. We can move on. As a company, evaluating our 
experience in previous five years and looking at the experience uh, of other countries, we understand that um, despite the fact that the demand went down, there are companies uh, who suffer. And these company, uh, and for these companies, it will take a long time to get back to normal if the demand is very low for them right now. So the second factor is um, to present yourself and be heard and seen. And so look at this bird. These birds are famous for their very loud voice uh, during their mating period. They're making very, very noisy sounds because they want to attract attention to themselves. And we need to take it into account and use this approach to be successful as a brand. And uh, different markets prove that if we switch all our activities off for a long time, it will take us longer to get back to normal after the crisis is over and it will involve greater efforts on part of marketing team to get back to the normal and to get back to the parameters that we want to achieve in the future. When we do our MMM, we can take into account the impact of uh, different factors, but for example, we can see that media can provide a pretty strong short term effect. For example, the contribution of media gave about 10% in the short term. However, over the longer term, media's contribution can grow to about 20%. And in certain cases, it can yield up to one third of total sales. So if we want to you know, exit the crisis quickly and comfortably, media is the area to invest in. Another important uh, media strategy question is the question of how you allocate your investments inside the portfolio. So it's really important to focus on you know, on the categories and the brands that have been hit the least and that are, you know, the best fit for your target audience. Well, for example, if you got value for money brands, you may want to focus on them. Or if you've got a brand that can be an emotional leader in its category, it could also be a pretty good bet because this is what uh, many consumers are expecting. One of the speakers earlier today said that we need simpler strategies and more short-term strategies which means like not a real strategy it's more of a tactic but indeed we need to be able to behave flexibly to be more flexible about our plans and our strategies which is not surprising you know consumption is changing we even have white collars watching tv you know something we haven't seen for maybe a decade you know we used to hunt them and now they are lapping the tv up so it's also very important to make decisions based on the level of your ambition and your capabilities, including financial capabilities. So once you've taken this into account, you can decide how much and where you want to invest. Okay, so this one showed a leverage, a leverage versus growth ambitions. Well, it's also quite important, and this has also been mentioned earlier today, that uh, you know many brands, you know, have to reinvent themselves on the spot. Well, actually, speed and agility were very important in the most acute phase of isolation. But I promise, or I bet, they will be equally important when we start emerging from the lockdown, when the real changes start getting evident. Like I said, consumers are changing their behavior patterns. You know, they've uh, realized, for example, they can go shopping earlier when there will be smaller crowds. And now they also have to, you know, remember to get themselves a pass every time they want to go out, you know, further than the local supermarket. And also many brands are claiming that uh, people are going to have... Uh, a spree of revenge shopping 
but not all the stores, not all the retailers are going to benefit from it. And maybe stocking up in time for it is a good idea. You know, some online companies, some e-commerce operators said it was very difficult for them to serve, to service this uh, surge in orders. So make sure you're prepared, you know, logistically and operationally for this resurgence of shoppers because they may come back in throngs. Also, if we are talking about quick solutions, things to keep tracking all the time, I'll list it here. Like I said, we are thinking short term now. We have uh, adopted a short termist approach to strategy. Now, monitoring of uh, how new consumption habits form is very important. Equally important is uh, an audit for an audit of how topical your message is. You know, very often brands keep working as if on autopilot, totally ignoring that the society is different. People are feeling what they weren't feeling before. You know, they've got so many other anxieties. Media habits are changing. Media landscape is changing. There are structural changes in the market, and there are very good objective reasons for that. Therefore, it's very important to regularly check whether the architecture of your media campaign still makes sense. Well, maybe, you know, you were previously working on brand awareness and you may have, you may have chosen to restyle your brand, to relaunch it completely. And I previously mentioned triggers or pivotal points. They also need to be tested for validity because the environment is different now. Like I said, we need to act fast and decide fast. You know, long-term research, endless focus groups, exposing thousands of people to your creative briefs. Well, everything that was our bread and butter for the previous several years has to be reviewed. You know, we got to be able to make do with what we have. You know, make decisions based on the sparse data that's already available. Think fast, act fast. At the same time, we have to be mindful that there is significant pressure on the marketing team. Risks are significant. You know, when you think fast and you act fast, risks of making a mistake obviously go up. On the other hand, you know, there are some fleeting opportunities you can only grab if you act fast. So there is upside there as well. Like I said, in order to be fast, in order to react fast, it makes a lot of sense to create integrated teams. Teams that include members of creative agencies, digital agencies, media agencies, obviously the client team as well, in order to make sure that information gets exchanged quickly. Well, in times like this, we really don't have the time to exchange verbose emails forever. my favorite part of the presentation. And uh, the mascot I have here of an amphibian, which uh, knows how to survive and thrive in so many different environments. This is what brands need to learn. There was a point in time when uh, almost 4 billion people around the world were under lockdown. This was a no-nonsense test of the you know robustness and reliability of our online infrastructure. Call centers, delivery services were creaking under the pressure. You know, many banks experienced uh, denial of service issues. Well, you know, certain agencies also experienced the same issue. I'm not even talking about ISPs. You know, ISPs uh, obviously were facing colossal demand for their services, and they, many of them at least, could not really provide the speeds that they promised. So this showed that the infrastructure we had was not very reliable, not to say it was vulnerable. At the same time, the companies that were already present in the online world and knew how to operate there well, enjoyed explosive growth. 
you know, in many countries, e-commerce accounted for only 3 to 5% of total sales. Now we are seeing double-digit growth there. Well, Zoom is the hero of the New York Times. How can I avoid mentioning Zoom? You know, what you see here is their market cap as of the 15th of May. You see that it has put behind itself not just the largest airlines, but a combination of the largest airlines in terms of the market caps. Naturally, we are seeing some categories online that we couldn't really imagine there. We couldn't even conceive of them being online. Like I remember in the previous conference, we talked about selling cars online. And, you know, one of the brands there said that, well, they were actually able to sell like a dozen cars online and it sounded like a major achievement. Now people are selling flats online and they're much more expensive than cars. So something that we have been talking as an industry for a decade about has finally happened. Obviously, consumers are in no hurry to go back to stores, offline stores, I mean. And there are reasons for that, you know. Some of them have developed a habit for shopping in line. Some of them are wary. So some of these habits are going to stay. Importantly, she drops the subject. You know, offline players found it very comfortable and convenient in the offline world, but online was so challenging. While online players didn't know much about the offline world, but they knew everything about the offline world. So when uh, brick and mortar operators enter uh, the byte world, they often have this illusion that now with their sheer size and economy of scale, they are going to trample the competition. Oh, how wrong they are. Their learning curve may prove to be not steep at all. Now, I guess this is my favorite character because this dude is very good at adapting to diverse circumstances. Uh, changes in borders uh, do not necessarily mean that the product or an object is different. Well, this is what uh, dialectics taught us. The same, I guess, applies to brands. You know, brand values are what consumers choose us for, and they should stay the same. But at the same time, the boundaries of your brand may easily change. However, these are the times when you may want to reconsider what constitutes the territory of your brand, because some things probably need to be forgotten as a nightmare and need to be ditched completely. Now, back when I worked for one large brand, our brand director loved to say after a very successful initiatives, you know, our brand director liked to say, our brand will survive. 
Uh, meaning that if the brand is strong, you know, if it has a lot of uh, legacy, if it has a good, uh, uh, well, if it has a lot of goodwill associated with it, you know, how, however bad your execution was, you will still survive. However, Charles Darwin famously said that it is those who adapt best rather than the smartest or the strongest who will survive. That's why it's important to stay attuned to what's happening, to stay abreast of all the changes, and there are lots of them now. And I guess nothing is more important for the survival of any brand today. Otherwise, it will be difficult for us to thrive in this brave new world. Thank you very much. I'm done. Thank you very much, Alona. I'm not sure if it's a question or if it's a, a reflection camouflaging as a question, but I really want to hear your opinion. One of the key ideas I heard in your presentation was that the word strategy itself is creating more problems for us compared to tactics. In fact, you know, it's generating more pain in the neck for us than it's creating value for us, unlike tactics. Is that indeed true? Do you think we have entered the time, well, given this transition to the online world and so on, where most activities become much easier to measure? Well, with so much focus on e-commerce, you know, we won't be dealing that much with the um, user behaviors, mostly with consumer behaviors. Does it mean that brand strategies are losing their value? What do you think is the future of brand strategies? I'm not asking about media strategies. I'm asking about brand strategies. What's the value of a document like a brand strategy in this brave new VUCA world? where adaptation is key. Well, I love the corona crisis term bandied about by some of the previous speakers. I'd rather talk about the usefulness of practical strategies rather than long-term strategies. I don't really think that we are going to go fully digital. Well, look at what the consumers are doing in Europe. You know, there are people queuing now to Zara stores. Zara online operations are great. Nothing stopped Parisian ladies from shopping online and still they are standing in queues. That's because we love this tactile experience, the kinesthetic experience. We love the social interaction involved in shopping. This is not going to go away. Now, you asked me about brand strategy, and that was the key idea of the last part of my presentation. I think it's imperative for us to understand the key element of your brand value and the touch point that your brand has with the consumers. And then around it, we should build maybe a new core. I guess that the variable part of our strategy will be bigger than before. Well, previously, many brands were comfortable coming up with three to five year long brand strategies. Not anymore, I guess. I think we can still say this is where we want to go. However, we will be walking in shorter steps. So there will be lots of minor corrections needed. So you may still be waging a long-term digital campaign, but you will have to change tech more often. I guess brand DNA will continue to be the same. You will still have, you know, some do's and some don'ts for your brand, but you may need to review the boundaries of your brand. And remember the funnel I showed previously, uh, which talked about a different way to plan your future. I tried to reproduce it with my hands. Apparently I failed. But in any case, you know, there is still a particular landscape your brand operates, a particular territory it wants to dominate. You know, we talk to brand owners every day. We understand what they care about. 
But you know, consumers have a totally different attitude to brands. Even if they shop for your brand every day, they don't really experience a contact with your brand on a daily basis. And if it's and it can be therefore easy to replace. So that should be our perspective, I think. And I think that therefore agencies, both comms agencies and media agencies, should also kind of chart the degrees of freedom that you have. Like, well, this is the territory of your brand and these are the areas where you can branch out. This could be the area for experimentation. Great, thank you. My second and my last question. There has been this uh, very important and useful idea. I certainly corroborate as a strategist myself. I, I do agree that it's very important to run an integrated team to be, in fact, a holistic body of experts, uh, drawing up on the expertise of various agencies. And I'm also thinking that uh, there could be a need now to integrate around the brand because previously it could be the marketing agency that was the integrator so to speak or the the shaft around which the integration would happen and unfortunately previously we couldn't really meet a lot of other well if like departments that we get exposed to now but now in times of uh, in times when high agility is needed, when you need to involve the R&D people, the trade marketing people and others, it pro probably makes sense to bring on board, to bring into this integrated team, other experts from the company. Would you like to comment on that? This is something I'm actually seeing in some large corporations. This is something that uh, I'm reading a lot now about there has been quite a lot of research, lots of studies around that. And I guess that uh, the crisis we are seeing now has blown away many of the useless stuff that was around. Shucks, I think, is the technical agricultural name for it. So finally, I think that the value chain from the agency has met the value chain led by the clients. And it's great because uh, we can actually optimize the value chain now. We can learn to expedite certain processes. The marketing used to be a conductor and a translator for the other departments. Oh, I guess she meant uh, marketing people before, not marketing agencies, that's marketing teams for the client side. The structural units in many corporations, you know, they tend to uh, think along the lines of their functional needs and interests, while marketing people could uh, sort of bring them all to a common denominator. We're still learning the ropes of these new communications, I think. I believe it's great that this process is happening. I believe it's great it's happening faster. And still, it would require some regulation, some internal rules and processes. They may be different from what we had before. They may be more open. And at the same time, I guess they uh, should still be governed to a certain extent by the marketing team. I guess marketing will continue to play or should start playing the role of a regulator. It should have the final say in terms of what falls and what doesn't fall into the purview of the brand. Great. I really wanted you to say something like this. Thank you very much, Alona. We shall have a micro break now, followed by the last panel, the last, but certainly not the least. In a sense, it's the crowning piece of the die. So please do not uh, disconnect your laptops. Do not disconnect your eyeballs. But uh, in this uh, culmination of the event, we shall have two speakers. Thomas Barter, who is a global expert 
in marketing leadership and the author of uh, 12 powers of marketing leader uh, he's also the lead of a huge uh, research project involving over 60,000 respondents where uh, they are researching the mechanics of marketing leadership and tracy alfred is the president of fe worldwide so they are the two cherries on the pie the two crowning speakers for our sessions today and uh, as usual we are collecting your questions online we do read your questions at least those that you submit in comments thank you very much see you in a couple of minutes uh, Thomas and Tracy, for your information.
Shall I say good evening? It's uh, nearly five o'clock already, and uh, thank you very much for spending the day with us. We're about to start the final, the crowning part of the day. Both speakers in this session will be speaking English, and if you want to hear them translate it, you can stay in the same channel, but I seriously recommend that you switch to the original channel, and to that end, I shared a link to a different YouTube channel. So, we've been discussing for quite some time how to become smarter marketers based on insights and better understanding of consumers. But in this session, we shall talk about how to become more inspiring marketing leaders, and particularly how you can do it in such challenging times. That's why we've invited two very inspiring marketing leaders so that they can share their acumen with us. We have Thomas Barta beamed uh, from Cologne to us, and uh, he's the author of uh, an Amazon bestseller, 12 uh, Marketing, uh, 12 Colleges of Marketing Leader. Well, besides just listening to him today, you can actually read his articles in Marketing Week from Forbes and uh, obviously his own blog. And also, we have the pleasure of uh, Tracy Alfred's company. She is the president and CEO of uh, FE Worldwide. Good morning, Tracy. Good afternoon, Thomas. Can you hear me? Are we fine? Yes. Looks Hello. like you can hear me. And uh, uh, you are using the English channel, aren't you? Yes, that's correct. That's right, the English channel. Splendid. Let's start with Thomas. So, good afternoon, Thomas. Good afternoon. You have uh, conducted a global uh, survey trying to identify the key qualities of marketing leaders. Well, uh, modern marketers are used to verifying and validating everything with hard numbers. Would you like to tell us more about your research and obviously the key qualities and skills for marketers, particularly in those interesting times? Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much for the introduction. Good evening to all of you. Uh, it's late in Moscow and I hope um, you're having a good day. And I don't want to talk about actually three very simple things. I want to talk about why marketing just got harder which is your next slide. Um, I also want to talk about what you as marketers can do now. And most importantly, I want to talk about how you can be brave, which I promise you, you will have to be uh, in these times. Now, we do a quick poll, and we're not going to ask you to put out the answers into some chat boxes. I, I just ask it for yourself. Think about this. Because of the, of the corona situation, if you rate yourself, would you say you now have more resources, you have the same resources, or you have fewer resources? How about you? Just think about it for a moment. Now, when I ask this question to people in marketing right now across the world, most people are somewhere between two and three. And a lot of people are actually seeing big challenges in the marketing world. And that's why it's so important that we know, that we start to realize what we can do now, what marketers can do now, what you can do now to actually make things happen when maybe someone has just started cutting your budget. Now, before we, before we get into this, let's think about marketing as a job. Now, in practice, right, in, in, if you think about it as a marketer, right, you should be a really important person. And what's the most important thing a company needs to do? Well, innovate and then find customers. You as marketers know how to find customers. So every important decision the company is making, they should involve you. They should ask you. You should have a very important and very influential role um, in your marketing job, right? Isn't that how it is? Well, sometimes we see it's a little different uh, and people um, talk about a few gaps that they're facing. The first gap a lot of people are facing in marketing is what we call a trust gap. Think about this. Most of the work you're doing, I guess, this year, this month, this week is about the future. And what do you think when someone tells you, I know the future? Well, you think, no, you don't, right? And that's true. Marketing 
you know, is all about the future. But when you stand next to someone from finance who has all the old numbers, you know what? Everything you say will sound a little bit less reliable because it is. And that trust gap will just won't go away. But there's more than that. There's a big power gap. Now, just imagine for a second, your company had the world's best customer experience, right? Everybody loves your firm. Everybody loves everything the brand is doing. How many people will have to be involved? Well, many people. And how many of those people report to marketing? Well, the truth is very few, right? So as a marketer, no matter what you do, you will always have this big power gap because there are a lot of people who can just say no when you come with your ideas. But that's not half of it because what else is going on in marketing? Let's talk about skills. I mean, I'm sure today you heard amazing things about marketing and the skills and the things that are around and the tools and the technologies. The truth is, you know what a lot of marketers are doing when they come home from a digital marketing conference and they look into the mirror, they're pulling a face like a little baby saying, oh my God, there is so much I need to know in marketing. This is crazy, right? I will never catch up. And I tell you what, you know, the great skills that we are now, uh, the tools we have, they're taking a lot of confidence away from some marketers because it's just a lot, right? So marketing was never easy. You should be important. There is a power gap. There is a trust gap. There is a skills gap. Has always been there. And then came this little bugger, the coronavirus, right? Now, first of all, let's give some credit to this virus because it's devastating. That's clear. But it is beautiful. I mean, if you look at the pictures, this is one of the most beautiful viruses I've ever seen. It's, of course, terrible. It creates massive damage. It takes the livelihood of people away, but it should get at least some credit for its appearance. It is actually quite beautiful. It's a well done brand. Now, the thing is this, what's happening because of the current situation? Now, you talked about this all day. Here's a great chart from Marketing Week on the next page. Um, it shows a lot of bars that are going up, but actually what it shows is everything is going down because things are delayed, new hires are delayed, budgets are delayed or on a review. You know, in fact, they should have done the chart the other way around because really the problem is that, you know, currently there's a lot of budget issues in marketing going on. But what's more, of course, you know, this is another article that you can see here from Marketing Week. You know, marketers are getting laid off. It is happening, right? Some firms have started laying off markets. It's not a funny place. So it is really difficult right now in the marketing space. And I think we all agree uh, that that's the case. Now, there is not just us, there is of course, also our customers, the people that are out there. And in all, in all fairness, for a lot of people, um, this, this, this current time is really, really difficult. For a lot of consumers, it's really, really difficult. And I'm gonna show you in just a second, a video on the next slide. And you will actually hear a consumer really venting about what's actually going on in her current life. Perhaps we can play that. So um, I'm not sure if you had a chance to look at the subtitles. This was an Israeli and she was complaining about the fact that she has to do homeschooling, right? And the, the teacher are asking her how her kids are doing. Nobody's asking her how he, she, she's doing. And what she said is, you know, her main fear is that the kids will now find out how dumb their parents really are. 
And I mean, this is just an example. And a lot of people are facing massive tensions at home. This is not easy for people. But of course, marketers, uh, you know, very smart, of course, have responded really fast to the situation. And we're gonna show you another video of what's happening out there in the marketing world to really help those frustrated and desperate people that we have across the world. And that's the next video. That's right. So across the world, marketers have done lovely commercials with lovely music and calming voices telling consumers that we're in this together. The truth is, of course, you're not. Because as a marketer, you're probably part of the small part of the population that can stay at home and work there rather than having to go out. And no, you're not in this together with your customers. You may say so, but it's not the truth. That is not what is actually going on. So what we have to stop telling people and making advertising about how, how wonderful life is or how we are in this together, what we have to do is actually get to work. And that is the important piece. And that's what I'm really going to focus on now, what you can actually do to really help people as a marketer, rather than doing commercials about a life that probably you're not participating in. So what can marketers do now? That is the big question that we're going to talk about. Well, first off, and that's the first tip I'm going to give you. You can, of course, become system critical. Now, what does system critical mean? I'm not sure if you have it in your own um, city or in your own um, as a, uh, village that you live, but in many places in the world, people have been given the title system critical. And that means when you're system critical, like you are a nurse or your doctor, you know, you get special treatment. Maybe you get childcare when other people don't. The truth is, you know, marketing isn't necessarily part of that system critical group. And many of you aren't yet system critical. And some companies have said, you know what, we're going to really chip in. Some marketers, and I'll show you an example in a minute, have actually said, you know what, this isn't about marketing now. We're going to step in and really help people in this crisis. And there's this great example on the next page. Um, of Diageo, and Diageo has pledged 8 million bottles of hand sanitizer worldwide, and they actually did a lot of advertising for it because they said that's not the point. You know, we're just helping. That's all we're doing. Some other brands like Anheuser Busch did the same. They didn't do as many bottles, but they did more advertising around it. But the point is, you can actually, you could have gone and do something that really helps people very practically fighting the crisis. Maybe that is something you can do, and if you can, awesome. Chances are that is very difficult. Not every market can do this. So um, what you then need to do is the second best thing, which it actually is your job, and that is getting ready to grow. Um, now, that may sound frightening at a time when everything is just going to going down right now, but ultimately, that's the key thing you need to focus on. And if you think, oh, how can I start and get ready to grow at this current time when it's so difficult well here are some very practical ideas of what you can do first off you can pick your sharpest sharpest marketing tools this is the time where some marketing tools will work way faster and more effective than others will and as a marketer you need to have enough understanding of marketing to see which ones you pick now, this is a very busy chart on the next page from, from some colleagues at McKinsey that, um, and you're going you're gonna to get a copy, you can have a look at this, but they figured that for the recovery of marketing, the fastest tools available are pricing and promotion, are shifting things to e-commerce when it's possible, to look at sales analytics and use sales analytics to sell more targeted, and they're great examples um, if, you, if you read a bit, you know, in China, for example, where a, a car rental firm has actually brought the, the business back extremely fast by doing very analytical direct sales to people looking at concerns. And there is marketing and sales productivity. Yes, you got to look at your budgets and you got to look at, you know, where is efficiency to be had. While on the other hand, that's probably not the right time to start 
massive, big, long-term brand repositioning projects because they will be, they might be very important, but they may not be fast. Yeah. So right now in marketing, you got to look at what is fast to help the recovery. I mean, I come, we can come to these points a few more times, but speed is actually of importance. What else could you do? You could punch above your weight. This is a moment when other people are leaving markets, when other people are withdrawing, when other companies are actually stopping their activities. And what does that mean? You're leaving, they're leaving an open field. Uh, and that's a great chart. It is reasonably small, but you get a copy and you can have a look at this. This is done by the IPA. And that's something that most marketers are very familiar with. But what the IPA has measured is that as a brand, if you continuously invest more than your market share would yield, you will see a market share growth. And, and Procter & Gamble is a great example across the world. They're currently using this time to actually pump investment into media because basically if, you, if, you're, if you're selling a yogurt, right, like this one here, and all the other yogurt guys are drawing out their investments and that all of a sudden gives you a much bigger, bigger space much bigger share. So a punching above your weight in appetizing terms is a very powerful thing you can do now. But there is more than that. Um, you probably have seen that if uh, people, are, people are in a real crisis are airlines, right? I mean, it's very difficult. And by the way, look at the uniforms. And what's amazing here is that many airlines and this Emirates have basically stopped their operations, except for some cargo flights. I mean, drastic reduction. And Emirates has decided to stop all the flights until July 2020, July 2020. Now, what's interesting is what um, Qatar Airlines has done um, because they've decided, all right, then, um, if, we, if Emirates is stopping until June, why don't we start by June? We are months earlier. So Emirates waits until July, Qatar Airways says, you know what, we're going to claim that space and we're going to start a month earlier. And that is how basically a smaller airline is grabbing share from a big one by just using the fact that they've just pulled out. And by the way, if you ever, if you ever, if you really like flying, I mean, get used to this on the next page. Um, that is actually, and it's not a joke, that is the real Qatar Airways uniform that you will be seeing for the next couple of months. So, I mean, if you're really brave, get on the plane, uh, it will be safe, but it will not be funny. So that's the point. So you can actually get in grab share when others are giving it away. So the question is to you is, I mean, how could you punch above your weight by using the gaps that are currently existing in the market? But you can do more. You can reshape the model around the world because of what's happening um, in the current crisis, a lot of companies have started to say, all right, what we're currently selling doesn't quite work right now. How can we change this? And if we, um, and that's a good question. And there's a great example. Uh, in fact, in Russia and Moscow, uh, you probably all know um, the kitchens in the district. And sorry for my English translation of the Russian brand. Obviously, that's a, that's a literal translation of them. And as you know, I mean, you live uh, where, where this example exists. I mean, they started cooking the dishes of the restaurants that are closed so they can still ship the things people like to their customers, right? They didn't cook before, they now started cooking. I mean, that's quite a radical move. And of course, the restaurants get a cut, but that's how they keep the business running. Very smart. Um, here's a great next example, next page. This is a movie launch. It's a Chinese movie, and um, it's actually... Um, Lost in Russia, which is you might want to watch it. It's a it's a it's a very nice Chinese movie. They wanted to launch at the end of last year. Guess what happened? The the movies closed, right? The cinemas closed. So they went to ByteDance, right? The online company that owns the things like TikTok and all the other brands. And they want they, they did the entire launch of a whole movie online. Never did that before. In fact, it was so successful. They're going to think about doing the next one again on this platform. And that's the radical shift. And here's a hotel example on the next page, and that's Dorint Hotels. They had a shut, but what they said, you know what, we have all these rooms. If you're sick and tired of the home office, why don't you come and work in our rooms? We rent them to you from seven to seven, right? The whole day. And that's a really brilliant idea to use empty rooms. By the way, it's also funny if you look on the right, 
um, if you go to the next page, um, what uh, Dorent believes your um, desk will look like because obviously it has all these big stands. So you, that's obviously what you're carrying with you. But still, a very smart idea of how you can actually um, use the, the current time to reshape your model. The model. I've got a few more ideas for you. Flip the switch. Um, when things are changing for customers, that's normally a great time when people are really open to change. And I, to explain this to you, I've got to tell you about the big war, the biggest war that I was involved in in the marketing world, and that is the war between, you will not believe this now, what I'm saying is the war between the tampon and the napkin. What you not believe, what, I mean, it's, it may not be your world, but I'll tell you what, when customers are making the decision which product to use, they're making it sometimes pretty early in their lives and then they're sticking to it. So I was a marketer and we had to fight. We wanted to get share from the other. So what did we do? Well, we were waiting for something significant in our customers' lives to happen. And for many of those, this was birth. Giving birth is, of course, changing everything in a wife, in the life of a woman. And that's why all the companies making these products are flocking to the hospitals and giving people products to try in this specific moment of time, when, when people are reevaluating things, when they're looking at new things. By the way, if you have any doubt, the pregnant woman is the one on the right. And um, so the question is, you know, when, when, when this happens, when life changes, that's normally the moment when people are open to trying new things, to flipping the switch. And now is the time when I was you, if I were you and you're in the right industry, this is the time for trial, trial, trial. Now is the time when people reevaluate. People have sometimes even more time. I may just sit at home and can watch things. You just got to get in there and show them what you have. So the question is, what could your customers try now? Okay, got one more. Push the big. Now, it's hard to make change happen in companies. It's really hard. And I love this tweet that came out very early on um, when, the, when the corona crisis happened. You probably have all seen this. What led the digital transformation of your company? Is it the CEO, the CTO, or COVID-19? Now, in many companies, it's COVID-19. There's a crisis and all of a sudden, right? People are very open to making things happen, to invest and so on and so on. And... Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna switch a little, but um, to go to go to actually a page that I'll, I'll skip. Um, to go to straight to the next one to the window of change. Um, if you could uh, flip one more slide for me, because the point is this: when a crisis happens early on, people are not so open for change. But when people realize, oh my God, there is a crisis, um, people are very open to change, and um, and. But that's, that's not going to stay open that window forever because there's a point where people start to get really annoyed and say, yeah, we've been locked down for two weeks now. We want to get out again. So the window for change in companies is not opening forever. In many of your companies, the window may now be open. So if you have a big transformation project, if you really believe you want to push your company into the future, it might be a really good time to make the case. Because again, you know, that's now the time. So the question is, which of the big projects could you push now? Now, the challenge is your boss may not agree. And that's where the bravery comes in, because your boss may think you're just crazy. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you, uh, that's my last bit about why you need to be brave. I'm going to show you some data and then, then we're going to transition straight over to um, to, uh, to Tracy. I want to uh, swap two, two, two slides to this one. Um, I'm not going to show my book now, but I want to say if you're interested in reading more about these ideas, try this blog. I'd love to have you. Um, I don't have a consulting firm, so you're safe to, to sign up. I'm just writing books. So um, we're going to talk more about these ideas on the Try This blog. But the question is, does your bravery really matter? And we've conducted, we've, we've conducted a massive, large global study on bravery. I'm going to show you straight who we did this with. We had 1,280 people, 62 countries, Bristol Marketing Society and Kantar, the research agency. And we had a very simple question that we asked is what measures for the business impact of marketers? What matters? Is it skills and expertise? 
Is it brave leadership behaviors? Is it the company or is it other things? And we were amazed with the results and the results were very clear. Um, they were very, very clear. And the, the results were that brave leadership far and away is the largest factor for your business success as a marketer. And I'm gonna quickly say what that means. It means, first off, that skills, of course, are important, but your leadership matters more. The company is important, but your leadership matters more. And brave leadership can mean three things. Morally brave, that means standing up for issues, the strength to face issues. So if people are annoyed with you, you can say, that's fine, right? That's what I'm here for. But also speed. You got to go at a certain speed to make things happen. And that's brave leadership. Of course, that's just high level. We have a lot of detail behind this, but that's basically what matters. So you got to be these three things as a marketer. The question is, do you always need to be brave? Do you always have to be brave? Because being brave is not easy, right? It is, can be threatening, it can be frightening. So what we figured out is this. Um, and I'm going, to stip, uh, I'm going to skip a couple of slides now and just make the point verbally. You don't have to be brave all the time because what we learned is that it's not the brave people who always win. It's not how it works. If you're always brave, in fact, your company may just be so annoyed with you, they'll fire you right one day. The point is this, but what is really important is that you're not shying away when it really matters. Not being brave is pulling the business down. And that's the, that is the real thing we're talking about here. Or in other words, um, and I'm flipping a few slides at this point, for marketing success, caution is risky. And that's why as a marketer, you have to pick your moment. You cannot be brave all the time. It just doesn't work. I mean, that's not how it works. But how do you pick your moment? And that's my last point. Now let's talk about this, how you pick your moment. This is a Sydney funnel web spider. And um, everybody who was on the call who, who has a history in Australia or has been there knows that it's a pretty dangerous animal. Uh, if you get the wrong one and if it's adult and you, you, you bad luck, it can kill you, basically. It, it can kill you, right? So now just imagine you're walking into a room you're wandering in and all of a sudden, just a meter away from you on the wall, you see this big spider. What are you gonna do? Do you gonna get closer and have a look? Or are you gonna step back and run for safety? Question to you, what would you do? Go closer, have a look or run? I guess most people would run, but I'm not sure about you. Now picture the same room, picture the same room. Now you'll see all of a sudden, that spider is just above a little baby. What would you do now? Would you get closer and try and save the baby? Or would you step back and run? What would you do? Bravery is purpose minus fear. And if you want to be brave as a marketer, yes, you can start to fight your fears. You can start to love the spiders. But you know what? You think what's easier is, is to build a purpose. Find a reason why you want to be brave. And right now, that's your moment. What do you need to do? What do you need to be brave about to get your company back to growth? And that's the one thing you got to figure out. And once you know, then to me, you know what you're going to do? He's going to take your job description, you're going to tear it apart, and then you do what's right because that's what brave marketers do. And with this, I'd like to hand over to Tracy, a very brave woman herself, and someone who has a lot of experience in bravery um, to take over and uh, tell us uh, more about Effie and the key themes that you're currently pushing. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Thomas. What an insightful and engaging presentation. First of all, I do have to say, Two of your visuals I can relate to. The first one is the lady. <laughs> I mean, two offices, a school, you know, being a chef, the cleaner, the whole thing, you know, um, incredibly demanding. And the second one is I, in fact, am from Australia and 
I do understand that spider analogy. So thank you so much. We will at the end head into a discussion around, you know, marketing is hard. It is hard, but we still need to grow and that window of, of bravery. So good evening, everyone. Thank you so much to FE Russia for holding this event and having this forum at this incredibly topical time and critical time um, in our lives um, and also in our careers. And I cannot emphasize enough the ability for us to do our job and to do it well is absolutely crucial. What I'm going to do, I'm just going to spend a really short period of time for those who are less familiar with the FE brand and just talk you through who we are and also some, some key principles. And the reason why I want to share the key principles now is that because I know we're under pressure and I know our budgets are going down, as we've all seen the press about, but the fundamentals in what we do actually remain the same. And I just want to make sure that we're all clear and on the same page as that. So if we head to the next slide, um, Effie's mission is to lead, inspire, and champion the practice and the practitioners of marketing effectiveness. And we do this primarily through awards, but we also do it through a number of educational programs that we do as well. We communicate between 5,000 to 7,000 senior leaders in any one year. And that allows us to gather the largest community of thinkers and practitioners of marketing effectiveness. It also allows us to gather real live case examples that exist in businesses and we can see the results and ultimately we can learn from them. And FE Russia and the Russia marketing community play an incredibly important role in that. If we head to the next slide, I talk about the FE framework, which is the four pillars. And to put it really, really simply, the first one is, do you understand your business context? Do you know what your business objectives are that you can then link to your marketing objectives? And I suspect some of those might have altered recently. So that's incredibly important. What is your insight? And I'm not talking about a statement of fact. What is your genuine insight around your brand that's going to allow you to be differentiated and distinct? Bringing the idea to life, executing with excellence, you know, making sure that what you're doing is delivered all the way through and ultimately results, which again, up front, are you clear on your metrics? Are you incredibly clear on your objectives so that you know the work that you did do, did it genuinely work? And we'll reference this a little bit as, as we go through. The other, um, I think, thing I would also like to share with you on the next slide is seven lessons that we have learned. Now, to be perfectly honest with you, this could be a 30-minute presentation in its, in its own right. Um, but again, it lands us in the bravery space, which I'm particularly passionate about. But I thought I would share the other six as well, just to make sure you know, you know what they are and also you can reference, I've written an article on it, so if anyone wants more information, certainly through FE Russia or other mechanisms, we can certainly get this to you. The first one, I have sat in your seat. I've been a B2C, B2B marketer. You know, and the first reaction is you want to solve everything and you want to do it really quickly and I get it. But the analysis on our cases were incredibly, incredibly clear. If you have one objective, that's probably not enough. But over the course of time, they become diminishing. So if you end up with eight objectives, you're probably not going to achieve what you need to achieve. On average, the result says that you need two objectives. But I think the fundamental underlying point behind this is, is think through what you want to achieve up front. I think whether it's three, five, four, but our research, research said on average two. A little research goes a long way. And again, I think this is strongly linked to point one, is thinking through what do you really need to research, question mark. Cases that did no research did not fare well at all. But again, diminishing returns. Cases that did a lot of research didn't get that incremental result. So just be incredibly thoughtful. This is about quality. It is not about quantity. 
the overarching question around should I be very specific in my targeting or can I go mass? Now, clearly how we go about that, the customer journey, that has changed, it's moved on and we absolutely do need to understand it. But what is very clear, it's ultimately a combination of both that you need to deliver linked to your objectives. Point four, um, I know a number of the previous speakers also referenced this as well. And there's this ongoing dilemma between short and long term. It's, it's one of the biggest challenges, I think, facing marketeers. And as we've heard, short term is right in focus. But I can categorically tell you campaigns that are sustainable and that run for very long periods of time are significantly more effective. And I'll just throw a couple of brands out there very briefly. So when you think of Nike, just do it. You think of MasterCard, priceless. You know, they weren't something that came, and I'm not saying that short term doesn't have a role. It absolutely does, but it needs to be in the right context. Number five, make sure that you are different. And I don't mean distinct, I mean differentiated. Five, if you can and your budget can afford it, more channels that you engage in ultimately makes you more effective. And then the final point, um, which is, as I said, a point that I am incredibly passionate about is one about bravery. So again, just to reference our cases, um, over the 6,000 cases that we looked at for this particular piece of work, we graded them from one to five. One was least risky, five was the most risky. So what was interesting about that, if you're a little bit brave, so if you're a number one, you were quite effective. But the minute you moved into two, it declined. It stayed flat for three and four. And then at five, there was incremental growth that took place. So I think the message here is you either stick to your knitting or you go all out. <laughs> that in-between piece is not as effective as you could be. And if we move on to the next one, this is just some framing points around uh, bravery. And just to give you some context about how we're thinking about that at FE. So the first point on the next slide, please. Great, thank you, is admit that you need to change. So again, going back to the fundamentals, your fundamentals remain the same. And as Thomas said in his presentation, you know, it's not probably a time to be messing with your brand strategy, but it is time to reviewing your pricing structure or your channel um, strategy, for example. So that's the first one. The second one is stay authentic. I cannot emphasize enough is that people who are switching their positioning are gonna be losers all the way. Innovate, as Thomas mentioned, take the risk. There is a window of opportunity around this. Now is the time to innovate, then ultimately invest. So if I move up to the first point, I just want to share an example with you around Hyundai in the United States. It's a South Korean brand. And if I head back to 2008, so bearing in mind 2008, for those of you who are slightly younger than, than myself, that, that's a little while ago, but that is recession time. What they did was they went to the public and they introduced a buyback guarantee if you lost your job. That's risky. That's really risky in a recession when people are losing their jobs. But do you know what happened? Their brand became resonating, just like it did with GM, Chrysler, all those big American brands. Their sales also went up 14%. And what's very interesting is they have literally in the United States just bought that back. And unemployment in the United States today just moved to 34 million. So that is a classic example of be brave enough to change in the context that makes sense. The other point, and before Thomas and I get into a bit more of a dialogue, was around investment. I know Thomas mentioned that I'm a huge proponent and a very big supporter of investment during these times. Look, I know budgets are being cut. Everyone's seen the data. It's hard. It's really hard. And sometimes with good reason. But that doesn't mean there isn't a right reason to go after a budget as well. Again, 
An example of this is Amazon. So they, between 2007 and 2010, so again, recession time as a point of relativity, they increased their budget by 30% and their brand value increased by 143%. While their key competitor at the time, eBay, cut its budget by 13% and so its value declined by 22%. So we're not saying it's easy, We've already framed them up, and I think you've had presentations throughout the day that has framed that. But Thomas, what I would like to ask you in the context of your leadership um, research that you did, how effectively can individuals in this conflict in the boardroom between cutting budgets and continuing invest, do you have any advice or anything that you saw in your research that might help um, the individuals today. Yeah. Yeah. Your mic is off. You see, this is when you mute to make sure you're not talking into someone and uh, you're on with, hey, thank you for the question. Um, of course, uh, that's a great question. That's a, a lot of marketers are challenging, uh, are facing this right now. Now, if you step back, right? Every CEO in the world wants their company to grow. I mean, even if there's a crisis, there's no CEO who sits there and says, oh, that's trick. You know, they all want to grow. And what is your job as a marketer? You are the growth engine. That's what you have to be. You are the person of growth. And you have to go in there and make and have a very difficult discussion on, look, if you want to grow, here is what we need to do. And it may sound really weird. My, my, my mother-in-law just got, is in hospital. She had a stroke. And she was basically lying in bed and she was basically very happy if nobody touches her and she's because she's recovering. And the doctor told her, you know, what you now need to do is get off, get out of your bed and start walking. And she said, what? That's crazy. I, I can't walk now. And she said, no, that's what you need to do because you, you want to walk again. So you need to do something that's really uncomfortable and painful. But let me prove to you why this is right. And that's the job in a marketing suite. If people, every CEO wants to grow, if they don't want to invest, then it's only because they believe the case you're making is not strong enough. Or maybe they don't believe your data. And that's what you need to find out. But I cannot believe that a CEO doesn't want to grow. So the question is, is your argument good enough? Yeah. And, and I, think, I think that makes, for me, makes total sense because that's where we're at. I think people have gone through the cost cutting side of things. Now we're moving into to the growth phase. But I think you raise an interesting point is that as marketeers, we need to understand our target audience. The CFO is a target audience. Your CEO is also a target audience. How do they like to receive information? I personally came from um, mm. in the B2B environment. I was with oil and gas, highly analytical, a lot of engineers. So I was never, ever going to get my budget unless... I didn't present it in that way. So I just think thinking that through is also a crucial part too. That's right. The other, um, I think, interesting element that you spoke about, and again, I think it was heard, is this concept of authenticity. Now, I think one of the best brands that, again, that has been doing this for decades is, in fact, Unilever's Dove. Um, and more recently, they did a piece, um, and I'm not sure whether it's in Russia or not, but certainly around, you know, courage is beautiful, which they've got the essence of health workers with their masks on and bruise and marks, which is very much rooted in the insight, the DNA, and in fact, it sells across all the four pillars. But I think looking back to your call for action piece, which I heard in your presentation to they're also giving a percentage of the proceeds to health workers and they've given away $5 million already. So I think it would be great to hear from you the concept of authenticity through a leadership lens and being brave in that space. And that's a great, a dove is a great example because there are quite some parallels because if you think about authenticity. Authenticity is really great if it works. Right? Because Dove also had lots of failures. They tried things and then people that were annoyed about it saying, oh, you can't do that. Right? So 
they had to find their authentic self, which is, you know, you, we, are not, you, we don't want you to show off you, who you're great the way you are, but they had to figure out how this works. It took some time, and they are now authentic and very effective in a way to do it. And for leaders, it's the same thing. Authenticity in marketing doesn't mean, and to be successful, doesn't mean just be who you are. It means take some of the things that you're really good at, but then also look at the target audience. And I believe the, the key authentic part you could play as a marketer is the growth engine. If you are consistently pushing everybody in the company to think about growth, to show it, to show it, and do it in your way, that will be exceptionally authentic. People know exactly what they're getting, and it will be consistent because that's what Duff is really doing well. Duff is consistent, you know what you're getting. So picking the right authenticity as a marketer, yeah? Yep. And if you're authentically just dreaming about colors and, and movies, that that's maybe authentic, but that may not work. What's the authentic self that works successfully? And then you really go at this. And I have to say, I haven't met one single CEO in the world that hated marketers wanting to grow. I've never heard anybody. They, they hate no. many other things. <laughs> not that. So if, if you like growth and that's authentic, just go for it. Um, but I love to I love to ask you something, uh, Tracy, because oh. one thing that really got me when you when you talked about this was the innovation piece. And I, I mean, I think but I started out. We are, we are so aligned. I started out by saying, you know, firms innovate and then they find customers. That's roughly what what they need to do. But but I guess innovation is a really I mean, it's not easy, right? We know that. It's, it's a tricky, it's risky. People, you know, get, it's tough internally. And, and you work with so many marketers around the world. What do you see that probably needs to change in the marketing world so we get more innovation actually done? So again, I think for me, it fundamentally links back to this piece. There's, there's a time and a place. And I do think now is the time. I do think people are going to be more open to change than they've ever had before linked to innovation. I think also, um, you know, it's happened before. So I always think it's that lovely combination. Go and pull on history because I know we're going through change, but quite frankly, change has been happening for a very long time. And what differentiates us as humans is the capacity to do that. So if I reference, again, going back to recession times, um, 2008, there's a brand called E-Trade, which is a household name in, in many countries now. But at the time, the concept of going and managing a share portfolio through a broker was exactly how everything was done. So imagine setting up a company in recession times when the stock market as we're all experiencing around the world is so up and down you come out and create a whole new financial sector saying you can trade on your own from home and we'll set up an account for you to do that now they did that now they are the one one of the biggest in in the world a much more recent example, which I really like because it's linked to the supply chain element of, of marketing, is um, JD.com. Again, an e-commerce platform in China, huge, massive. China went through this before anyone else did. You know, no contact, staying at home. Um, they had a regulation in terms of one individual could only leave the house every other day to get supplies. So a lot of things had to come in through that platform. So in terms of health and safety, fitting with the regulations, what they did was they started to develop drones to deliver. So again, something that's incredibly innovative, never been done before, and you know, it probably wouldn't have mattered if it failed <laughs> in a bizarre way, but the fact is it didn't and enabled them to continue to deliver on time, more effectively, above the traffic and they're looking to continue to extend that even though as China opens up. So I think that they're just a couple of great examples of innovation and being brave and looking at through things through a slightly different lens. Can I get a can I ask a following question? You may. You're reading Effie and that's a iconic, massive, very important organization. So much change happening around you. How brave do you have to be and how much do you need to innovate? How brave? Well, you know what? We're, 
we're no different to anybody else. Like I think we're experiencing the health crisis. You know, people are experiencing your know, personal crisis. And then there's the economic crisis. So for us, um, we've had to do a number of very difficult things from a cost perspective. But the exciting part and the growth side and the revenue side is we have pivoted to a number of educational programs that we can we can help people in this time to make them more effective. And in the last six weeks, um, I would say congratulations to the team for pivoting to taking everything virtual. So we judging is now occurring virtually. Um, we have boot camps where it's all done um, virtual, which means we can do more of it around the world. So we would love to certainly engage the individuals in Russia in that place. Um, and so we've just pivoted our whole model. Now, having said that, we're delivering against our mission. So the, the core fundamentals and the strategies absolutely remain the same, but we have pivoted in, in how we execute with a greater emphasis on sharing with people and partnering with individuals and organisations to make them more effective during this incredibly tough time. It's impressive and brave. Fantastic. Um, Are we heading now to the, the glass room for Q&A? That's right. That's the plan, ma'am. Thank you very much. I, uh, you know, got uh, enchanted and carried away by your dialogue. Uh, let, let, me, let me try to choose the best questions. We have a heap of them. Okay. Let me start with a question to Thomas. So one of the strategies you proposed, which is uh, punching above your weight. Now, how risky do you think is it? Like, it's a great story about Qatar. But how about people actually thinking that Emirates is taking great care of their passengers while Qatar is simply trying to cream it while they can? So if I understand correctly, uh, the question is about the risk right and how risky it is to punch above your weight um, and you used also the example of Qatar Airways who's doing this first off if you look at the u the new uniforms of Qatar Airways staff I'm pretty certain you'd rather break your leg in the plane than getting sick by the by them because they're basically like in a sterile um, environment but but that's not, but I think that wasn't the point of the question the question is how risky is it and yeah it's absolutely risky because if it was not, then everybody would immediately punch above their weight. Of course it's risky, but it's, it's about taking a calculated business risk. Qatar Airways, I'm sure, is not punching above their weight because they think that would be a really fun thing to do. Because they fundamentally believe that's what they can do and what they need to do to get share in the market. That is risky absolutely is risky i don't think there will be an innovation i don't think there will be a, you know a bold move without risk but it's a business risk and i think if you assess it and look at the pros and cons and then you believe the upside is bigger it might just be a, a risk worth taking and that's why you need to be a little brave yes it's not a comfortable thing to punch above your weight but it has made a massive difference for people so you got to pick your battle. Thank you very much, Thomas. Well, the next question I think should go to both of you. There is this feeling that we are seeing a shift from the global to the local. Local communities and smaller brands are coming to the fore and consumers tend to favor the local. What should the global brands and global agencies and networks do in such situations? Thank you. Tracy, you know. first. So I think my uh, initial reaction to the whole global, local, I think it would remain the same, I think, in, in any circumstances. To be... 
global is about scale. That's 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 what it's about. But you absolutely need to make sure that you understand the local intent. So it's it's that very fine balance between what gives you scale, which is consistency. Um, it's a very high level insight that needs to be um, carried throughout the world. But that doesn't mean that you can't pivot to a local need. Um, so what example can I think about? Um, I think look at McDonald's, for example. That's a brand that's absolutely everywhere. Now, that doesn't mean that its menu is identical everywhere you go because it can't be because food is fundamentally driven by a local instance. So I think it, it's, it's about thinking through very carefully, but I will go back to the fundamentals. I think the fundamentals remain the same. And if global brands are missing out, that means they don't understand what's happening in the local market. Thomas. I think it's a great answer. Yeah, I don't think people care about specifics of a brand. They care whether a brand is relevant for them, whether they like it, whether it's important. And then, you know, we think about global and local because we travel. I mean, we did travel not, not any longer, but we have a global perspective. A lot of people don't even think that way. They think about, is the brand relevant? And you as a marketer have to continuously be very close and figure out what do people care about? And if it's a local twist, well, then let's let's see what you can do. Yeah, um, it's it's like man, many trends. If you understand what customers care about, that's when you can become relevant as a brand. And these things keep changing. I, I agree, and I think another brand that I worked on, Cadbury, a chocolate brand. Now, that is everywhere in the world, but I can tell you, a lot of the countries that I used to work in, they used to think it very much as their own. It was inherited from the UK. But if you talk to an Australian, it's an Australian love brand. You go to talk to someone in Malaysia, it's their brand. So I think it's, again, it's that balance between the benefits of global, but making sure, as Thomas just said, it needs to be relatable to the local market. Thank you very much. Uh, Tracy, uh, I'm sorry, Tracy, a question for you. Yes. You've mentioned uh, that there are uh, two types of uh, effective campaigns, boring campaigns and really risky campaigns. So what's your expectation for the next year contest? Uh, who will be in the lead, the boring ones or the riskiest ones? Um, well, if I go back to my data, which I always, I love my facts, um, it, it, it is going to be those who take the risk. It is genuinely going to be those brands that make choices, um, again, do not throw this is a very um local australian expression so i don't know how this will translate but do not throw the baby out with the bathwater. <laughs> like stick to the fundamentals but if you see an opportunity like go like i'll give you i'll give you another example so there's a brand in china called wanda they are one of the biggest studios in the world in fact they own part of um i think here in the united states they are fundamentally a cinema brand. So they've had extraordinary growth over a period of time. And do you know what they're doing now? They're owning streaming in China. That's what they're doing. So, you know, again, it's the fundamentals, but pivot to a place that redefines the category. Just as I said on the E-Trade example, they created a whole new sector of the financial sector. It didn't exist prior. So I think stick to the fundamentals, but be brave to move. Thank you very much. We have a couple more questions related to being brave. Sure. They are pretty general, like how can you be brave in a company uh, that is pretty, pretty hierarchical? Mm -hmm. Well, some people are anonymous, you know, when they're writing, how can you be brave when your boss is not? <laughs> so can you answer those? Thank you. I might have you um, as a marketer. Um, I think your job is to help your boss make better decisions, right? So, and, and when we look at the research, we looked at this, how important is the company? It's 25%, but 50% is your own leadership. So first off, you, you can actually punch quite a lot. You have a lot of influence. 
what uh, what I sometimes see and what I think we need to we need to change in terms of belief is that some people believe markets have a right to have a supporting boss that always agrees. And I think it's not like this. It, it is a job to sell internally as much as you sell externally. No mark. I've never heard a marketer saying, oh, my customers really don't like my products. I really hate them. No, as a market, you'd say, oh, you know, maybe my product isn't the right product. So maybe I need to find a better communication. Maybe I find, need to find to explain it in a different way. Now, I'm not saying every boss is, you know, you can manage every boss. And maybe sometimes there is a point when the best thing you can do is just leave and go somewhere else. But for the majority of bosses, the ones that are kind of like okay enough, it's more about how you convince them, how you make the case. And if you work in a large organization, that's going to be a big part of the day job. Uh, and my view is get over it and get on it. That is the job as a marketer. It's not just customers. You have customers everywhere, and the ones internally are sometimes quite important. So I would absolutely part. agree with you, Thomas. In internal stakeholder management is as important as your external environment. So I think that's absolutely true. Um, there's also, you know, part of no matter where, where you sit in the hierarchy, it's about your, making your boss look good. And if you remind them that this is about growth and the business needs growth, I think that also helps. I think the third thing that I have found in my experience, as much as you can strip out the emotion stick to the facts. If you can build a very strong factual case that leads you to an outcome and you strip away the emotion, it is significantly easier to sell it through. So I just think they're just, I'm not saying it's easy by any stretch of the imagination because, because it's certainly not, but they're just um, a couple of minor helpers. But as Thomas said, Stakeholder management internally, if you can't sell your ideas to get them outside, then that's that's a significant problem. About the level of bravery of Russian marketers. Some people must have Googled that Thomas has got an extensive experience of Russian marketing. And I guess that Tracy has observed some Russian cases and can compare them to Eastern you know, Western European cases or Western cases in general. So if you have an informed opinion, please share. And if, uh, you know, there are new heights we can muster, please identify them for us. So I can talk about my past experience. Um, and I have to admit, a couple of years ago, and I worked in Russia mainly on mobile telephony brands. And, you know, there was a big fight. And I have to say, I was absolutely amazed by the creativity and the power that I've seen in Russian marketing. Um, I think what Mar Russian marketers are extremely creative. Russian marketers have a lot of depths. They understand actually people. They understand emotions probably be better than some of the other marketers I've met. Russian marketers also have a tendency to tell themselves that they're not very good at being creative and being outstanding. And I think that is wrong. Uh, when we look at the examples, I mean, I, the ones that I that come to mind is, is the VLAN brand, is also the MTS brand, and that's, of course, the space I worked in. Uh, we have, we've done so many winning commercials, um, at the team I worked with, I was just stunned. And I actually think what Russian marketers should do is two things. One is, A, be proud of the work you're doing. And secondly, start to showcase it more to the world because it's great to look at what other people are doing. I don't think we have enough Russian marketing ideas come outside of Russia. And that, that, that would be really worthwhile. And I'll just, I'll add something on um, briefly, because I am just conscious of time, is just, you know, fundamental belief. Like, you, you can do this. I just think, um, as Thomas said, you know, I believe this is our time and this is our purpose to really do what marketing people do really well and do what Russian marketing people <laughs> do really well. And that is be brave. And I've there's a number of instances which I, I won't go into, but where individuals have done exactly that. And I, I wholly support what um, Thomas is saying around creativity and understanding. You, you guys get it. Um, I know it's hard, but I would just reinforce you, be confident 
as Thomas said in his, his presentation around brave, it's not brave, it's not an always on option. It's about being choiceful. And if you make the right choices, um, then, you know, the world is yours. Well, thank you very much, Thomas. Thank you, Thomas. Thanks for you for the great content and for the positive, upbeat attitudes and for the confidence, which I hope we will be able to imbibe from this session. Because confidence is indeed very important in those times. Okay, Dragorad and myself will briefly summarize the day now. Well, we are really, really immensely grateful to all the speakers. This has been a packet day. And we are really grateful to the speakers for sticking to the house rules. I'm sorry, uh, we experienced a delay about 14 minutes. Uh, again, my apologies for that. Uh, I'm grateful to our partners, to the EFI team to the team of uh, Skolkovo School of Management, which was also controlling the time here. Yeah, I also wanted to thank the tech team. It has been taking great care of us, uh, seemingly without any break for breakfast, lunch, dinner. And most importantly, I want to thank the audience for spending so much time with us. You know, we have experienced it ourselves, how challenging it can be to be immersed in this content for eight hours non-stop. We promise that next time we'll redesign the schedule so that you have a proper lunch break. <laughs> but this time we failed, you know why? We had so many great speakers, so many great presentations, we simply couldn't choose which to scrap. And in conclusion, let me remind you of something that we mentioned several times throughout the event, this is the list of our upcoming FE events, 17th of September, 20th of November, 18th of February. Last one is FE Tech. So all those who got registered for this event today will be automatically notified. Moreover, you're automatically invited to those three events. And we shall be delighted to see you in our next event, which is uh, our international online forum called Today Marketing Tomorrow. That's the September event, and we're obviously going to support it. Lots of communications in social media. And in conclusion, we'd like to give you a very short, well, if like snapshot of the day, it's it's a three minute sequence of uh, everything we had today. And take care. Thank you very much. Bye bye. So now we're going to be treated to a three minute sequence of, I understand, the best moments of the day. <laughs>